Good morning. We hope our SPF virtual audience and group is back with us this morning. We had an exciting day yesterday from our end. Uh, a lot of things happened and we hope uh, this virtual inaugural process went well on our end. We think it did. Again, we can't wait to hear from you about uh, your reception and, and how you uh, learned and, and were able to participate in the event here. We hope each year this will grow because we want to do what we can to get our message and our information and the hope that comes from gathering together to talk about uh, the research and the medical needs for our community. Uh, we want to get those words and that information out to as many people as possible. There are truly some exciting things happening, which in just a moment we're going to start uh, uh, the virtual from the stage uh, for the day. And the first thing that will happen there is I and uh, Jim Sheehan, our, our uh, fundraising chair, will be sharing some exciting information that became official in the last couple of days about our future in terms of research. And you're going to want to hear that and know about what's going on in that regard. But today's going to be a day focused on scientific and research information. It's going to be one of those days when I understand a little bit of what they say, but uh, a lot of it I won't understand it. I'll have to research and, and pick up and, and uh, learn in the future where things are going, but it's an exciting day with, with our researchers and our doctors here to focus particularly on the research end of, of all that we raise money to do. Uh, as you know, yesterday was a day po uh, focused on patient groups and, and uh, caregiver issues and some of the personal things that we deal with uh, in regard to these diseases. But today we focus and turn the page to the scientific arena. So we're glad that you're with us. Uh, we hope you're able to stay uh, as much of the day as you can. Um, we look forward to input from all of you. And not only that, but involvement. As we talked about yesterday, we work in so many different areas committee-wise. You probably have a talent that can benefit this foundation and hopefully in the end, find treatments and cures that are important to you and your family. So again, thanks for joining us. Uh, we will look forward to, we'll be interviewing some folks throughout the day here. We look forward to you being able to see all the presentations uh, from our researchers. So we'll move forward and we'll see you again in a few minutes. Thank you for being with us.
Mason. Test, test, test. Right, you're in the show. All right, are we getting ready to go here, or are we going to need a second more? Give him a few minutes. Looks like we're, what, 80%? We still got people more. dropping in, and we got plenty of, John Cobb has told me, we have plenty of fill space before and after him. Good. As we learn, as we deal with issues day to day, if something doesn't work, just pick up another tool. Good morning. It's good to see you here. Good to see you back. We hope you've enjoyed our first day yesterday and, and the fellowship that you were able to have last night with new friends and old friends, uh, sharing life and just sharing a good time together. Uh, we enjoyed meeting and talking all day yesterday when the evening was almost over. I learned that our uh, largest PLS group ever at one of these conferences had moved into this room and had ordered pizza. So I, I came down just to meet all of them and fellowship with them. And, and again, uh, to you guys, we're so glad to have a, a greater PLS audience uh, and group here. We, you are welcomed and we, we appreciate that you're here. Exciting times. And we're gonna share with you a little bit about that in just a moment, but first, is a, as you guys know Norma, okay? And so when Norma says, Greg, do X, Y, or Z, Greg does X, Y, or Z. Last year at our conference, we had uh, a couple who came and with these bands did about an hour long uh, session with us on how to properly exercise in ways that are meaningful to, to us with the issues that we deal with. We've got a number of these exercise bands back with us again this year. People found them very beneficial, I think, last year. If you have, if you're an HSP or PLS patient, in the back of your name tag, you have a purple ticket. That purple ticket gets you one of these to take home. I have one lying on the floor beside my chair. Uh, you can do many things with it. If, you, if you're tired and don't feel good today, you can do a little bit. If you feel like standing up and stretching a little broader, that's possible too. You can do a lot of things with this. You want one of these, I think, for all of those good days and maybe not so good days. The good thing is, if you're here and you're not a patient, afternoon today, you go get one. We think based on the number that we have and the number of folks who are here, we think we have enough for everyone, but we want to give our PLS and HSP patients first shot. So you guys got till noon, afternoon, everybody go by and get one. You can use these at home, they're good. 
With that little housekeeping, uh, we want to share with you a, a very important announcement and talk a little bit for a moment about history. Uh, many of you who've been involved with SPF for years know that how the research process has worked and, and our research chair and, and the chair of our SAB are going to come up in just a few minutes and talk with you a little bit more about that and the details of how that is happening today. But we've always had an SAB, that uh, Scientific Advisory Board, uh, who has worked hard at reviewing grant applications. Every year we raise all the money that we can uh, with, with all of your help. Uh, the board looks at uh, how many projects can we grant this year and, and rest assured, if you look at our statistics in the annual report and in other places, you know that generally 95, 6, 7 percent of the money we raise all goes toward research. Everything is volunteer and we do as much as we can out of pocket. So we can spend as much money on research as we can. So that Scientific Advisory Board reviews proposals, make recommendations to our board, and our board generally follows those recommendations right down to the T. Over the past years, I would call, and I think our researchers call what we've done, seed grants. Grants that were allowing research to happen at the very basic level, trying to help build toward ultimate treatments, cures that we need. Those grants have generally been $150,000 about, and usually over three-year periods. Uh, and as you all imagine, if you've done any reading and research, you know that, that the kind of research that it's going to take to ultimately find those treatments and cures is far more than what we've been able to spend. It's important that we collaborate, work with, other foundations, other networks, we hope ultimately folks like NIH at the federal level to help get across the finish line. As a result of that, last year at our meeting in Nashville, uh, your board met with as many of the researchers and doctors that were there as we could. And the purpose of that discussion was to say, we appreciate everyone's work and all the research that's been done to this point, but we as a board want to figure out how, how we can collectively come together to accelerate that research toward treatments and cures. We need to be moving toward things like clinical trials and, and establishing biomarkers and those kinds of things. How do we move from where we are to that point? We all left that meeting very excited of the discussion, but everybody left knowing there was a lot of work to be done. And so a number of our researchers spent most of this past year working on a proposal that we received as a board about two months ago. Uh, we, we got a, a group of our board members to serve as an interim committee to work with the proposers to answer some questions and clarify some things. And the good news is that in our board meeting on Thursday and after a discussion and meeting with our doctors and researchers again last night, we want to tell you about a new project that is entitled, and I want to make sure I get this exactly right, Centers of Excellence Research Network. This project is a project that is a $600,000 project, $300,000 in year one and year two. In our discussion last year, the term Centers of Excellence kept coming to the surface. And in other disease areas, and again, our researchers know far more than I do, so you guys correct me if I'm wrong when you are up here later today. But other disease areas that have been studied and come to some successful treatments and cures have used a route very similar to this. There will be established over this project at least nine centers, research centers across the country where our patients and that's part of where you and I come in, the awareness of finding those patients and helping herd them and head them to these research centers where they may be and hopefully more quickly and properly diagnosed, where blood samples, tissue samples, whatever is needed to move this research forward can be gathered together quickly and more efficiently, and where instead of one researcher or two researchers working on an issue here and another one on a different issue there, these nine centers all working collectively, collaboratively together to race quickly, more quickly, toward clinical trials, biomarkers, and the things that we need to make this finish line get here quicker. 
So we as a board, we, we can't tell you how excited we are to announce to you who are here this morning this new CERN research proposal that has begun. It's going to be slow getting off the ground like anything as we get started, but we appreciate those doctors who have submitted this proposal. The $600,000, as I said a moment ago, is just a drop in the bucket to get this process started. One of the things we hope happens as we move forward over the next couple of years, three years, that we are able to put together enough of a, mo of a momentum, databases, information, that we can convince NIH or other major organizations to invest more in reaching those treatments and cures. So we're excited. We hope you find that excited. We hope you will go home knowing that this step has been taken and help us find ways to raise more money to cross these, to cross these goals and borderlines sooner. Sitting to my right is Jim Sheehan, the uh, chair of our fundraising committee. As we sat there in the meeting yesterday with our doctors, some final details, Jim, as you might expect, was uh, strategizing how can we start that next level of, of fundraising. And some exciting things have already happened in that regard. So Jim, would you share that about that? <clears throat> sure. Good morning. That's a little loud. So yeah, we met last night, talked to some folks, talked to some donors, talked to some of our researchers to kind of get things going. And the exciting news is I don't see him this morning, but Maria Kadori, our little, our little friend in a, on a wheelchair, he started off the fundraising with giving almost $100. Little, little guy. Later on in the evening, we had a nice donor that committed to giving up to $70,000 for money that's given this weekend. So if you would like to give this weekend, this person is gonna match up to $70,000 for that. <laughs> Next up, we have a, another donor. Uh, th th these are all gonna be anonymous, by the way, uh, that has uh, gonna give $5,000. One of our researchers gave $2,000. One of our, two, actually two of our board members uh, have committed to giving an extra $1,000 each. And then at the, having a, a cocktail or two last night at the bar, there was a couple of people that have committed to giving some money too. On a different side note, we have a donor that has committed to giving $10,000 a year for four years in an attempt to hire a professional fundraiser, a development director. So if that's something we want to go at in, in the future, we've got a commitment to help pay for that salary for that person for, for four years. So exciting, exciting, exciting. If, if that doesn't build excitement, I hope it will once you hear all the research. It's going to be an amazing day and a half. If you would like to give extra, you can do it online. It's quick and easy. We have return envelopes if you want to take that home with you, if you want to leave a check at the registration desk, whatever's easiest for you. But let's try to, um, let's try to generate $70,000 so that will be matched. Okay? Thank you. Again, exciting times, exciting research possibilities and probabilities. And so you guys, every way you can, support, uh, support this effort. Let the people in your state know. Let others who might be interested in supporting know. We're going to move this thing as quickly as we can. And you're going to be excited today to hear our researchers and our speakers talk to you more about this effort. So thank you for being here. And uh, let's go home and make this happen. One other thing, too, the board met two days ago, and we approved to fund five grants plus the CERN grant, so really six. But of the, we wanted to fund one more grant, but we were short money. So as part of our fundraising efforts, we're about $115,000 short to fund this sixth additional grant. So that's part of the deal, too. So, again, there's all kinds of opportunities to, to generate good research and, and get good outcomes, but we're... Again, asking for your financial support so we can fund this six grant, and then again, hopefully, uh, get that uh, money matched by our donors. Thank you. And one last clarification to our PLS group: there is PLS research in those new uh, grants as well. So, again, thank you for being here, Tim. Come take this microphone and move us forward, sir.
Okay, Kira, this is podium. You got me? All right, here we go. Well, good morning. Everybody have a good night last night? Far out. <laughs> All right, good deal. Good deal. Well, we're glad we're here. Yeah, we got you here this morning. By the way, does, does everybody have a program? Have we got one of these things? Fantastic. Hey, I want you to turn towards the, uh, the back section of our program, and we want to point out a couple of things that are in there. Remember, we want you to go to the registration table. You got to remember to get your 50-50 tickets. You guys know how that, how that works, right? We also want to make sure you get your raffle tickets, okay, because we're going to be pulling those tickets later um, after dinner. Okay, and we're going to be, we've got a lot of great things that are going to, that were uh, donated that we're going to be raffling. You know, you got a ticket, you get a prize. Really, really cool stuff. And also, remember that we are auctioning off some really, really cool things tonight. Number one is Dr. Osdenler's photo art right here. Okay, guys, you're looking right at it. This is it. We are going to auction that off later tonight. Okay. We also have two quilts that are going to be auctioned off and we have two items, two special items from the, your medical store that are going to be auctioned. And that's where we got Jimmy, the greatest auctioneer on the planet going to be here tonight. You're going to have a lot of fun. He's going to do a great job auctioning those off. We also have a St. Louis Cardinals ticket package. Make sure you go out and take a look at that. It's really, really cool. Great ticket options, um, uh, food and beverage items included in that, and an on-field experience, okay? So we're going to be auctioning those off later today. Um, remember, we got the, uh, the SPF store for any more shirts and stuff you need from the Redbubble store. Make sure you go online and Use all these logos and designs and put them on cups and Christmas ornaments and mouse pads, if anybody still use those, and all these other kind of great things that are available out there. So remember, go to the registration table, get your tickets. Also, we've got a little special thing happening out in the lobby right now. Anybody would like to have a deep tissue hand massage? We have a gentleman out there named Ray who is my wife, Tina's, uh, deep tissue massage guy. <laughs> and so if you all like deep tissue massages, this guy can do it. Let me tell you, wait till you see him. He's got a thumb on him that can make you cry. Okay. I'm just telling you and it's, and it, and it works. So if you got some free time and you're floating around, he's going to be out there, uh, till about 1030. Okay. So go by if you, you know, everybody's hands get cramped up and things and whatever. Uh, I'm not really sure what else they do because I stay away from it. Um, so anyway, <laughs> we want to make sure that you get a chance to go out there and visit with Ray and Tina will be out there too. Uh, you can talk with her. So we want to get this show on the road. We obviously great information to start the day off. Well, it's going to get better every second as long as I'm not up here. So we're going to start off next with, um, um, I have to look down because the light is in my eye. We're going to start off this morning with our scientific research grant committee chairperson, Mr. John Cobb, is going to come on up to the stage and kick our day off. Okay, here we go. Come on up, John. Set this back here for later. Okay. And here is your clicker. Green is go. Green is okay. go. And red okay. is backwards just in case. Just in case. All right. Perfect. See you later. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, it is, uh, it's bright up here. Um, all right, well, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the 2023 annual conference for SPF. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm always curious, uh, I'm not sure if uh, this has been done yet in other smaller groups, but uh, how many folks here are first timers to the annual conference? Okay, yep, that, uh, that's about the general trend. Uh, I think, you know, roughly 75%, um, you know, each year are new folks. So uh, that's good, then I, I'll be sharing some new information uh, for, for most of you here. Um, but yes, I, uh, what I want to talk about today is our research grant committee, uh, how we are, you know, how we're transforming the, you know, the fundraising, the generous donations uh, of the SPF community, 
in into progress uh, towards uh, you know, re uh, research, treatments, and cures. So, a uh, little introduction here. Uh, yes, we are the COPS. Um, I am a co-chair on the research grant committee with my lovely wife, Jody there. And uh, we just welcomed a new baby, uh, Jamie. He is uh, the baby in those pictures. Uh, he is almost seven months old and just a total bundle of joy. Uh, we're, we're just absolutely over, overjoyed and I uh, wish they could be here this year, you know, with a seven month old, it's a handful. And uh, so, you know, next year I think will be uh, his introduction to the SPF community. Um, and a little bit more background on, on me. I, uh, so I, SPG4 uh, diagnosed when I was 17 years old, that would be 20 years ago. And um, immediately, you know, my mom started you know, reaching out uh, to figure out what to do. Um, she came across, or she found Annette Lockwood um, right off the bat. And uh, so that sort of introduced us a little bit to the SPF community. Uh, it was 10 years later when she was uh, stepping down from her role as president, she put uh, my name in the hat to join the board. And in 2013, I joined the SPF board. So I've been here about 10 years now. And uh, yeah, last year I uh, took on this new role for uh, research uh, grant committee chair uh, with Jody. She's, she's the brains. Uh, I'm really just kind of along for the ride. Uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're very excited to be in this role. And you know, it's such an, a critical you know, part to, to really make sure we're doing the best we can to be as efficient as possible with the, the fundraising that we're doing. So a little bit about that process. Um, you know, how do we how do we make that uh, that that transition? So it's a four step process. Uh, we are we're first asking for the research. Uh, then we receive that research, uh, then evaluate it and reward it. So the ask process um, that is essentially a, a, a very large email. I mean, we also do have it posted on our website. Uh, we, you know, the, it's tougher to manage, uh, tougher to track the, uh, you know, who is, which researchers are seeing that. So the email is, is the critical component of that. And in our most recent uh, round of reviews, we, uh, we have sent it out to 550 uh, different researchers. Um, and that number has really increased over the past few years, which is excellent. Uh, but yeah, that's a, a request for proposals. So once we send that request for proposal out, uh, we'll wait a few months, uh, you know, give folks time to uh, submit their proposals. And that is uh, then where I come in to, uh, you know, receive those, receive those proposals, organize that information, um, and get it ready for the scientific advisory board. So. The evaluation process is really, you know, that's the bread and the butter of this um, of this group. And uh, our scientific advisory board, they are the folks that are evaluating our proposals. Uh, that is led by our chair, uh, Dr. Moretti. He'll be coming up here uh, shortly to uh, talk a little bit more about the scientific advisory board. But the evaluation process, uh, what that looks like is uh, we, we, so Dr. Moretti will um, match up our scientific advisory board members uh, who have all, you know, uh, specialized focuses in different, you know, areas of research. Uh, so we want to properly, uh, you know, match up these proposals with the folks who are best fit to review those proposals. And uh, we, so as, they're, as they are reviewing these proposals, they are uh, creating scores, they're creating quantitative and qualitative uh, feedback uh, so that we can then uh, rank these proposals, uh, you know, among each other and uh, figure out what the what the board can do uh, with our limited uh, limited funds. Um, so you know, another key component to that is we've been, uh, you know, the research 
the number of research grants we're receiving is increasing. And uh, Dr. Marini has been doing an awesome job of building out our team. And I think he'll talk a little bit more about that um, when he's up here. But, you know, we're still, we each proposal that we receive is still only being reviewed um, twice, you know, by two different uh, scientific advisory board members. So we're trying to build a robust process that is really going to uh, cover all of the detail needed to give fair evaluations for this. And, uh, a new element that we've added to that process is a discussion after these um, these scores are are given. So we we bring our scientific advisory board into a meeting, and we look at these top ranked proposals to really uh, settle on one final uh, ranking to make sure we're funding the best research possible. Uh, and then finally, the the last step of uh, this is the reward process and. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. You know, we send out an email congratulating the uh, researchers um, who are, you know, recipients of uh, our grants, and this is this is done. You know, we're 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 providing them funds incrementally throughout the two-year uh, grant cycle. Our, our grants typically are 150,000 um, in total, and that's across a two-year period. So uh, we'll 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 provide them their grants, their grant money, incrementally um, over that two-year period. And along the way, we ask for some progress reports, um, to, you know, just to make sure that everything is staying on track. So, uh, you know, press the rewind button here, and, and uh, this is what it looked like at the start, uh, back in 2003. Uh, so we had two grants in total, uh, one by our uh, wonderful Dr. Fink uh, for forty thousand dollars, and I love uh, I love this grant here because as uh, Greg was just talking about, um, you know this uh, the natural history of primary lateral sclerosis and hereditary spastic paraplegia, establishing parameters for clinical trials. Well, that is essentially. Uh, you know, a big component of what the um, Centers of Excellence Research Network is. Um, we've been, this is something that we've been working towards, you know, for 20 years. And uh, yeah, it's just such a huge achievement to finally get uh, to this point. And so uh, we'll have the, uh, you know, some of the uh, folks who are building um, the uh, Centers of Excellence uh, come up and talk, you know, much more in detail. But, it's something we've been working on for 20 years, and, and it's a huge uh, breakthrough for us uh, to finally uh, get to this point. Um, and then we have another grant on here, uh, the a mouse model for hereditary spastic paraplegia, uh, Dr. Marchuk for 40,000. So $80,000 total uh, in our first year, and um, we've come a, a long way. So. We've been very busy uh, since the last annual conference. Um, there are actually two uh, research grant cycles that we've been through. We had to play a little bit of catch up uh, with uh, the transition of Jody and I taking over uh, the research grant committee uh, process. And also our, science, our uh, Dr. Mretti, he, he joined us last year as well. Uh, well, he was already with us, but he, uh, he stepped into the chair position last year af uh, after uh, Dr. Nance uh, stepped down. So uh, with some transition that was taking place, you know, we had to play a little bit of catch up. Uh, the, we have two research grant cycles that have taken place. I have here, uh, you know, so the research that we uh, funded in December. Um, as you can see here, we've got two grants uh, on the PLS side and we have five grants on the HSP side. Uh, I've I've bolded uh, some, some names here on the left as well. Uh, those are researchers that we have here with us, as you've probably seen in the programs. And uh, I just love that, uh, you know, we, we're building those close relationships uh, with our researchers. They're coming in, they're uh, meeting everyone here, and, and uh, so you guys all get the chance to really, uh, you know, see who is moving uh, this process forward. Um, another thing I'd like to point out here is this is a total of uh, one million in research, which is just a huge, uh, you know, a huge step forward for us. We, uh, the, the fundraising, the generosity from, you know, from all of you has been 
amazing, uh, moving everything forward. And to have over a million dollars in research is just amazing compared to that 80,000 uh, that we were at the start. Oh, and one last uh, note here. Um, there are actually 14 additional proposals that made it to the uh, you know last uh, the last part of our review process that we weren't able to fund. So you know there is still a lot of opportunity out there that we that we would like to uh, you know have more consideration for that we'd like to give uh, more opportunity to. So you know that fundraising is just absolutely critical. We we wish we could fund everything, and um, and you know the more we can fundraise the more opportunity there is. So uh, the, the, the next round, uh, we actually just finished that on Thursday. And uh, we have here uh, five proposals. Uh, so another uh, one of our doctors, one of our researchers here uh, uh, with us, he was uh, on the PLS grant. And um, you know four other excellent proposals. But as Greg mentioned, uh, the with the uh, Centers of Excellence uh, grant, you know, that it, it, it is taking a big chunk of the research that we would be putting towards uh, these other maybe smaller projects. So again, fundraising is, is key, uh, but, you know, the CERN is, is an excellent opportunity, and, and that's really, it's a shift, you know, to something new for the foundation, right? Um, in the past, we have really done these you know, almost seed grants. They are uh, much smaller. Typically, we have um, newer researchers that are, are, you know, that we want to be able to invite into this, you know, research community and give them opportunities to, uh, to learn more about this. And, and so that's been a critical uh, role that the foundation has played of building the research community by having these, you know, smaller research opportunities available. Um, and again, you know, we had, uh, we had, there were 25 proposals uh, total, and we, we left 20 of them, um, you know, on the table. And one of those, as uh, Greg and Jim were, were talking about, uh, was very highly. It was, it was uh, you know, among the, the top proposals uh, that everybody on the SAB, um, you know, highly recommended we fund. So it is, uh, it's this, you know, this this one extra uh, proposal. Uh, we'd we'd love to get it funded, and, and if you guys can help us out with that, that would be that would be absolutely awesome. So, uh, since the beginning, uh, we have funded a total of eleven million dollars in research, and I think that's just amazing. That is, that is, that's all you. Uh, so. It is, you know, that, that's a significant impact, and, and I'm, I'm, re I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited to uh, continue to uh, increase that number, and it's, it's really an exponential uh, growth, so uh, we're, we're hoping to keep that trend going. Uh, and that's across 76 grants uh, total, and as I was mentioning, yeah, seed grants, uh, building that foundation, and so we've, with the CERN, you know, that's, that's taking us to a, a new level, you know, where these... Uh, these individual grants are really more, uh, you know, the minor leagues and uh, eventually with a, a CERN that could be taken over by NIH um, if all goes well, uh, that would be uh, the big leagues. So, so um, big, big progress. And I wanted to share this with you. This is, um, you know, just a little visualization uh, for some of our, uh, some of the historical progress. and. Uh, you know, anyone here could actually uh, create this chart. This is just going on to PubMed and uh, just searching for research articles that are, um, you know, tagged as HSP or PLS. Uh, so we're looking here at, uh, yeah, uh, how many publications were there per year? Uh, so in 2022, 141. That is a nice little spike there. Obviously, 2023 is not finished yet, so we expect that bar to, uh, to go up a good bit. But, um, you know, I think it's great to see this too, as to, um, you know, every year we're getting more and more uh, progress uh, done. And yeah, that's why it's, it's so critical too, to 
make sure we are uh, funding you know, the best research possible because our goal here is that uh, with many of these proposals, we want them to uh, publish papers. Uh, so that's why it's so critical that our scientific advisory board um, you know, is, is, is built well and has the skill set to really analyze uh, these proposals the best that they can and that, uh, that you know, Dr. Moretti and I are, are doing it the best we can from our ends, um, you know, whether it be administratively or whatnot, to, to just make sure that the process is uh, working the best that it can and that we are uh, being as efficient as possible with every dollar that we can. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to invite Dr. Moretti up here and talk a little bit more about uh, the Scientific Advisory Board. Cool. Uh, green button, next slide, if you need to go back, the red. Okay, thank you all. Thanks, jo thanks John. Um, I'll advance the slide, and um, what I would like to do is, John has already given, um, given you a lot of information about the process. And my role here is to explain a little bit uh, what the Scientific Advisory Board does and what my role is. So I'll start by telling you very little about me. Uh, my sort of um, connection with uh, the field of spastic paraplegia and primary lateral sclerosis, I would say goes back a little bit to um, late 90s, early 2000. I was fortunate to be a part of a spastic paraplegia symposium that Dr. Fink organized in Ann Arbor. I think that was the year 2000. And I've been a member of the Scientific Advisory Board as one of the physicians and scientists reviewing grants since 2013, so the last about 10 years. Uh, last year, I was asked whether I would consider taking the role of uh, chair of, the, of this group of reviewers, uh, taking over from Dr. Nance, who had served on this role for quite some time. And so I've been in this capacity, the, the chair of the board for um, I think it's about 12 months or so, working with John, working with the rest of the foundation. And so John already explained what is the role of the Scientific Advisory Board. It's, it's a role actually of, I would say, uh, of some responsibility of providing the foundation with a, an opinion about the quality, the merit scientifically of the proposals that the, the foundation receives every year. Uh, so our role is to uh, look at these grants, review them, uh, provide the foundation board with our opinion and ranking of these proposals so that the foundation can make, can make decisions about uh, where to put the money. And John explained how this process has been uh, limited uh, to uh, grants, applications, ideas that are solicited from the community every year, these seed grants, uh, where essentially the foundation does not set a sense of direction. It's, it's asking the field, the scientists out there, to come forward with their best ideas. We've made a few changes. So as you can see from the slides from the talk that John gave you, uh, the foundation started essentially with uh, two grants, two proposals, a small amount of money and is now, as of 2022, uh, in a position of reviewing uh, 25 applications, plus, I would say, applications such as the CERN that followed a different path. So um, what we've been working on is trying to grow the board, um, to the scientific advisory board, uh, to match the increase in the number of proposals, the complexity of these proposals, the fields that these proposals tap into. And so, for example, uh, this is just a small example, just for the past uh, two years, I'm, I'm talking about two years of funding, right, where the funding cycle, the review cycle at least, has been completed. In 2021, there were 21 proposals. 2022, there were 25 proposals. Uh, this is much greater than the initial year of funding. And um, the spectrum here uh, covers both HSP and PLS. 
And the proposals that, are, that, that come to the foundation uh, really can be from purely clinical proposals to proposals that are uh, primarily basic, base, based on basic science, ben bench research, animal models, cell models, et cetera. And so that creates a bit of a challenge because you have to have in the review panel, the scientific advisory board, individuals with the expertise to look at these uh, proposals and provide some feedback. So we need a wide range of expertise and a large enough pool of reviewers. Uh, when I took over last year, uh, we had approximately 10 reviewers. And uh, as of today, we have 21. Uh, so we've more than doubled the size of the scientific advisory board. There's always a challenge in trying to identify individuals who have the right expertise and at the same time do not have an obvious conflict of interest in reviewing proposals. So for example, we just, just to be a little bit uh, simple, but um, if I were to review the proposal of someone I know really well, perhaps a good friend, perhaps in a field that is related to what I do, um, that may not, I may not be the best reviewer for that proposal, right? So we need to have a diversity there of expertise, but also a large enough pool to avoid these conflicts. Um, and um, managing that can be a little delicate, but um, we try to do the best we can. And um, I would say, I would say I can stop here. I could tell you a lot more about this process, obviously. Maybe what I can add is that we've also changed um, a couple of additional things. One is the way in which we score these proposals is based primarily on two uh, types of criteria. We assign a score, that a numerical score, that ranks the proposals based on their scientific merit. So we basically are asking ourselves, is this proposed, how does this proposal that I've read, that I've evaluated, rank compared to other proposals that uh, I might have um, looked at in, over the course of my career? Uh, and that's a numerical score. We also, as a secondary level of analysis, we look at how promising is the idea, the proposal that we have in front of us, with respect to its um, ability to generate to um, to generate additional funding in the future. So the foundation is taking over this role, saying we would like to fund these ideas that are perhaps in a, at a seed stage, at an early stage of development, but we would also like to fund the seeds that are, have more promise for the future, hold more, more promise for the future. It would not make a lot of sense, as you might imagine, for the foundation to put money in a direction that um, the foundation, the scientists uh, collectively do not think is very promising. And so there is this secondary level of analysis where we, analysis where we ask, is this particular uh, project likely to be able to achieve, obtain additional funding in the future perhaps from other sources. An example of that would be the federal government. That is not how the uh, proposals are ranked initially, but of course, uh, different proposals may, may, have, may rank a little bit differently in this secondary level of analysis. And then new, uh, starting uh, with proposals reviewed in 2022, we felt it would be important to provide the scientists who have submitted their ideas and their proposals with a copy of the reviewer's opinions. So this is new uh, as of, I think, uh, the, review, the proposals reviewed for the 2021 cycles. Uh, none of the applicants were receiving the written opinions of the reviewers. Um, starting with 2022, we will, uh, we will share that. I think this is important because ultimately, a, proposals that, a proposal that was submitted and, for example, was not funded could really be still a very valid uh, competitive idea. And so how do we give the applicant, the principal investigator who wrote that proposal, uh, the tools to perhaps uh, modify the application, make it better, um, addressing the criticisms uh, that might have been raised during the review. And so that's new. I hope that will be well received by the community of uh, scientists and uh, clinicians that submit their applications. Um, 
Reviewing grants is always a difficult process. It's never a perfect process. We try to do obviously the best we can, and I think this will add a little bit to the transparency of the process so that uh, hopefully um, we can work together towards uh, better outcomes. And I'll, I'll stop right here. If you have any questions, uh, John and I are available. Take a couple questions from the audience for you, Dr. Moretti. Okay. Uh, let me get this microphone and we'll, we'll get that for you. Okay. All right. I saw a hand held. Doctor, you mentioned uh, CERN and the NIH as one pathway. Can you expand on that and what the other pathway is? Yeah, and maybe this is a question that both John and I can answer. Uh, the Scientific Advisory Board and, let's say, me uh, as the chair of that board has really only been involved with the review of uh, applications that John referred to as seed funding. So the, this is the same process that has been used by SPF for now a couple of decades. Uh, sending out a request for proposals to the field, receiving these applications whose ideas are basically generated by the scientists and clinicians out there, and reviewing those applications. The Scientific Advisory Board, and, and myself in, included, were not involved in, in the process that John described for CERN, and so I'll let him discuss that. Uh, but, but, but thank you for that question. It's, at this point, I think the foundation has um, separated these two, uh, these two ways to apply. <clears throat> yes, uh, and I'll just, I'll just add to that. So um, we are, as we grow, we are we are starting to receive uh, new types of proposals, um, and you know those can be uh, bigger commitments uh, with different types of goals. Uh, so, the board is in the process of uh, designing a a new committee uh, to you know really look into um, you know how do we how do we evaluate these uh, different types of opportunities. Uh, that can progress, you know, our research forward. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we'll, uh, as, as these continue to come in, we will make sure that we're designing a process that can best, ad best uh, address, um, you know, how to, you know, optimize those opportunities. We have another question over here. Oh, over to your right. I didn't realize you were right there. Um, it's I'm sure it's premature to talk about the grants that were just approved Thursday, but can you describe generally what grants have been approved or what's pending now in the research that SBF has funded? I'm not a scientific expert, uh, so I would not be able to speak to that. Uh, I, I wish we could have our scientific advisory board available on Zoom and maybe they would be able to weigh in a little bit more. Um, but yes, um, I mean, what, also, what I will say is that the, the last round of funding uh, that we just finished on Thursday, so we don't have anything actively in the pipeline right now. Uh, we, we do hope that folks that we couldn't fund in this last round, um, you know, the proposals that uh, are, are, you know, high quality that we uh, do want to fund, we hope that they will resubmit their, uh, their grants. And as Dr. Murray was saying, uh, with the, any feedback that we're providing them, maybe those grants will become even more valuable uh, in the next round. But um, currently, we do not have any grants that are, you know, sort of pending um, the board's, uh, you know, evaluation. Hey, and John, what we'll also be doing is after we get finished with the conference, we're going to be sending out an annual report with some information that you guys are going to want to make sure that you receive. But we'll be sending out a PSA 
that will help to outline these most recent grants that have been approved. So part of the conversation that Greg had shared with you guys earlier is, is that, you know, we, we receive these proposals and we can only take the money and stretch the money as far as it can go, right? But some of the proposals that are left on the table, there's just not enough funding. They're good proposals, but we don't have enough funding. So, you know, if there were to be some additional funding that we're able to, you know, acquire here in these final days, then we may be able to go ahead and pull some of those other numbers in. But be looking forward to some PSAs. We have that on our website under media, and you can download all of that information and read all of that and help us to look at that as well. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Just a quick comment, because I know it's a source of confusion sometimes. Even in conversations I have with John, we both refer to the board. And sometimes I ask myself, which board? The scientific advisory board or the foundation board, okay? So these are two separate boards for, for those of you who um, ask uh, what is the difference. There is a foundation board and there is a scientific advisory board. The scientific advisory board, as the name says, um, only, only has a role of um, advising, reviewing grants and advising the foundation, the foundation board in this case, of what um, how to think about these proposals. The other one I would say is um, it's really uh, impressive to see uh, the reach the foundation has. So for example, the proposals that have come in even the last cycle, last year, really come from many different parts of the world. I mean, we have uh, really valid competitive proposals from North America, from uh, Australia, New Zealand, let's say, from Europe. And we have actually, as part of the scientific advisory board, uh, clinicians and investigators who come, I would say, uh, from various parts of the world as well. And so the foundation has an incredible reach. Uh, I hope this grows in the future. And um, it, I think it bodes well for uh, sort of the richness of uh, ideas that are out there. Okay, guys, we got, we got one more question. Right over here, sorry, already got a hand back here. Actually, this follows up on what you just said. The 550 emails, and how do you broaden that reach? How do you choose who to try to connect and, and bring in to bring you a proposal? Yes, uh, so, you know, we are, it, it's, it's a list that we've, as I said, uh, been building from the, the beginning, um, but the, and you know we are we are networking with the the research community, so we are, um, you know, as as they ask us questions, uh, you know, they, they might you know they'll come to us uh, if they they find you know our foundation, uh, you know, so we'll we'll capture their emails and make sure that they're on our list. Uh, the 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 big the 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 bigger component to adding to that. Uh, is the um, you know looking for publications relate as I mentioned related to HSP and PLS so uh, on PubMed uh, their email addresses that are associated with uh, many or you know most or uh, maybe not all but uh, all you know publications on PubMed and so you can scrape uh, those publications you can find those email addresses uh, with a little. Um, you know, little work. Uh, you can you can build an email list from uh, from that. Okay, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for that wonderful information. We have to move on. I'd like to remind you uh, later this afternoon we're going to have a, a big panel discussion. Okay, see all these empty chairs? They're going to be filled up. And you get to ans ask, your, uh, ask a lot of questions and get direct answers from a lot of our researchers that are here today. So we're going to build as we go along. We're going to take a couple of seconds real quick to flip over and get ready for our next set of presentations. So you guys, just take a breath. We'll be right back with you.
Well, hello again, again on our SPF virtual uh, network here. Where, as you know, we're in a break for a few moments, and while we're doing that, I've got a lot of things I want to talk to Jim Sheehan about. We may do some now and some a little bit later, but Jim, exciting couple of days here. We've announced this CERN proposal that we've uh, been working toward for the past year, uh, an exciting project to establish nine places where folks can get hopefully properly quickly diagnosed and we can begin to accumulate information to move toward clinical trials and biomarker projects and issues. We have to have money to pay for all that and I appreciate the fact and so does the board and this foundation. The work that you do is the chair of our fundraising committee. So I'm going to ask you here for just this moment uh, if you would uh, let our folks at home, some of them may not have heard earlier, let them know about the fundraising that began happening as we dealt with doctors yesterday afternoon about the CERN proposal and what's happening even this morning in this meeting. Yes, really exciting news. So we uh, met with some folks last night, some researchers, some donors, and talked to them about the opportunities and that we're a little bit short this year trying to fund all the grants we want to fund. So to start off with a, a, a young gentleman who has HSP. Uh, uh, Maria Cordori, and he gave almost $100 to start the, the fundraising campaign last night with this extra money. Then we have an anonymous donor that has agreed to give up to $70,000 as a match uh, for this weekend. So if we can raise $70,000 this weekend, it will be doubled, which, uh, which is amazing. We have uh, an anonymous $5,000 donor. We have uh, two $2,000 donors and a couple of $1,000 donors. All this equates to just over $10,000 that was committed just last night. So again, it will be doubled. Hopefully we can take more of that. And then we have another uh, donor that's offered to um, pay up to $10,000 for four years in a row if we decide we want to hire some professional help to help us do fundraising. So. It's an exciting weekend. If you have an opportunity to help us out financially, you can give online. And again, anything that's contributed this weekend will be matched up to $70,000. And Jim, that's an important point. I'm glad you made it, and I'm going to make it again. If you're listening at home, uh, whether you, your family, uh, corporate sponsors you might know, anyone who this weekend... Uh, before the end of this conference, and that's tomorrow about lunch, anyone who donates uh, to this cause during that time, your contribution will be doubled. It will be matched. Uh, what a tremendous offer by this anonymous donor that is willing to match. The idea that we can double everything that's, that's contributed is, is great, and that's important toward this project for a number of reasons. Uh, the $600,000 that we've committed as a board to CERN for the next two years, we know is really a drop in the bucket toward the ultimate goal, but it's an important big drop to get this thing moving and get this thing started. We're hoping that as time goes forward that enough momentum will come in the form of research and dollars that NIH or other large funded organizations will take this on and really move it forward quickly. So again, if you're at home, you're listening uh, virtually, if you've got a few dollars, and another point I want to make, Jim, is you know we talk about a thousand here and ten thousand there, but every fifty dollars, every hundred dollars that can be donated adds up, particularly when you can double it. So we appreciate your uh, thoughts about anything you might do at home. We want you to know about this, Jim. As we get past uh, what's going on this weekend, share real quickly for a moment. Uh, Actually, I'm getting a signal we're going to get started, and I'm going to call you back at a later time because I want you to talk a little bit more about all the easy ways throughout the year to contribute when you can. Great. So, Jim, thank you for joining me. We're going to get you back here in just a moment. I think Dr. Zuckner is going to be talking to us, and we look forward to learning a lot more about this research as we go through the day. Thank you, and we'll see you in a little while. Okay, everybody, we are back. Okay. <laughs> we're getting ready for our next uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to start off with our keynote address uh, this morning, and this is presented by, this is going to uh, be a video presentation from Dr. Stephen Zuckner, and he's going to be talking about genomics. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Zuckner. Hello, my name is Stefan Zuckner. I'm a 
a professor for human genetics and neurology at the University of Miami. Unfortunately, I cannot participate in your in the SPF meeting this year, um, but we agreed that maybe I can re-record my slides and it, it will be um, interesting for you to see those. So let me share my slides with you. So I, I want to talk about the opportunities that we have in HSP genomic research and what this also can mean for therapy. And especially in the context of developing a new consortium in North America uh, for centers of excellence uh, for research in HSP. We call this HSP CERN. And um, my colleagues here, Craig, Blackstone, Rebecca Schule from Germany, and also Darius Ibrahimi Bakari, who's there at your meeting, uh, sort of joined me in these in these overarching pla plans. And here is a, a bit of a background of these four sort of founding members. Um, uh, Rebecca is a professor of neurology in Heidelberg. She's the leading, really, scientist for HSP in Europe. And I think she's very well known to many of you. Um, Dr. Ibrahimi Fakiri is an associate professor at Boston Children's Hospital and has really already made a name for himself by conducting natural history studies and clinical outcome studies in HSP. And of course, Greg Blackstone does need introduction. He's a professor of neurology at Harvard University and he really is interested in exploring the molecular mechanisms um, of HSP. So as we have shared with your board, there is a unique opportunity to develop these centers of excellence. And I'm sure you will talk about your meeting in more detail about these plans. Um, and this is really by learning also from other diseases and uh, disease fields uh, of rare diseases um, and what they have done to to progress um, towards therapeutic solutions. Um, so we think that such a network of uh, academic scientists, we can reach more patients to participate in research studies. Um, by working together, we can certainly find synergies. Um, there are uh, once we start such a uh, network, there will be different opportunities um, in terms of funding. Um, we will have a much stronger case to make to get significant funding, for instance, from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And really the key goal of such a network would be to uh, obtain clinical data from patients I create genetic data and house them and share those data and also have a registry for patients available. So with this, I'm going to start talking about a, a little bit about e, the state of genetics uh, in rare diseases, especially. As you surely know, um, the genetics has made tremendous progress in the recent decades. Um, and much of this has been driven really by technological development. So, and technological development leads also to reduced cost. So today we can sequence a human's genome for about $500 and the prices are still sinking. Uh, only last year, which is interesting, the uh, sort of final version of the human genome has been put together by scientists, and this has been published in the Journal of Science. Uh, we call this the telomere to telomere genome. And here I have three names of companies, Illumina, Nanopore, PecBio. They will sort of represent um, the leading edge of technology in our field. Uh, and while all these successes have, have, have been remarkable, um, there's actually a new technology now available called long read whole genome sequencing, which we think will again change the picture and will allow for many more discoveries. 
So here uh, are, is an overview of all the many genes that can cause SPG or HSP. Um, as you know, there are many different genes. It's very heterogeneous. And yet with all this ability and all these discoveries, there's still about a third uh, of all patients, and probably this number is even quite a bit higher, with trusts, tremendous efforts, we cannot identify the underlying cause, genetic cause, um, in a particular patient or family. So we really want to get to a much higher rate of maybe probably over 90% of diagnostic rate. And what we have learned by discovering all these many genes and, and doctors have been looking carefully at these patients, they found that really HSP is not, doesn't live in a silo. It is connected with other disorders uh, that af affect nerves uh, in your spinal cord, but also nerves sometimes that run in your arms and legs. And there are these connections with related disorders um, and we call this a spectrum, which really ranges from diseases that affect peripheral nerves, um, then also central uh, nerve tracts, like in classic HSP, but also um, diseases that are called ataxias, uh, that are often or that sometimes can be seen in combination with HSP. So we, we really want to take this all into account when we talk about HSP. Uh, to tackle the task of diagnosing more patients, one has to really understand um, the genetics of HSP patients. So by collecting data sets, genetic data sets, we can learn uh, about new genes. We can also learn about existing HSP genes. And here is a quick overview of our database where we currently have over 2,000 HSP genomic data sets available. Um, and in the past five years, this is a typical time frame for, um, for an NIH grant, we added 1,300 HSP genomic data sets. So there's good progress and um, with a unified consortium, this, this will only get better. These data are actually available to researchers um, um, in, in, a, in a tool that we call GenePair, and, and anyone can really go there and look up variants in a de-identified fashion. Uh, look up variants in HSP genes and in any gene really, in the human genome. And so scientists can see if there are interesting signals and then they can communicate with each other and find each other. Uh, we also um, increasingly want to make existing data available at a high granularity so that researchers have to register first uh, to ensure safety, um, data is always de-identified. So patients could never be identified from such data sets. But at the same time, we have to give researchers access to, to really discover new things. And, and, and possibly on an international scale, really. So here is our current um, sort of state where we have about 18,000 genomic data sets from from those related disorders uh, that we have already collected. Um, this database is certified really um, to be used under, for instance, the European pr data privacy um, requirements. And just very recently, we have now the ability to share data freely with all registered users. And for instance, myself, I myself and and, and other collaborators like Dr. Shai from Iowa, uh, we have now made our data fully available without any grace period. And we, we are trying to convince others to do the same. This will really expedite um, uh, science. And as you can see on the right side, these efforts, these databases are supported by other organizations such as, not unlike SPF. And um, that is very important. Now here's a typical example of a gene discovery, UBAP1, um, that was made a few years ago. And because of this international database, we can immediately uh, find these rare families in different countries. 
and, and that leads to a much stronger uh, case for a new gene and, and also sort of expedites follow-up studies. Having that so much, such data available attracts, of course, also um, uh, scientists who develop new tools, for instance, like Matt Dancy is a scientist in Miami who has developed uh, a machine learning tool called Maverick, and this is now accepted for publication in a nature journal. So this will give it a lot of validity, and, and, and I think uh, many more people will use this. Uh, essentially, this, this software can predict um, if a certain gene might be an HSP gene, or if certain variants in, in, in any gene really uh, could cause disease. And it does this with, with a really uh, high success rate. In fact, uh, you see here in a sort of model how different similar tools have per performed in the past and on top the two blue lines show you how well Maverick performs. So it's a huge step up really in the, in the performance. So what can you do with such a tool? Um, for instance, we can predict uh, the, the, uh, if, if variants in the SPAS gene are pathogenic, before those variants ever been seen in a human being. So in the small red dots you might see there in the blue square, these are um, mutations that are known to be pathogenic in the SPAS gene. And when the, the gray dots sort of seem to agree with those red dots, they, highly, they also predict that these are pathogenic uh, changes. Now, all the gray dots without red, uh, these are purely predicted. And, and you can see that you could, you could basically um, have a score ready before, before a patient is even identified. So when a report comes back and, and there's, you're not sure if, if, if a variant in SPAST is pathogenic, we can look at this chart and we can immediately get an opinion from this um, artificial intelligence tool if this variant is slightly pathogenic or likely benign. Here are some other more recent examples of new gene identifications um, in the broader field of HSP where we were involved. Uh, this is um, a gene uh, called um, FICD that can be it can carry mutations um, in HSP patients. This was discovered between the groups of Rebecca Schuler and my own group here in Miami. And, and we have done some follow-up studies that, that really of great molecular interest for scientists. And here are some more rather recent examples, and they are certainly not all of the examples we have. And this just shows you what happens when you organize um, scientists working together and we think this will continue and even expedite when we establish our HSP consortium. For instance, Rebecca and I have been working under an NIH grant which have, has given us sufficient uh, funding and also sort of a great incentive to work closely together and um, over the last 10 years we have published to over 60 papers jointly. And when you have a lot of genetic data available uh, and, and it can be shared and used by scientists, you can then uh, do studies you couldn't do with just a few families or cases in your hand. You can do statistical uh, analysis as shown here. Uh, Dana Biss was a, a student in my lab um, and she has done this uh, just a couple of years ago um, in trying to use statistical correlation studies in diseases such as spastic paraplegias, but also CMT. We sometimes call them exonopathies. Um, and, and that also can generate new uh, disease genes and also risk genes uh, or modifier genes uh, for HSP. Now, despite all these many efforts, um, 
geneticists have realized that, you know, as I said, we still have this very large diagnostic gap. And that most discoveries we are making um, only at few families typically. So the success rate or the new genes explain only uh, a small proportion of the missing diagnostic gap. Uh, now, there are certainly more rare genes to be identified, but we also start thinking that we might be missing things by just looking at genes, and we might have to look at outside of genes. And when you look outside of genes in the genome, you really talk about about 98% of the entire genome, which is the space outside of genes. And there are certain variations or mutations there in this space that we call, for instance, structural changes or repeat expansion changes. Uh, there are examples with diseases where such mutations have been discovered, but not really at scale yet. And a lot has to do with the technology available. And this is changing now with the long read whole genome sequencing. So we have been especially interested uh, in the last few years in the so-called expansion disorders. And I just want to give you a, a brief overview of what this actually means. There are these uh, repetitive stretches in the genome uh, that we all, all of us carry. In fact, uh, there is a catalog of more than 1.7 million such uh, regions or loci in the genome. Um, and we have recently studied uh, the largest um, long read whole genome data set in the world, uh, about a thousand uh, such data sets. And we have just from these 1,000 people, which are not even, uh, don't harbor any, any disease, we have created uh, over 3.5 billion different uh, alleles over all these different uh, regions. So. This just goes to say, this is not a minor, this is not just a minor uh, additional place to look at in the genome. This could be a major contributor to disease. And then eventually could, could lead us to thinking about therapies. And Sarah here is a PhD student in my lab. Uh, she also then developed um, a machine learning tool again to fish out from these many, many different alleles, uh, which ones we should uh, possibly study first, uh, which ones might actually uh, disease disease causing. So, so these are really valuable tools. And again, having a consortia, having a unified way of, of collecting genetic data and clinical data really pushes uh, the development of such tools. And here is one of those examples. Uh, just a few years ago, we and others discovered this um, gene called RFC1, and there is a non-coding uh, repeat expansion in this gene. And it was a big surprise to learn that this, this particular repeat expansion or mutation ex actually explains, uh, is the most important gene to, to cause what we call sensory neuropathy. So this is a specific disorder where there was a large diagnostic gap and this non-coding change here uh, now explains uh, about a third of all those patients. And, and there might be something like this also uh, for HSP to be discovered. And here's another very recent example really from January uh, 2023 where we um, jointly discovered this uh, non-coding repeat expansion in a gene called FGF14, which causes ataxia. And in fact, some of these patients also have um, uh, spasticity. So, and it turns out uh, that this particular repeat expansion now is one of the most common ataxia genes uh, ever discovered. So again, lots of opportunity and, and we definitely want to look more uh, into HSP data sets for such repeat expansions. 
And you already noticed that we work with many different uh, uh, researchers around the world. These papers I showed you have many co-authors. And, and this is ultimately where we want to go to with our HSP network. Uh, and here's just one example what can be done uh, from the ataxia field. Uh, and it's, it's kind of unbelievable how many uh, researchers, these are all physicians and scientists from these many different countries, who work together in the ataxia field to solve these very similar problems that we have, um, that we have in the HSP field. And here's another example, um, the Inherited Neuropathy Consortium uh, uh, also is spanning, spanning uh, the world, really. So to sort of close my remarks, um, it's very important uh, to understand how genetic diagnosis and therapies that tar target specific genes are really two sides of the same metal. And um, the immediate goal for geneticists is, of course, to diagnose as many patients as possible and also understand the mutations in those genes that, that we already know, because not all the mutations or all the variants in, for instance, the SPAS gene, the SPAS gene are necessarily pathogenic. So we also have to understand the individual mutations in those genes. Because only those patients that know with a high degree of certainty that their mutation is causing the disease, only those patients will be able to participate in future clinical trials or will qualify for genetic targeted gene targeting therapies such as um, gene therapy uh, or CRISPR th therapy. And we see it from fields related to HSP that the development of these therapies is at high pace now. Uh, in fact, HSP will benefit a lot from the learnings from these fields. Um, I, I predict that in the next five years, we will see multiple really promising um, gene therapy products that the uh, companies will want to test in in patients in clinical trials. So we have to basically prepare for this moment. Um, and it is coming, that is for sure. So that's really good news for this community. And I just want to show and thank my colleagues, many colleagues involved in this. And I leave it to, to Darius um, to discuss with you, uh, answer questions. Uh, discuss the opportunities, and I hope I see I see you very soon. And um, I wish you a successful meeting. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. Um, I want to remind you that we are recording these presentations that will end up on the SPF YouTube channel. I know it's a lot to take in, especially with the slides and stuff, and it's really hard to really get into them, but later you'll be able to view these and be able to see them and slow them down and look at the data a little bit closer and stuff. Uh, you know, it, it, it's there's so much information in such a short amount of time. And, and hearing, and you know, we've got, uh, you know, we've got a lot of different, uh, uh, voices that um, sound differently in in a, in a video presentation versus versus live than in the room. We're going to take just a second two right here. You can't go nowhere. It's not one of those kind of breaks. We're doing some technology flip over. We're downloading some files in the background, and apparently that happened a lot faster than I was told it was going to be. And so we're all ready now to move on with our presentation with Dr. Craig Blackstone, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Blackstone. <laughs> the big green button goes forward, the little red button goes backward. Forward, backward. I think I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> the easiest thing I've had to do today. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you again. Again, many of you know me from previous uh, 
meetings over the past uh, 10 or 15 years. I've had the opportunity to speak at many of them. And, but I also know that many of you are new, so it's a pleasure to meet most many of you. Some of you I've seen as patients. Hopefully some of you I'll get to meet in the future as part of our trials that we'll be doing someday. Um, my task today is to talk about a few things. Uh, first is to describe how the biology of HSPs and why that's so important uh, in ultimately getting to a cure, and how it links to what Darius is going to be talking after me and to what uh, Stefan talked about uh, just now. Uh, but I also want to introduce uh, my institution, because as, as we know, we have this really exciting opportunity with SPF in the, in the CERN and these different sites. And I think over time, you'll get to know our institutions well. So I just want to give you a couple slides showing about my institution. Um, oops, let me see. I said I'd be able to get this work. First, I do have some disclosures. Uh, many of us have to do this when we work with companies. So I'm on the, I chair scientific advisory boards of companies, and I'm also on the board of directors of a company, and I advise a lot of venture capital firms on the formation of companies. Um, though that introduces conflict sometimes, it also presents a great opportunity for our network because it gives many of us a tremendous amount of experience working with companies, understanding what they want, uh, and helping us move ideas from academics forward to drugs that people can take. Uh, so again, I'm hoping that each of us as part of this network can bring unique types of expertise uh, to this collaborative effort. And this is one way that I hope I can contribute as well. Uh, this is my institution, the Mass General Hospital in Boston. Uh, it's the oldest hospital in Boston. I think it's well over 200 years old. It's also the largest hospital-based research program in the United States. Uh, and it has the largest neurology department in the United States, though many people don't believe that when they see how long it takes to get an appointment with us. Um, <laughs> as many of you know, we have over 300, neuro uh, 300 neurology faculty at Mass General. Uh, and many of us do research. Um, my job at Mass General is I'm the Chief of the Movement Disorders Division, so I oversee about 40 faculty. And within that division, we have five centers of excellence. We have Tourette's Syndrome, Huntington's Disease, Parkinson's Disease, Excellent Dystonia Parkinsonism, and Progressive Supranuclear Palsy. And of course, we're very happy that now we have HSP. Uh, and we've learned a lot about running these networks from all of those centers of excellence. And all of those centers of excellence are supported by foundations. So we're going to be able to, I think, over time contribute a lot of the knowledge that we've gained from working with other foundations to really make sure this network succeeds and really uh, helps us move toward uh, uh, therapies. And in fact, all the other ones that we work with are actively involved in clinical trials right now. So that's certainly what we hope for this one as well. Now, Mass General is in Boston, which is a very hard city to build in. So our labs are not right here. Um, they're across the river uh, and um, or across the river or, uh, or um, you know, in Charlestown. And many of you, oops, I'm trying to get this to work and it's not always working, let's see. Um, and many of you know where my lab is. Uh, it's, just, it's just around the corner from a very famous boat called the USS Constitution. Uh, and uh, the Navy had a large Charleston, Charlestown Navy Yard, which is about a short walk from Mass General Hospital. Uh, and during the wars, they used it. But after the wars, they haven't needed it as much. So pretty much most of it's now focused on allowing people to visit the oldest ship in the US Navy. Uh, so I, this is when I have my commute is walking by this every day. Uh, so so just a couple blocks away from that in the old Charlestown Navy Yard, they've repurposed a lot of the old Navy buildings as research labs. So any of you who want to visit this boat um, and you're in town, let me know because it's not that far from our research labs. And we have several, well, we have one building completely dedicated to neuroscience and neurodegenerative disease research and other buildings where we have labs. So that's our institution. Um, so the HSPs and PLS, I, I wanted to talk about the basic science in a couple different ways. And I wanted to start with circuitry. And I, I don't want to get too much into the sort of the details of this, but I do want you to understand sort of the basics when we think about these two diseases. So HSPs and PLS share something in common. They share the, basically what we call upper motor neurons. And you can see that in the diagram. I have this diagram that says ALS foundation at the bottom. And you see there's a person's brain and the nerves start up in your brain and they go all the way down your spinal cord. So you think of cells as being really small, but these cells can be a meter long. They're very big. Um, and those are the ones that are affected predominantly in HSP. It's length dependent. So that's why your legs are affected. They have to go farther and the legs are affected. People with PLS don't necessarily have that length dependency. Their upper motor neurons can be involved, um, you know, just in other ways. And so they might not have just the legs. They could have other problems, of, you know, sort of above the waist in 
arms, in, 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 sort of in the head, in speech, things like that. Um, but there's that commonality in the type of cell that's involved. And that's part of a motor pathway. So the corticospinal nerves synapse onto other nerves that allow your muscles to move. Um, so as you know, most people with upper motor neuron syndromes don't have a lot of weakness, but they have the spasticity. Um, and that's sort of, this is, so this is sort of a link between these two diseases. And it's one of the reasons, of course, that this foundation you know, links the two together. Um, uh, so, of course, uh, for HSPs, we also describe things by the genes that, they're, um, that are mutated in different forms. But as Stefan said in his talk, there's a lot of people here and elsewhere that we see in, in our clinics that don't have a diagnosis. We know they have HSP, we just don't know what type, or it's a new type. So that's why the genetic efforts that Stefan mentioned is so important. We really do need to have we need to be able to diagnose everybody with HSP because that's ultimately going to determine what type of therapy you get. Uh, so that genetic e e e effort is really important. Um, now I have some other numbers on here. I don't need to go through. You know, HSP is rare, um, two to nine out of a hundred thousand. But I think it's important for us to emphasize that PLS is much rarer, and because of that, it can fall through the cracks. Sometimes there's people are seen with PLS in ALS clinics. Once they don't have ALS, then you know where do they go? So I think this network is going to be very valuable for giving people with PLS you know, a home, a, a clinical home to go to, a clinical home for clinical trials in the future. Um, one huge advantage we have in HSPs in particular, and as we learn more about the genetics of PLS, you know, maybe, maybe we'll get some insights there too, is that we have so many different genes. And that can be daunting at times because it's like, well, how many different you know, genes do we have to develop therapies for? How many different forms? Um, but, but I can tell you that a lot of common diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, they don't have that advantage. So they've struggled a lot in terms of identifying targets for therapy. So we can really use these genetic insights um, to do biological studies that ultimately will give us the targets that we want to uh, use for therapies. Uh, so again, I just, I just listed, these are just some symptoms, but what I wanted to emphasize about the way we treat HSPs and PLS now is it's, we treat the, the network abnormalities, we treat the circuit abnormalities, we're not treating the underlying cause, we're treating the symptoms that we see. That's very important, of course, but ultimately the ultimate goal is, of course, to slow or stop the progression of the disease, or perhaps even prevent it entirely. Uh, and as we see, there's lots of ways we can do that, but right now, our therapy Please don't do that. Uh, they treat the symptoms, they treat the network abnormalities that patients have. But ultimately, genetic diseases and most diseases uh, are diseases of cells, of individual cells. And again, this is not a new idea. I put a quote there from the 1800s. Um, so we have to think about what's happening at cell levels. Again, we have a huge advantage in HSPs uh, is in particular uh, because we know it's a gene, as, as Stefan mentioned, and we know genes are the, you know, make proteins, which are the building blocks of cells. So it's sort of a, a simple way to think about it, but it really is, in many ways, when you think about what SPF has funded over the years, a majority of the studies are focused on the biology of these genes and how they work. And that's a critical element to ultimately moving to clinical trials. It's also a critical element in other diseases. If you look at Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, there's things you can see in the cells that are abnormal. And those are things that they target. And if you hear all the controversy about Alzheimer's disease with these new therapies, the, the, the controversy is because um, they can clear some of the cell abnormalities. They can clear the plaques with these uh, new new drugs with these new antibody-based drugs, but the patients don't always get better. So that's why it's so important what Darius is going to talk about. It's important not only the self things that we see, but also that patients actually improve, that we don't just fix some, a cell and make it look better, uh, and, but we have to know if patients are improving. And that's why the clinical aspect of this, uh, this consortium is so important, uh, because ultimately when you do regulatory agency, when you work with regulatory agencies, they love to see a biomarker change or some cellular readout to show that your drug is acting the way they think it is, and that's why biology is so important, but ultimately people have to get better, and that's why the clinical aspect is so important as well. Now, one of the things that we've all done over the years, those of us that worked in this and a lot of people who've come on since, is try to think of the HSP genes in groups. 
We don't think that there's 90 or 100 or 110 different forms of HSP. We think they sort of cluster around certain pathways and that we can target those pathways individually or maybe collectively in some cases for therapy. So this is just a diagram that I've drawn and updated over the years, and it just shows the genes linked to different parts of the cell. Again, thinking about the disease as a cellular problem that we have to fix the cell somehow, uh, but the first thing we have to do before we fix it is to understand what's broken. What, what does the mutation do to the cell? And once we see that, we can start to think about how we intervene. So again, this is just a way to take a very daunting hundred genes or so and, and parse them into small categories that we can focus um, on our research on. And again, this is much of what I think SPF has funded over the years, is a lot of the studies of these different gene products or proteins that the genes produce. Um, this is a study that we did many years ago, but there's, again, many people in this audience have done similar things in that we take certain HSPs, in the case SPG11 and 15, and if you look at panel A at the bottom where it says LAMP1, and there's that little insert, uh, you can see on the left, uh, in, in, on the far left, that you know th these are lysosomes. Uh, they're, they're Small. And you notice the two patients, uh, the two are on the right, are much bigger. Uh, and those are people with SPG 15 in this case. Uh, so, you know, when I said we have to see an abnormality in cells, we can do that in many cases for this. And then over time, when we, when you know, the research that often you fund is to understand um, how that changes. So here, I, we, we, from again, many years ago, sort of can explain why you get, instead of the little lysosome, why you get this big autolysosome and why it gets stuck there. And then that's the abnormality we see in patient cells. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that biology does. It takes takes the genetic defect, allows us to understand an abnormality at the cell level that we think is important and is an important target for our therapies. Another example is endoplasmic reticulum. You might have heard that. You've, you funded grants in this, I think, many times. Um, the reason we choose this is the same as I just showed you. It's not just one HSP form. It's multiple ones. All these proteins interact with one another, and each one of them causes HSP by itself. Uh, so obviously, somehow when they fit together, it causes an abnormality. Now we want to see what that abnormality looks like um, at, at a cell level. I said more genes. Um, so I will see, show um, when we look at uh, abnormalities at cell levels, we have several ways to do that. And again, this is things that when you look at the grants that were funded, you'll see different IPS cells. You'll see all these different lists of different things. One common one that you'll see a lot is, is actually taking skin cells from patients um, De what they call de-differentiating them. It means making them into stem cells and then making those stem cells into nerve cells. So it allows you to actually see what a nerve, in a sense, would look like from a person with HSP. Um, and uh, just again, just as a quick example of what you can do, if you look at panel A at the top, that's what these cells look like normally. On the bottom is a young girl who had HSP. You can see it, uh, all, all the processes are short. And then in the panels right next to that, you can see that when we start treating it with certain drugs, we can normalize. It. So that's a lot of what we're trying to do in biology is exactly this. We're trying to take, understand the abnormalities that patients have in different model systems, whether it's flies, cells, mice, all different systems, uh, and then seeing if we can change those abnormalities and, and identify potential therapies uh, for the clinical trials. And I do want to show, sometimes this doesn't work so well. Uh, again, just wanted to remind you that, I, I'm going to go back for a second. Uh, it's not going to work. Um, okay, so one of the things that, one of the challenges, and that you may, you may have seen this many times with, with modeling HSPs, is it's important to remember that only people have HSP. Mice don't, uh, flies don't, cells don't. Uh, they're models. They're, they, they tell us one or two things. Um, but it's very hard to model a human disease in a mouse. And it's especially hard to model a disease of cells this long in a mouse that's this long. It can't be done. It's not possible. So what we do sometimes is we actually have to create mice that don't exactly mimic a human, but maybe uh, mimic some of the key features. So one of the things that we did recently, which I think is, is uh, some of the labs that do a lot of mouse work are quite interested, and they're actually developing some new models for us related to this, is to actually take two of the HSP genes that bind to each other uh, and, and mutate them both. <laughs> uh, and we were able to create a mouse. As you can see on the bottom, that one has something that looks like HSP, and the one at the top 
walks normally. Um, and the one at the bottom, actually, it's even more of an effect than you think because the treadmill on the bottom was running seven times slower. So it's, it, it, again, it's sort of, mod and this is a mouse we're actually using right now to test therapies. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the therapies we're testing. Um, first is, this is what we do when we quantitate it. it. It basically is just a measure, a quantitative measure of what we see, what I just showed you in the video, using lots of different um, tools to measure how well the mouse does. The reason we do that in science is that we need to quantitate things because we need to predict how much of an effect we have so that when we treat them we can you know, give a number. We can have a, a certain level of certainty to whether we've made the mouse better. We don't want to just look at the mouse, give it a drug, and see if it gets better looking at it. We need to measure that. Um, so all of us are doing this, and in fact, we're working with a lab now, it's called Jackson Labs in Maine, where we're actually having them do it uh, in, in a rigorous way that even the regulatory agencies like FDA will accept, uh, because we want to be absolutely sure if our drugs work, but we don't want, want to just be sure that they work for us. We want to be able to convince even the regulators uh, that, that these drugs work and that they can trust this data. Again, I won't talk about this, but I just wanted to emphasize that there, we, we're always looking for differences in, um, in models uh, versus wild, wild type, like normal mice versus mutant mice, and that sometimes we can get ideas in the mice that we can then go back for and look in people. So some things you can do in a mouse easier than a person, and actually that can give us insights as we go back to seeing patients that can give us ideas on things we should look at. Um, so sometimes we learn from the mouse model. I just wanted to show one high technology thing that we've been working on. Um, again, as Stefan showed you, you know, you hear about AI because it can write your papers now uh, and write your letters and stuff, but we've been using this for a long time. So in fact, this we, four or five years ago, we actually used AI in a, in a very specific thing. We wanted, to, I showed you like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We wanted to show um, an abnormality in the ER in a mouse. Um, and that's very hard to do. You can't do it with traditional imaging. So we use this brand new technique that I won't describe. It's called FibSem. It's the highest resolution way to, um, to uh, basically see a, a cell structure. And we did it actually in a mouse. Most people just do it in cells. It took a year to do this one figure. But we were able to actually, on the left, and in the, in the, you see wild type and then the mutants on the bottom, we were able to reconstruct the corticospinal tract in a mouse and we were able to do it at the highest resolution ever done and because there was so much data when we generated it using this electron microscopy technique we it would have taken years for somebody to re reconstruct it by hand so we had a machine learning. We taught a machine to go through and analyze this massive amounts of data, and it took a supercomputer about an hour to do. Um, but th this will make us all feel better. I mean, I don't know if you can see it. As you move to the right, A and B look very different. I'm going to show a blow-up version. But the really neat thing about it is, at the beginning, the computer made a mistake. It couldn't see the, a big abnormality in the ER. And I can show you. So on the left is a normal mouse corticospinal neuron, and on the right is what happens when you get an HSP mutation. So you notice all those things that go sideways, like ladders. The, the, the computer originally couldn't see that because it didn't think the ER goes that way. And in fact, it was right. This never happens normally. So the computer had to be retrained. Uh, so artificial intelligence isn't always right. We had to retrain it, and then it could see it. So at the beginning, it couldn't detect this at all. And fortunately, we knew it was there, or we would, if we would have believed the computer, it would have made a complete error. So you always have to double check chat GPP and stuff like that. Uh, but this is a huge effect. So if you think about it, this is what we've always wanted. We want to see, just like Alzheimer's, just like Parkinson's, we want to see those abnormalities in the cell that really help define what's happening at a very basic level. Um, and again, this is just one example of one HSP, and you multiply that by all the other ones on all the work that you funded over the years. These are the types of abnormalities that we then try to reverse with therapies. So that's why basic science, and that's what and my, my topic is today, that's why it's so important in the drug discovery process. And I just wanted to emphasize that there's really been, and Darius is going to talk about this, but, you know, and he's really been the, the sort of really spearheaded this understanding of 
HSP in kids. And kids for many, many years were misdiagnosed that had HSP as cerebral palsy. Um, and now that's going to change. And I think this network is going to really give a lot of children with uh, misdiagnosed disorders of CP and others uh, are gonna give them the proper diagnosis and proper access to therapy. But I just wanted to emphasize another thing we can do with, with understanding biology is, you know, and Darius may talk about this, but we have children, especially with SPG3A and 4, that get these de novo or new mutations, and there's certain mutations in certain parts of the molecule that give them a much more severe early onset form. So part of biology isn't just understanding what a protein does or how, you know, how all the most mutations affect it, but why these special mutations are having a different effect. And that understanding may be very important as we develop therapies. And we, in fact, have made a mouse um, uh, where we're going to, uh, with that mutation that I showed with Ella, and we're going to gene edit it with a group at MIT, which is a hospital right next, uh, which is a university right next to our hospital. Uh, and we're going to try to work on new therapies for some of these severe forms. And this is a picture from Darius's study where it really does emphasize that this genetic information is important. So he has all the gene um, the gene mutations identified. And it turns out that the, the kids with the severe forms really cluster in certain areas. So as basic scientists, one of our goals is to understand why those clusters have such a different effect. So that's another way that we use basic science or biology to try to understand you know, how, how we need to treat these disorders. Um, and not just, again, not just a, um, you know, just saying I, I, one gene, this is the way we're gonna treat it, but understanding how different mutations, even in the same gene, can give rise to different diseases, different forms of HSP, or even a completely different neurologic disease. And all those are gonna be important as we develop therapies. Um, so again, this, this is, I think, the, that the, the SPF has made, really over the last 10, 15, 20 years, has made huge investments in understanding Understanding the biology, and I think that they will continue to do that, but I think also that we've learned so much now that we really are poised to move forward for a lot of therapies, uh, and I think, again, that's a very, very um, encouraging um, sign. So again, I just wanted to, this is my hospital again, just want to thank the people I work with. And I really do want to emphasize Darius. I know he's coming right after me to speak, but he's really, really been a, a great collaborator since I joined Mass General uh, from the NIH. And he's again, really, I think, spearheaded a lot of important studies into uh, the really under uh, understudied, I think, before that um, area of of how kids are affected with these different forms of HSP. Um, so I think uh, Darius is gonna come next and speak. Uh, just wanted to give a brief introduction. Darius is, uh, is the leader of the Movement Disorders Program at Boston Children's Hospital, which is sort of the largest children's hospital in Boston. It's part of the same network of Harvard Medical School hospitals. Uh, and again, Darius has really created a, a really robust program uh, and has, a, has seen a huge number of children with HSP. And again, I think is really paving the way not only for developing new therapies, a lot of them fo focused on gene therapies and, and uh, other, other kinds of um, you know, more traditional therapies, but is also really, um, I think, uh, gonna allow us to really understand the full spectrum of how, of HSP in kids and to ensure that a lot of children who are misdiagnosed uh, for many, many years are, are now gonna get the proper diagnosis and the proper uh, treatment. So Darius? So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Darius Abrimi Fakari. I'm a, I'm a pediatric neurologist at Boston Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thanks for having us. Thank you, Craig, for the very kind introduction. Uh, thank you to uh, the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation, the board, the scientific advisors for allowing us to present some of the work that we're doing and some of the work that we're planning to do. Um, so I'm, I'm switching gears a little bit. You, you see the theme here. We went from genetics to biology, and now we're talking about clinical trials and how we get ready for them. Um, so the title of my talk is Clinical Trial Readiness for Hereditary Spastic Paraplegia, uh, Lessons Learned from Translation of Research in Rare Diseases. So my disclosures. So in the next 30 minutes or so, I hope to um, very briefly cover three areas. First, I'll talk a little bit about what clinical trial readiness is and what the challenges are for hereditary spastic paraplegia in particular. 
I'll then use an example of some of the work that we've been doing at Boston Children's Hospital looking at a specific group of childhood onset hereditary spastic paraplegia, the so-called uh, AP4-related forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia, to give you an example of how we develop clinical trial readiness. And in the last part, I'll give an outlook on what we've talked about earlier today, uh, the creation of uh, what we call a spastic paraplegia centers of excellence research network um, that will cover research, both uh, uh, clinical research uh, and, and translational research for both HSP and PLS. So on to the first part. So the challenges, and this is, I think to this audience, this is not new, but I think it's important for us to remember that because when we talk with regulatory agencies, when we talk with um, uh, uh, funding agencies, uh, it's important for us to remember that we work on a rare disease and that brings unique challenges. Um, as a field, we know that uh, rare diseases are by definition rare, but as a group affect millions of people worldwide. Um, so I think rare diseases are, are gaining a voice um, uh, on, a, on a global stage. Unfortunately, most of these 7,000 or so rare diseases still have no specific treatment. And when I say most of the 7,000, I mean over 95%. Um, and I think there is, um, while this is a shocking number, there's a reason to be optimistic because I think we're learning a lot about rare diseases. A lot of this is driven by genetics and, and by biology, as you've seen in the first two talks. And now it's really um, uh, on us to translate these discoveries into therapies. So here in this graph, which I'd like to show um, because it illustrates where we stand, you see indicated in the blue line the number of publications on rare diseases. And you see that there is a tremendous trend towards more knowledge. And a lot of this is driven by genetics. And then at the bottom, you see the number of approved therapies um, in North America or in the US indicated by the red line and in Europe indicated by the green line. And you see that there's a positive trend, but this gap between the amount of knowledge we have and the number of approved therapies remains wide. So I think this has a number of reasons. One, genetic discovery has advanced tremendously, but in many cases, the molecular understanding beyond just knowing what the gene is uh, remains limited. That has to do with the fact that in many cases for, for rare diseases, disease models and reagents need to be developed. And I think the SPF has done a tremendous um, amount of, of work, has enabled a tremendous amount of work um, uh, looking at developing disease models for, for hereditary spastic paraplegia. And on the clinical side, we're really missing uh, deep phenotyping and natural history data. And I'll talk more about this when we talk about the future. At least historically, there was limited interest in funding research on, on rare diseases, but it has changed dramatically, and I'll highlight some examples. One of the main drivers of change, and you've seen this, this graph in, in Dr. Zugner's talk, is that the fact that genetic testing um, has become much more affordable. And this means that more people will have access to it and will be able to make diagnoses earlier, um, and, and this will over time improve care. What we will also learn, I think, this is my personal opinion, is that there is a unique rare disease ecosystem when it comes to developing therapies. So we will learn that um, many diseases are rare, and some might actually be ultra rare, micro rare, or nano rare. These are arbitrarily defined numbers, but they just illustrate the fact that we will, I think, learn that, that um, uh, some diseases are truly ultra rare, affecting a few hundred people worldwide. And as you can imagine, the drug development system that we've built in this country over the last 60 years or so um, is not geared towards these rare populations. It's geared towards common diseases, cancer, Alzheimer's, cystic fibrosis, other diseases. Um, so we have to rethink this. And I think as we're approaching the, the era of genomic therapies, we have to think about sort of models how we can bring these discoveries that need tremendous resources to develop even to the rarest of populations. And I think that's a unique, that's a unique challenge of the next, next decade, I think. And one solution, of course, exists in developing platform technologies and a regulatory environment that uses platform approaches so that we don't have to reinvent and go through every step for every disease. So as a physician scientist in, in my group in, at Boston Children's Hospital is taking on basically two 
uh, challenges, and I think these are two challenges for the field in general. One is to create clinical trial readiness, and what I mean by that is really creating a community. Community around a shared goal of, of being ready for um, interventional trials, so trials that test new medications or gene therapies. And this takes a lot of stakeholders, it takes a lot of infrastructure. I've, I've highlighted some of the key pieces to a clinical trial readiness program here in this, in this cartoon. And the second, of course, is to develop molecular based molecular mechanism-based treatments, and these come in different modalities. These can be small molecules, drugs that you take by mouth, they can be um, genomic therapies that are, um, uh, that are given once and correct the underlying genetic defect. So there's a lot that is coming, as Dr. Blackstone was reviewing earlier. So we're in, in this interesting situation now where this is becoming a reality for some genetic diseases, and in the field of pediatric neurology, a lot of what we know now has come from experience with a condition called spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, where we have now three approved uh, therapies that work on the molecular mechanisms and that have changed outcomes dramatically. And this is continuing now. I think many of you will have seen that uh, yesterday, I believe, or the day before, um, the FDA granted accelerated approval for a new gene therapy for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which I think is setting the stage for similar uh, approaches for other diseases. So it's a very exciting time, and I think we're learning a lot from these, relatively speaking, more common diseases. So as we're building these fancy therapies, um, we have to think about sort of, are we ready for them? And I think, to use this analogy, I think unfortunately for HSP, the road looks like this right now. There is a, there is a road, but we just have to build it out so we can drive the car the way it's built. So um, that's what clinical trial readiness really uh, means. And um, you know, to give this a little bit of a historic background, and this is true for many things in neurology, in fact, we're moving through different stages. So hereditary spastic paraplegia was described in the late 19th century. Um, this was a description first in the German and French literature that basically described the clinical symptoms. Okay. Then we moved into the mid 20th century and, and we understood uh, the pathology better. There uh, were the first imaging studies done and we were able to actually, we as a field were able to look at the brain and the spinal cord using CT scans and MRI scans. And then in the 1990s, genetics ca came around and, and we started realizing that hereditary spastic paraplegia is not one condition, but it's 80 different types, or over 80 different types, I should say. Um, and I think now we're finally at the stage where, based on all of this knowledge, we're starting to see the first interventional trials. But if we can translate the new technologies that I mentioned earlier that are being already tested for other conditions into the field of HSP, I think we will see um, a lot more therapeutic approaches uh, becoming available to patients. So one aspect that was mentioned earlier that is unique to the pediatric population is the fact that um, many children with hereditary spastic paraplegia, because the symptoms are nonspecific initially, are not diagnosed until much later. And I'm using the example of cerebral palsy here because this is a field where there's been a lot of wonderful work, including from colleagues of mine at Boston Children's Hospital, that has shown that if you take um, a children with cerebral palsy, with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, um, and certain inclusion criteria, the diagnostic yield of genetic testing is anywhere between 15 and, and 30 or 40 percent. So that means that, depending again on the inclusion criteria, 15 to 40 percent of children actually ha don't have cerebral palsy, have something else, a genetic condition. And if you then look carefully what genetic diagnoses are made in these studies, you realize that about a quarter of cases actually have hereditary spastic paraplegia. And in fact, in this recent meta-analysis done by my, my colleague, Sitsuru Astava at Boston Children's Hospital, he was able to show that actually the second, if you take all the information together, the second and third most common gene that was found again in children who had a diagnosis of cerebral palsy are two very well-known um, HSP genes, SPAS and ATL1, so SPG4 and SPG3A. So with, with sort of this background, we started working on childhood onset hereditary spastic paraplegia a few years ago. 
And one of the main um, uh, projects that we uh, build out is a, is a registry in a natural history study, specifically for children and young adults with hereditary spastic paraplegia. This is a snapshot of our data. This is from March of this year. At this point, we had seen over uh, 450 or just over 450 um, uh, individuals with hereditary spastic paraplegia. You see the distribution of genes listed there. And we're seeing these patients on a longitudinal um, basis. We're meeting with families. We try to meet every, every year. And you see that we've seen a number for a second and third visit. And a lot of this work uh, is coordinated um, by Amy Tam, who's our uh, study coordinator, who's here today. Um, and does, does uh, fantastic work um, coordinating all of these complex uh, tasks and, uh, and assessments. So what have we learned from just the last, let's say, three years of, of doing this study? We've learned a lot. First, we've learned about the impact of the NOVA variants uh, for uh, dominant forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia. And we've talked a little bit about SPG3 and SPG4. Much of our work has been on the autosomal recessive forms where we've uh, developed tools to interpret uh, missense variants and, and contributed to uh, phenotypic expansion, so understanding the symptoms better. And none of this is done in isolation. So while our study is housed at Boston Children's Hospital, we, uh, for all of these projects, work with partners worldwide because in rare disease, that's what you have to do. And it's the only way to make progress. We've learned, similar to what was mentioned in the first talk, that in about, a 30 in about 30 percent of children who we think have hereditary spastic paraplegia, we find no genetic cause with clinically available genetic testing. And that's something that we're looking to change by offering the next generation of, of genetic testing through research. And then as a clinician, it's important that we also discovered a number of cases of um, disorders that can mimic hereditary spastic paraplegia, but are treated in a very different way. Uh, so that's an important lesson for us as clinicians as well. And it's really important to identify these um, mimics of hereditary spastic paraplegia. All right, now I'll, I'll come to uh, my second part of the talk, which is about clinical trial readiness. And I'll share an example of a group of uh, childhood onset forms of HSP that we've worked on for now about f uh, five years at this point. So these are four conditions. They're all rare. And when I started working on this, there were about uh, six patients reported in the literature. Um, these are four different genes. Um, you see them listed here. Um, they, the disorders are called SPG47, SPG50, SPG51, and 52. And what they all have in common is that they, their proteins are part of the same protein complex. So they work together. And it doesn't really matter which subunit is missing. The complex isn't formed properly when one of them is missing. So um, what uh, follows from this is that children with mutations in all four different genes, and you'll see examples here on the slide, um, although different genes, different kinds of mutations, they all share the same symptoms. Um, so we really think of this as one disease caused by four, four different genes. So we started working on this, and there was really not much known at that point in time. And through the support of many, many families from around the world, we've been able to uh, make a lot of progress in understanding the symptoms and really preparing for clinical trials by understanding what symptoms we need to focus on for clinical outcome measures. So we've learned that in this specific condition, there is a, a progression um, uh, from low muscle tone in the first year of life to spasticity uh, in early childhood that um, usually affects the legs first, and in some cases can affect the arms as well. There are associated complications as listed here in this slide. But what we've really learned is a lesson that I think uh, transcends to a lot of childhood onset forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia, which is that this is probably both a neurodevelopmental and a progressive neurological disorder, meaning that some of the symptoms present so early um, that they're likely a result of uh, an early developmental process, whereas some of the progressive features are clearly um, part of a, an ongoing disease process. One important aspect, and this is something that um, all of the families in the study have contributed to, is for us to understand what symptoms really matter. Um, so in this study here, we, t we leveraged um, a health-related quality of life questionnaire that was developed for families uh, of, and children with cerebral palsy um, to measure health-related quality of life and to correlate that with symptoms. 
And what we learn from this is really a, a snapshot of what matters to families. So we learned that in fact the degree of mobility and the degree of spasticity correlates with health-related quality of life, whereas other things like, for example, the number of seizures did not. So this gives us a quantitative sense. It basically quantifies what families tell us. And that's important when we talk to regulatory agencies because we then have a way of communicating what is important to the, uh, the families and, 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 and the community that we serve. And that's, I think, going to be very valuable when we move forward with these therapies because we need to make the case that um, the interventions that we're proposing um, are meaningful and that the things that we are proposing to measure actually carry value to families. Okay, so I went over our first few years of work very quickly just to show you where we stand right now. Um, because of the support of, of many families who see us on a longitudinal basis, we are starting to understand how things change over time. And this is what a natural history study is. So the purpose of this really is that when we have an intervention, say we, we uh, give a treatment at the age of five, we want to see if that trajectory is changing compared to the historic controls, to what we've established through this very careful examination of, of a large cohort of families. And I'm showing here as an example, and this is uh, again a developmental outcome, uh, the so-called developmental quotients, which basically normalize uh, a child's development to the expected age-appropriate development. So if, if the number is 50, that means that the development is um, at, at the given age is about, uh, is appropriate for a child half that age. So uh, if it's 50, for example, uh, that means that the developmental status is at equivalent to six months, whereas the chronological age is 12 months. So you see that um, this is a useful marker in this condition because as age um, uh, progresses, you see that the, the quotients are, uh, are uh, decreasing and we can mathematically, if we have enough data points, predict outcomes. And that's important when we have interventional trials so that we know, is our treatment working? Again, coming back to the risk-benefit discussion that we'll have um, about these new treatments. Same is true for motor symptoms, and so this is a score that you're all very familiar with, the spastic paraplegia rating scale. And you see that, um, again, we can now, because we have a lot of data, start predicting um, the rate of change in this population. Beyond clinical tools, we're interested in developing biomarkers, and this, of course, would be tremendously helpful for um, developing therapies. So we looked at some of the markers that are being looked at for other conditions, for ALS and, and other more common neurological conditions, multiple sclerosis, for example, uh, to see if we detect any changes. So this is, again, for AP4-related hereditary spastic paraplegia. We found that levels of a protein called neurofilament light chain, which is really a structural protein of long neurons, of axons, um, is on a cohort level elevated, but very modestly. Um, this is different from other conditions um, where we've, other forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia where we find higher levels. Um, we've also looked in, in this spe specific study at markers of glia cells, so the other major type of, of cells in the brain, and here we did not detect a change. So what we, what we take from this is that this specific form of hereditary spastic paraplegia is predominantly a neuronal problem. It's not so much a problem of the white matter of the uh, glia cells in the brain. And then we can risk stratify. And this is helpful for us because it helps us counsel families. So here, it's a very complicated slide, but essentially the message here is, if we see a child with AP4-related hereditary spastic paraplegia, and any of the three uh, features of generalized onset seizures, a history of status epilepticus, or uh, the um, uh, inability to walk are present, we know that the levels are higher. And, and sort of we're starting to classify based on risk, not just clinically, but also uh, molecular markers. Okay, so this was a snapshot of what we're beginning to do for one form of hereditary spastic paraplegia, but of course we want to take this to the next stage. And this is where the discussion started about a year ago at this meeting about creating a spastic paraplegia centers of excellence uh, research network uh, that would coordinate um, research on both HSP and PLS and really take it to the next level. 
So I'll, I'll share a few uh, things that we're proposing to do uh, with the support of the Aspastic Paraplegia Foundation. So the Aspastic Paraplegia um, uh, Centers of Excellence Research Network, or CERN, um, really has uh, one goal, to meet the unmet need of achieving clinical trial readiness for both HSP and PLS. We all know that national and international collaboration is essential for doing this and is essential for the rapid development of both new diagnostic tools but also therapies. So what we're proposing to do here is, is basically a US-wide network um, that uh, is carefully designed to develop vital infrastructure and to generate uh, proof of concept data um, that allows us to really uh, establish a network that can incorporate clinical trials in the future. So there are three aims. The first is to establish the CERNs, the Centers of Excellence uh, Research Network. The second is to develop a central research protocol, and this is um, also an effort to synchronize and harmonize with um, partners in Europe, for example, because similar efforts exist in countries in Europe, and we're trying to uh, be very mindful to coordinate and harmonize our efforts so that we can compare data and pool and join forces. And then lastly, um, uh, we're, we're preparing in these two initial years critical infrastructure uh, that will allow us to test key elements of this uh, consortium and to make the case uh, to funding agencies that this is, a, this is a program that is worth pursuing long term. So this is a, pr a preliminary plan, but the first proposed round is, of centers is listed here. You see that we have been trying to achieve geographic uh, uh, representation. We weren't successful in, in uh, achieving perfect geographic representation, but I think it's a start. And I think as this is building out, we're hoping that other centers will, will join. Um, so you see the uh, centers listed here. Um, you see color-coded in red centers that uh, predominantly see children with hereditary spastic paraplegia and in blue centers that will predominantly see uh, uh, patients with HSP and PLS uh, in, the adult in the adult age group. Um, we anticipate three major lines of research. Uh, the first is clinical research, so the development of a central uh, clinical research database um, using the same clinician reported outcome measures, patient reported outcome measures, assessments of quality of life, neuroimaging, and um, uh, standardized examinations, including videotaped examinations, to really get at the natural history of hereditary spastic paraplegia for as many forms as we can, and as well for PLS. For biosamples, which is the second axis, we're proposing to develop a central biobank where we all store um, a biospecimen, including blood samples, DNA samples, RNA samples, and in select cases, also other biospecimen. Uh, and then lastly, and this is what the first talk um, emphasized, we're um, proposing to build a central genomics archive, which is um, leveraging existing infrastructure at the University of Miami, where we are proposing to um, offer the latest generation of genetic testing to all undiagnosed cases, but also to mine this information uh, for additional uh, insights into the biology and to share this data uh, on, a, on, a, on a global level. So what are, what are our milestones? How do we think about sort of what we're going to do in the next two years? So aim one, establish the center. So the first goal for us will be to develop an operational plan. And we're not the first ones to think about this. So there are other consortia that have done this very successfully and will follow their lead uh, and develop an operational plan that coordinates all centers across the country. The second aim uh, will be to develop a central uh, research protocol and ethics approval. This is crucial from sort of an administrative standpoint that we do this uh, early, so this will be our first order of business. And then really um, what the first two years will um, hopefully show us is if the network is um, fully operational and can enroll a target number of 100 individuals with HSP and PLS in a shared clinical database, shared biobank, and we're proposing to use as a pilot whole genome sequencing for 15 individuals with suspected HSP and PLS. So this is basically testing the system. So we're building the system, we're testing the system. And the idea is to, from a long-term perspective, 
to use this as, as, as a first step towards sustainable funding on a national level, and, and there are obviously programs that we're uh, interesting and, and, and interested in joining, the first being housed at NCATS, um, an institute at NIH, which is the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, or RDCRN. Um, we will uh, be applying for funding uh, from this program. And there are others, including a program from the US FDA um, that is looking to support natural history studies as well. So the point here being is that we're, we're using seed funding to uh, build the infrastructure, to test the infrastructure, and then to build it out in various ways um, with you as the patient community and the SPF as a partner, uh, really to a national uh, uh, stage that will, will allow us to conduct this type of research for the years to come and to integrate interventional trials um, as we're building this infrastructure. So this is really the first step towards this goal. And uh, to summarize the key points from my talk, I hope I was able to show you that there are unique challenges, but also opportunities for creating therapies for rare diseases, including HSP and PLS. Uh, I think we're all aware that broad access to genetic testing and natural history data are key elements. And then lastly, we're hoping to um, build this collaborative research into HSP and PLS uh, for a comprehensive program for diagnostic progress and uh, clinical trial readiness and eventually novel therapeutic approaches. So with this, I'm at the end. I'm, I have to thank the many members of, of, of my team and the many families who, who support our work. And yeah, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Hang on one second. Let me bring the microphone to you, sir. So that way everybody out in the world and the internet can hear your wonderful question. How about that? There you go, see? Billions, billions and billions. Not that big a voice, not like mine. Darn it. Uh, you focus on the upper motor neuron, I see. Uh, what about the synaptic connection between the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord? Is, isn't that like uh, overactive, that synaptic connection? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think, um, as you point out, um, we focus on upper motor neuron-related uh, disorders because they lead to the most prominent symptoms, in this case, spasticity. But it's certainly true that many forms of HSP have a component of lower, more, low, lower, lower motor neuron involvement as well. So um, I think in terms of inclusion criteria for um, enrolling in a prospective natural history study, I think the, the clinical feature of progressive spasticity will be one key, key inclusion criteria, but it doesn't exclude any, uh, any lower motor neuron involvement. And uh, also, uh, what about the role of um, anxiolytics, uh, specifically Valium, which is also a, an anticonvulsant? Uh, what about those, the anxiolytic and the anticonvulsants in, in treat, treatment for this? Uh, it's a very specific question. We certainly use diazepam or Valium for a, a number of reasons, including the treatment of spasticity, muscle cramps, anxiety, seizures, as you mentioned. Um, if, you're, if you're asking, uh, are, is this going to lead to useful information that informs clinical care uh, with existing medications, for instance, or existing interventions, I think that's a possibility. It's not designed for that, but I think you're, you're highlighting a very key point, which is that we are all treating the symptoms of hereditary spastic paraplegia as best we can, as best we're taught, but there's never been a formal study that looked at available interventions like, for example, diazepam or Botox injections. There's some literature for Botox, but, um, but this is perhaps a side product of this effort, is that we can say, okay, how did, you know, um, individuals with hereditary spastic paraplegia or PLS do with XY uh, existing treatment. Okay, guys, we got, uh, we've got another question ho over here in the center of the room. And I want to remind everybody, later this afternoon, after lunch, we're going to have all of our researchers in those empty chairs up there, and we're going to do a 90-minute question and answer period. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, no, we're going to do you right now because you got my attention. So here you go. But I wanted to remind you that because I know you guys all want to take a break, don't you? Oh, yeah. Look at all those head shakings. Yeah, I know this system. All right. Here we go. We'll do another question for Dr. Fakari. Uh, um, it's a short answer, I think. In your lecture, you said some symptoms you 
it, I guess in children, you think RHSP, but there are other diseases. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just curious, what could be those other diseases? Yeah, it's a great question. So there are certain inborn errors of metabolism, um, also genetic disorders that these children are born with that can manifest predominantly with spasticity, um, but later on develop other symptoms. The reason why I'm highlighting this is more sort of for clinicians to, for us to be aware, because some of these, and I've highlighted three on the slide, have very specific treatments, and we, we don't want to miss them. Um, that, that's basically the reason. So it's a reminder for all of us, especially for those of us who work um, in, in very specialized hospitals, to think about these. Okay, we're going to do one more, and then we're going to take a break so we can get ready for the rest of our program. One more. I noticed on one of their slides, down in the corner, it says something about iron deposits. And for somebody that has a family history of having too much iron, is that something you guys would be looking at? Because I, did, I didn't know that there was a connection. Yeah, I'm happy to clarify that. So for, for the AP4-related forms of hereditary spastic paraplegia, out of the, at this point, 250 children that we've seen, about five or six had demonstrable iron deposits on brain MRI scans. We don't know about the significance of that. This could be a total bystander, um, but it's an interesting observation for two reasons. One, when radiologists look at scans and they see iron deposition, the list of conditions that can cause iron deposition is actually not very long, but HSP wouldn't be on that list. Um, that's the, sort of the diagnostic um, uh, impact of that finding. The, the second is maybe it will teach us something about the biology. Maybe there's a common uh, shared pathway with other conditions that lead to um, uh, iron deposition. Overall, I'm not quite sure if it's a common finding. And the reason why I'm not sure is that when we um, conduct MRI scans in the assessment of children who respect to have hereditary spastic paraplegia, it's usually early. It's at the age of two, three, four or five, and we rarely go back and do another MRI scan 10 years later, because there's often no reason, to, no clinical reason to do that. So that's why I'm saying I'm, I'm not 100% sure how common it is, because we don't have these MRI scans years later. Okay, everybody, you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. A shout out for Dr. Fakari, Dr. Blackstone, and Dr. Zuckner. Alrighty, guys, we're going to take a little break here before we bring up Dr. Mitsumoto. I know it's a little chilly in here. You need to get moving a little bit. It's a good time to take a potty break, and then we'll get you back in here. And then we're going to do Dr. Mitsumoto. Then we're going to do lunch. That's, there you go. We'll see you in a little bit. Hello again. Boy, a lot of good information about research that's been done to lay the foundation for research that's going to be done, hopefully finding those treatments and cures that we all need and desire. With me now is, a, is someone who's come, become a great friend over these past couple of years, Christine Hendrickson. Christine's from Florida, and uh, she got involved with the foundation a couple of years ago. And the first thing I want to do, welcome, Christine. Thank you for coming so we can talk. Thanks, Greg. The first thing I want to do, though, is ask you, what was your first experience with? How did you learn about the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation? Well, in 2018, I was first diagnosed with HSP. After 18 long years of trying to find a diagnosis, and I was quickly introduced to Norma and the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. From there, I became a state ambassador for Florida which opened up all these doors of all these local people that had HSV, like me. I thought I was by myself, but I found all these other people. Well, one of the keys I hear there is, is after dealing with the issue for 18 years and trying to find people, trying to find answers, somehow you found out about the SPF and you called, I think, the 800 number. And that's when you and Norma begin to talk about what the foundation is and what it does. And immediately, thank goodness, you got more involved. That's what we need is for more people who deal with, you know, families who deal with either of these diseases, HSP or POS, to learn about the foundation, get involved and be a part of the productive process that we hope leads to some answers. Christine, in, a, in addition to that, as you've, as you've worked in those directions, 
last year you you made a connection that turned out to be a fantastic connection for the for the conference last year and again this year we want to thank you and the uh, the medical store uh, that, that you work with i want you to share with us if you would kind of how that happened we're going to talk in a moment about all the things that we've got to uh, raffle and auction off this year but share with us that connection and how that happened in 2021 I reached out to your medical store. They're a premier online medical store, and they offer lots of equipment for people with diseases like HSP and PLS. I became a brand ambassador for them, and eventually they became a donor and sponsor to the foundation. Yeah, we got a call after Christine uh, began working with them last year. She introduced us to them, and we began working directly with, with the store and with the owner. And uh, my goodness, last year he sent 10 items, 10 items that folks who have our issues can use. Uh, everything from uh, steps into the, into the bathtub, particular types of walking canes, a couple of the uh, items I remember particularly were... Uh, uh, system that you can use to massage and your legs which I wanted to buy that one last year but I got outbid in the auction so I just then called up the medical store and bought one and they were so good to help me with that but we appreciate what they've done it creates opportunity for people who are here uh, to put a little money in and, and maybe have a raffle drawn and a couple of those nicer items we auction off because they are very valuable to our population and we want to give everybody a chance to maybe be able to buy those as opposed to doing those as a raffle so we thank you for making that connection and we certainly thank your medical store for sending that last year and then again so graciously and generously sending that again this year Christine I know another thing that you've that you're becoming well known by is your A-linker when we don't see you without seeing you in that A-linker so if you would share a little bit with our audience about the A-linker how you discovered it how well it serves your needs. In 2018, quickly after my diagnosis, I had gone on a trip and I was unable to keep up with the tour guide. And I was, I was losing hope that this disease was taking away my independence and my ability to move. So I quickly reached out to the uh, inventor of the aid linker. It's a walking bike. It allows me to stand up straight and move quickly. And I am known as the girl with the yellow bike, not, oh, what's wrong with her? So it has been exciting since then. Well, when you run into Christine here in the hallway or anywhere else, she always has a smile on her face. And uh, you can tell that A-Linker is making a difference in your ability to get around and, and in a way that's comfortable for you, and that's great. Christine, I know one other thing you've recently been involved in is, you know, our fundraising process, and particularly the 5K. Uh, Norma and I had moved a son into uh, Lakeland, Florida the weekend that you we discovered you were doing your 5K, and we really thought about trying to get up and make it over to participate in that. We weren't able to make that work, but you had a great event. If you would, share how that kind of came together and what happened that morning. Well, it all began in 2019. That was my first 5K, and um, that 5K consisted of my husband and I. Uh, since then, the event has grown. This past year, several people from Florida showed up and we all did the 5K walk, run, walk, roll together and we raised money for the foundation. Um, and I look forward to next year having more people. A couple of key points there. Uh, again, you just got involved in the foundation in the last couple of year, at, years. In the first year you did that, it was just you and your husband. Correct. But it has grown. It's a chance to do two important things. And we, we talk all the time about raising money for research, and that is our primary goal and, 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 uh, and task. But it also brings more people together to learn about the foundation to learn about HSP and PLS and how they might, with the connections they have, or uh, be able to assist us with, with events, with fundraising, and other things that make a difference for the people who have these diseases. So thank you guys for getting involved so quickly in so many different ways. 
Christine, we appreciate you guys, and as we've shared with everyone yesterday, we're heading to the Tampa area next year. I'm you very guys, excited. you guys are right there, so we're going to be calling you for advice and help. And and when we go into a community to do one of these uh, events, it's important for people in, in that community or in that region who have these diseases to be involved in helping us think about and plan and even staff and work the event when we get down to it. So we'll be looking to you guys for help and advice and and I hope all of you are right now and we don't have dates yet. We'll be getting those we hope in the next couple of weeks but we'll be asking everybody to put those dates and Tampa on your calendar for next summer. Looking forward to another great event next year. Christine, you do a lot of different things. I've tried to hit them all. Have I left anything out? I don't think so. Um, since my diagnosis, I'm, I'm a happy member of the SPF family. Um, I share the vision that one day we will diagnose and treat and really cure everyone with HSP and PLS. This foundation has given me hope. Hope is important and we all need to share in these experiences and there are tough days no doubt about it but sometimes on those tough days what makes a difference is being able to call or email or share with someone else who has a similar life and similar challenges and one of the things that happens big at this conference every year is we get to meet new people and we get to see old friends and this foundation hopefully grows in its service and experience with other people all across not only this country but across the world through through zoom and through opportunities that we have now that we did not have so many years ago christine thank you for your time thank you for your work with the foundation and we look forward to tampa next year and uh, seeing this thing grow even more Excellent. thank you so much folks again we got a lot going on the rest of the day we're taking a little bit of a break here give uh, everyone a break for a moment so you guys at home maybe take a break get a little something to eat or snack on and maybe a restroom break we'll be back uh, in just a few minutes and we look forward to the rest of the day and until lunch tomorrow so you guys hang with us we'll see you in just a little while
Okay, everybody. Um, welcome back as we get a little settled in here. I'm glad you enjoyed that break outside and got to move around and get a little warmth and um, all is good. I got a couple things I wanted to tell you about. One, one thing I wanted to tell you about, do you see all the, you know, the books that you guys got in your welcome bags and stuff? Okay, remember those? You're gonna meet the author later today, okay? I want to remind you to make sure you go on Amazon and give that a review, okay? I'd like to kind of move that book up. You know, this is really specific to, to our community. And more reviews you get, the more the book rises. And you guys know the system. You know how to, you guys all go online and know how to click those buttons and stuff. So please do that for us. We also want to remind everybody and to thank our sponsors, okay? Our sponsors that have helped us put this uh, uh, annual conference together. And especially, we want to give a, a little shout out to uh, Chris Brocchini. Uh, she has been a, a wonderful sponsor of the foundation for many, many, many years. Uh, she's a little under the weather and can't really be with us today, okay? Uh, but we're, um, we're thinking about her and, and wishing her well and uh, looking forward to seeing her. Oh, she is here. Oh, my God. See, man, I see I'm working with three-day-old notes, okay? So sorry about that. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Chris Brocchini. We will edit that all out in post-production as if I was never here, so... It's a good thing, so <laughs> this is, uh, okay, um, I, we're moving on right now. Coming up next is Dr. Mitsumoto, and he's gonna be talking about his PLS studies. Come on up. This is your clicker, green goes forward, red goes back if you have to, and your monitor is right in front okay. of you. Very okay, good. Okay, okay can, can you see that? There you go, you go. can you see that through there? A little bit of movie. Yeah, we here. can shift off to the side. There we go. I'm short. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, no, you're perfect. Okay. Can you okay. hear? Can, can you hear me? Very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I really enjoyed this morning's uh, talk and presentation. Things are moving very, very rapidly forward. Um, it's very exciting. So I'm going to switch gears. We are talking about the PLS Natural History Studies. I really appreciate the support from all of you, um, uh, <clears throat> SPF fund support. So I'm going to talk myself and also I uh, included Grace, who is a research coordinator. So today I'm going to talk about the briefly repetition from last year talk about the PLS and uh, um, what we made in terms of progress in PLS in past few years and also natural history studies update of uh, research now and also we are facing difficult issues of this natural history studies and the potential future plans. So what do we know about the PLS? PLS is a rare, actually the rarest form of motor neuron disease. We estimate probably 75 to 125 new patients in the United States because when we see 100 ALS patients, we turns out to be we see probably one or two uh, PLS patients. So PLS is so rare. Of course, ALS is said to be a rare disease. We estimate maybe we have 2,000 cases in a year for PLS, but I don't know. Maybe a little bit overestimated. We don't know. We don't know cause and pathogenesis. Nosology, that means disease classification, completely unsettled, unknown. Natural history is a limited knowledge for long-term prognosis and outcome because patient lives long time, lost to follow-up, we don't know how they do in the future. Clinical features are variable, and the most description published in the literature is a clinical. And the diagnosis is still uncertain, particularly in the early stages. And uh, we have assessment, upper motor neuron scale, and now we have a PLS FRS. And we are going to talk about a little bit later, yet to be tested in the real world. So, so um, neuroimaging is the most advanced. We have a lot of change described um, neuro MRI and PET scan, etc. 
Neurophysiology is a very important tool to make a diagnosis, and the biomarker is still iffy, if anything available, I'm going to talk about later. And genetics is just the beginning, and the clinical trials never done before. As you know, clinical trials in ARDS has been going very, very active past 20, 30 years, particularly past 10 years. We have now new, new medication for ARDS. PLS is never included in ARDS clinical trials. So, so current perspective is that PLS has been very rare, puzzling, and obscured the disease. PLS is considered as an extreme end of ex ARDS spectrum. And um, I'm going to show you some slides showing why that is the case. We concluded, conducted a pr prospective five multi center study several years ago, again supported by um, SPF and NIH, which resulted in newer studies. PLS-FRS is um, developed, and probably some of you know ALS-FRS is a standard most commonly widely used uh, scale for ALS. But ALS is too insensitive, so we developed PLS-FRS. Natural history studies and future clinical trials, we can use those studies. And the International PLS Conference was held 2019, a few years ago, and then outcome came out of this uh, conference. So this is a uh, diagram, and PLS is a pure upper motor neuron disease. Upper motor neurons reside in the brain, as you can see, and you can, if you look at um, motor cortex in the central area, both sides of the brain like this, is thinned and um, atrophied, shrinkage. So motor neuron from upper motor neuron gives tract to lower motor neurons through brainstem to spinal cord. If you cut the spinal cord, you can see cross section of the spinal cord on the left side. There's a thinning of both lateral, I mean side of the spinal cord, which is a tract that runs from upper motor neuron to lower motor neuron. Lower motor neuron reside in spinal cord at each level, cervical, legs, and those motor neurons are not affected in PLS. If lower motor neurons are affected, which turns out to be ALS. So any neurodegenerative disease overlapping, for example, sporadic ALS, familiar ALS, some, some overlapping, PLS is probably overlapping with those other neurodegenerative diseases, even Parkinson's disease. HSP is overlapping all those PLS and other neurodegenerative disease. Nothing pure, so therefore difficult to deal with in certain situation. So, so we heard uh, Dr. Blackstein, Blackstone talking about the distinction between PLS and ALS. So this is my slide, and maybe experts tell me this is wrong, but generally speaking, uh, clinical signs, upper motor neuron syndrome. Syndrome PLS affects not only legs but arms and even swallowing speech. HSP only only affect uh, legs predominantly at least. And pathology is upper motor neurons both sides, but probably axonal transport and so long tract, long nerve fibers are affected from brain to spinal cord. And maybe even sensory tracts are affected. Inheritance, PLS, mostly sporadic, but again, uh, based on today's talk, it could be something very unusual, genetic disease, we have no idea, we don't know. But HSP is predominantly also more dominant, also more recessive, even sometimes sporadic, we don't know. Disease course, both diseases move slowly, slowly over time. Treatment, essentially, we have a symptomatic and supportive care, same way HSP. So, so um, <clears throat> in the past several years, we made a lot of progress in PLS. For example, we published a paper in terms of a phenotypic and a molecular analysis of uh, PLS based on 50 cases of uh, PLS. Um, that was several years ago, uh, supported by uh, HS, uh, SPF and also NIH. 
And also, as I told you, uh, LSFRS, which is the most widely used scale for ALS, is too insensitive if you use in PLS progression. So we developed, we devised from ALS, LSFRS, added a few intermediate points, and uh, um, total scale for ALS is 48, but PLS FRS scale is 68, so we changed increased sensitivities. And, uh, and also, this study showed clearly changes is recognizable, statistically significant, in six months in PLS patient. This was published in Muscle Nerve, and uh, we also had the international uh, PLS conference. We gathered the University of Pennsylvania, and 75 people gathered from all over the um, world, including, of course, United States, Canada, and uh, some of you you can recognize here. And so, so that was a conference and supported by multiple uh, funding agencies, including NIH and, and of course, um, uh, SPF and so forth. So, so out of this conference, we published a supplement going over uh, clinical spectrum, neurophysiology, neuroimaging, and genetics, and um, neuropathology, neurobiology, and the clinical um, management, and uh, um, all those issues of uh, supplement published, and you can get uh, free access uh, through uh, PubMed. Out of this conference, we made the diagnostic criteria and the volunteers uh, published, particularly Martin Turner, and develop, developed uh, agreeable diagnostic criteria, consensus diagnostic criteria published uh, a few years ago. So current status of PLS. Now PLS has been rare, enigmatic, neglected motor neuron disease, not anymore actually. And we, we made a lot of progress and international investigators, disease organizers have recently started paying serious attention to PLS. Funding, research um, opportunities, and so forth, not just um, HS, I mean, uh, SPF, but also LS Association, M MDA, uh, NMD uh, Association UK, and other organizations paying attention. So, 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 um, <clears throat> the first disease modifying clinical trial in PLS is no, long, no longer unrealistic and far fetched. And in fact, it might be available. We need to think about it. So why do we need PLS natural history studies? We heard this morning pediatric HSP uh, natural history studies uh, based on um, Center of Excellence of Research Network. And we, we have really natural history is not a sexy subject, but without natural history, we cannot go next step. Extremely important. So, so it is actually prerequisite for designing future clinical trials. We need to determine the best outcome and also best measures for PLS clinical trials. We should be able to validate um, the reliable new diagnostic criteria. We have now criteria consensusly made, but is it valid or not? We have to test. Also, we needed to develop biomarkers for the future studies. And improve understanding PLS is another crucial uh, uh, purpose. So this PLS natural history studies again funded multiple agencies, SPF, ALS Association, and Mitsubishi Tanabe uh, Pharmaceuticals, MDA, and also um, Mr. David Marin and family funded uh, this study as well. So the happy face is the center uh, United States and Canada, about the 30 sites, and uh, structured at the Columbia University's uh, coordinating centers. We organized uh, by, by uh, steering committees, and we have uh, Neurobank, Data Bank, and, and bio repository funding, 
I mean, agencies. So 30 centers organized under uh, Columbia universities and collecting data, and uh, we analyze eventually upon when uh, data is available. So I'm going to talk briefly about uh, inclusion criteria. This has to be uh, older than 25 because this, we are not dealing with the pediatric patient population. And the diagnosis based on new diagnostic criteria, but expanding more than new diagnostic criteria, I will tell you shortly. And the symptom onset was no more than 15 years. And after 15 years, we don't know how disease behaves, maybe, maybe too burnout, too slow, we don't know. So at least we have selected less than 15 years. And ability to independently walk with or without equipment. You can use any walk on and so forth, but should be able to walk because walking is one of the uh, um, outcome measures. In case where the molecular testing was done, make sure they do not have H. SP or HP related mutation because we're dealing with purely possibly for PLS. So expected to have at least some bulbar symptom. Bulbar symptom means speech and swallowing. So those who have some symptoms it is important. But if they don't have those symptoms, still we can include um, provided the molecular testing is negative. The reason is previous report and said to be HS, no, PLS, and it turns out to be those PLS turns out to be HSP. So we still do not know fully what's the relationship between PLS and HSP, but in this kind of research, we try to clearly uh, separate between these conditions. So, so um, uh, upper motor neuron symptoms are critical, not just the legs, but also arms, and the bulbar, bulbar means a jaw and the swallowing and speech area. And the brain MRI uh, uh, has to, or cervical spinal cord has to be normal, except for some changes uh, known for PLS, and, and no active major neurological disease, and no major uh, medical, unstable medical disease and has to reside a commutable distance. Certainly we don't want to give um, labor, labor uh, to commute several hours drive is not the practical. So, so, so um, no history of ALS and PLS in the family. And so, so um, uh, if disease duration less than four years, we need to have recent EMGs and those more than uh, Definite PLS cases should have at least one EMG after diagnosis made with the EMGs. So EMG, we're going to check the result and confirm, uh, uh, look at the EMG changes which should be essentially normal and certainly not participating in any other clinical trials. So exclusion criteria is, is those who cannot be informed of the concept, cannot enroll, be in, enrolled. Upper motor neuron symptom signs only in legs is not um, probably PLS. Now, willing or unable to visit the study site is again not uh, uh, included. And uh, anyone who has a cognitive impairment cannot be included. And those, those um, uh, some issues, uh, exclusion, such as clinical trial participation, so forth. We decided to have 50 early cases. PLS diagnostic criteria, probable PLS is after two years, two years after the symptom onset. So the problem is what happened, what are they from symptom onset to two, two years? And so it's a completely limbo. We don't know what they are. But in this study, we included the early case after symptom onset before four years. The reason is we believe, strongly believe, early treatment for any neurological, neurodegenerative disease is better than later treatment if treatment is available. And uh, um, already we heard about the spinal muscular atrophy in pediatric, and new treatment made dramatic, almost just unbelievable change, improvement in, in the case when 
treatment started earlier. It is so clearly shown. And I think we have data that ALS as well, when we start the treatment earlier, better result. So I believe any treatment should be started earlier. Therefore, we decided to get early case, less than um, even 24 months, up to uh, four months. And then another 50 cases, so-called definite um, PLS, means four years, but less than 15 years after symptom onset. These are uh, uh, tables showing what we do. For example, zero baseline, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, uh, 24 months, and uh, three to three months and nine months are just a telephone visit, and zero, six, 12 months uh, in-person visit to the, to the centers. Uh, we check um, uh, pen upper motor neuron scale, and also um, timed up and go, tug test we called, patient sit, and then with the time stand up, walk three meter, and then turn around, come on back to chair, sit down, stop. So that, how long does it take? We call the tug test, walking. And then we do, of course, blood testing, and the EMGs will be done at one near point. So this clinical trial is heavily based on um, coordinators reach out to the patient. We do even cognitive testing by telephone. We already shown cognitive testing is valid even if you use telephone. And PLSFRS can be done telephone. OUSAC Q is ALS uh, quality, quality scales of uh, studies. NeuroQOL with detailed neuro, neurological function. We review medication and uh, durable medical equipment use. And the ROSE test we included, uh, developed by uh, <clears throat> um, Atlanta, and Ra R Roche built overall ALS disease scale, disability scale, excuse me. And Bulba Pataka means uh, how fast you can repeat the words, Pataka, Pataka, Pataka. That kind of re repetition is difficult when you have upper motor neuron signs. And also finger tapping and foot tapping is again slow down when you have, a, you, you have a upper motor neuron dysfunction. Those are done by uh, the uh, um, coordinators uh, from um, Columbia University. We have uh, important committees, and steering committees steer the studies and solve any issues and the problems and approved data, biosamples, sharing, interpret the result and guidelines, um, and uh, several key persons and patient um, um, and scientific advisor are also in the steering committee. We have another EMG committee, diagnosis, diagnosis validation committee, and publication committee I'm going to show you briefly. EMG committee is busy because particularly chair, uh, Eric Sorensen and Dara Heitzman review all EMG, whether we can enroll or not. And when we get um, both two people agrees, Eric and Dara agrees, we are allowed to enroll the patient. That means no lower motor neuron uh, impairment based on EMG. EMG is such a sensitive test to de detect lower motor neuron dysfunction. So after one year, we repeat EMG. Everyone gets same muscle checked, no nerve conduction studies. So that will be very, very important uh, studies never done before and how disease progress uh, in terms of uh, EMG uh, examination. Also uh, decide which muscle tested at e e one year, and, and full interpretation will be done by EMG committee. So the other one is diagnosis validation. We have now, I told you, PLS diagnostic criteria is already published. We use the, those criteria to make diagnosis, enroll the patient, but how good, how valid those published criteria one year later, including EMG studies. So two of um, uh, committee members looked at 
data enrollment at one year point. If agreed, fine. If disagreement, a third person recruited to interpret. So those uh, in, those data will be go to biostatistician Dr. Chen and analyze how valid, how poor in terms of new diagnostic criteria. So that's what another uh, information we can get. So publication committee is uh, uh, important to to pub to solicit any new papers. We know what we are going to publish, and also. Um, uh, they looked at all draft and approved publication, and sometimes order of uh, publication, order of authors sometimes contentious. Therefore, they decide who is get the publication uh, order and so forth. And uh, so, so that how we present the uh, papers to which uh, <clears throat> organization, which meeting, and so forth, publication committee will decide. So data management is done by Neurobank. Neurobank is based on Mass General. Today we heard a lot about Mass General, and but um, Alex Sherman is organizing this uh, data management, and he's most kindly offered free service. It's just uh, um, heard of, but he, he knows of this study is important, rare disease, so they are offered to, to analyze, I mean, not analyze, collect all data uh, with uh, biobank, neurobank, excuse me. And the biostatistical analysis will be done by Dr. Ken Chung at Columbia University um, Biostatistical Department. And uh, biostatistical analysis, we are going to look at each outcomes, how their sensitivity changes, and uh, um, uh, we look at all three visit, in total of six visit um, to analyze the data point, and so, so we get um, which outcome is best. For example, primary outcome is PLSFRS, which is good enough to use primary or primary end point for clinical trials or something else. So, so and kind of data, and also if we use those primary end point, how many patients do we need to clinical trials? Those data will be provided by biostatistician, the biostatistician excuse me. So, so um, we communicate uh, frequently email uh, between each centers, and, and also we have monthly conference call noon at uh, first Monday of noon, we talk and they uh, update the uh, uh, status of recruitment and any issues and so forth. And also, otherwise, we communicate frequently with email. So, so um, investigational research also we planned within PLS natural history studies. For example, of course, we establish natural history itself. And also, um, diagnostic criteria will be uh, um, finalized, validated, and EMG changes. We do DNA molecular changes, and uh, also oxidative stress in urine will measure, and also novel biomarkers, lipidomics. I'm going to shortly discuss with this lipidomic changes, and we have biorepository for future studies. So, so, so DNA analysis will be done by Dr. Matt Holmes, and sometimes other disease contaminated in clinically PLS, such as C9 and Parkinson's disease, and some HSP uh, genes uh, uh, mixed up in PLS. Therefore, we are going to check. Eventually, um, we are going to the genome sequence. So, so we are going to um, very soon those DNA analysis and also lipidomics. Lipidomics means in the blood, we have at least 230 species of different lipids. And when you do very fine uh, analysis, we can get all those lipid uh, component. And uh, we did those studies based on ALS Cosmos studies, PLS Cosmos studies, and we used machine learning, means AI, and Dr. XJ Lee uh, used those specimen from previous PS studies and found a very interesting result. Monoacylglycerol is uh, clearly elevated in PLS compared to uh, ALS, and uh, also um, compared to controls. 
So that means something going on different between ALS and PLS. <clears throat> and we know this monoacyl glycerol is something to do with neuroinflammation. So maybe this is a result of a neuroinflammation rather than cause of neuroinflammation. But again, we have to find out what's underlying ch changes. Again, we have specimens saved. We can do those uh, lipidomic analysis once again after these studies. So, so this is the kind of introduction of what we do, natural history studies, but I have to tell you an update. So we started the 2021, two years ago, and the first year we had only per month 1.58 um, uh, enrollment. And we st struggled to get the subcontract, um, IRB uh, uh, approval, etc. And finally, we got all 30 centers approved. And uh, second year is we had three patients per month. So that's much improvement, not quite double, but almost doubled. And we have now a total of 56 patients, early 24, definite 32. So early is a slightly lower than uh, uh, definite PLS case. And one year completion is 14. One year completion is so critically important because we have to see how disease progresses in one year. So, so only 14, but by certainly by the next summer we have 56 and we will have more uh, enrollment. We have 24 months, but no patient went to 24 months yet. So these are study site. Um, now the 29 centers, uh, McGill could not uh, enroll patients, so they withdraw. And so, so we have um, 29 centers throughout the United States, Canada. I'm not going into all each centers, but um, major uh, known uh, institutions are part of uh, these studies uh, for, for PLS. Maximum cases only four, some centers still zero, and for example, Colombia is still only three, but we have a couple of patients lined up, so, so slowly moving, uh, but again, uh, we have many good reasons why enrollment is so slow. At the same time, we published a paper and, uh, uh, in ALS Journal. Uh, uh, the title of the paper is Primary Lateral Sclerosis, Sclerosis Natural History Study, uh, Planning, Designing, and Early Enrollment. We described how difficult to uh, enroll this kind of a case because of many reasons we described. So, so, so when we uh, finished natural history studies, this is probably the first and largest natural multicenter studies for, for uh, PLS study, and a large collaborative studies funded by multiple funding agencies, which is again unusual. We get all uh, money available from any other sites, and again, I'm totally grateful to SPF and the effective use of a small smartphone to obtain outcome data is uh, new for this study, so at least we don't have to uh, additional burden to the patient to coming to the centers. And PLS natural history will be succeeding appropriate clinical trials in the future. That's what we, we hope. And, and we have novel uh, research data for underlying understanding of disease mechanism, uh, new biomarkers for PLS, and validating current PLS diagnosis criteria. So many data is coming out of this natural history studies. So, so, so. Uh, problem and difficulties and potential solution I'd like to go over. PLS is simply so rare, that's very true. We, we expected to enroll more patients, but uh, um, um, we send, we asked uh, SPF, uh, Frank did all uh, blasting to uh, so, uh, other members and also uh, uh, na national ALS uh, uh, database um, blasted the in information. We get more patient, but again, uh, I have to say, indeed, PLS is a rare disease. We continue to publicize uh, study more 
to get more patients interested in. We spoke several people who were interested in, we really appreciate it, uh, get to me and uh, to make themselves available for new participation. Oh, really, thank you so much. And the outside studies posing administrative nightmare, and certainly very small number of patients each site, but many many centers for for administration, grant officers, so forth. Says they certainly don't like this kind of things. We can use central uh, IRB central funding sub agreement. It also they cost a lot of money. So the, this is a shoestring budget running these studies there for. We don't have any freedom to pay those monies. We initially used EMG criteria very hard to make sure there is no lower motor neuron disease. That made it more difficult, therefore is eased up and a little bit more uh, patient, some patient can be enrolled, we, we changed. But again, I have to tell you, COVID-19 came with this study's enrollment and hit hard to, to uh, this study because the patient doesn't want to come or doesn't want to be enrolled of this um, epidemics, therefore significantly slow down disease process. Now, uh, and now we have COVID is nearly gone, so hopefully we can do better. So, so, so again, uh, PLS is a part of ALS, mostly ALS center. So, so ALS clinical trials very active. So many clinical trials going on ALS, but the PLS is a small number and slowly moving. Therefore, often the same resources we compete against ALS clinical trials. So that may made it a little bit more difficult. And uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Marin donated some funds to um, encourage the centers to more enroll patients, but some centers cannot get any kind of reward because they're against those institutional policy. Therefore, if it's not everyone the same way, we cannot use. Therefore, we decided to use some adjustment at the end of uh, enrollment. Mm -hmm. And also, um, budget allocated for patient studies still largely preserved because we did not enroll patient we planned. Uh, yet, um, coordinator studies keep going and exhausted quickly, and we need some uh, budget um, uh, arrangement and and kindly uh, SPF understood and gave some additional fund to support a half time of coordinator for next two years. So, so that means we can keep going from January of this year to next two years. So, so we intend to add new uh, site. For example, Seattle. We're going to uh, add, uh, going to to uh, paperwork and so forth. We, if we continue enrollment, the current uh, pace, it would take. We don't know how long. Maybe 12, maybe 18 months to complete enrollment. When we finish enrollment, that means still additional 12 months required to complete the study because 12 months follow-up is critical to get natural history studies, and if not the 24 months. So uh, it may be more logical to stop enrollment at some point and analyze uh, available uh, result for the next clinical trials. So, 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 um, if we enroll, let's say, two thirds of patient, we may have reasonably good data for analysis, for example, selection of the best outcome and how many patients we need to next clinical trials. We set 50, 50, 100 patients, but that's kind of a convenient number for us, not necessarily for biostatistical analysis. So, so maybe smaller number might be good enough to provide uh, and uh, um, uh, so, so that's what we hope. Um, are there any potential drugs to be tested for PLS? In fact, we know two new medications approved, one oral radicava last summer, one year ago, and another medication, Relivio, were approved in November. Those are for PLS. It cost about uh, more than more than $150,000 when you pay from your pocket. 
So certainly, you cannot ask to take medication if it's not working. We don't know the working for PLS. That has to be tested. So, so if anything beneficial for PLS, medication needs to be approved by FDA as additional uh, indication. So that can be uh, tested. Also, uh, Dr. Ovdinja is testing a new medication for upper motor neuron that might be available next few years for, for clinical testing. So clearly, the medication is available for, for testing PLS. So, so um, <clears throat> current study is enough for next clinical trial consortium. Well, I have to admit, the enrollment is much slower than we anticipated. We told you many reasons, PLS is rare, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe that is excuse. So yet, we have to just working with the United States, Canada may not, may not be good enough. We have to work to, to Europe. And uh, I, I know we have colleagues, we have an uh, international conference, and we can communicate. So maybe we need to work internationally rather than just the United States, Canada, so increase, expand available patient population for clinical trials. So we need to add the international consortium, just I told you, and realistically, we may need to move on from this uh, difficult natural history study to next to practical, potentially more productive phase. That's what I think we need to move. Definitely, we would like to study, I mean, analyze next summer. If it's good enough, we, we move on. And I'm exploring, is it possible to, to meet our international team? Uh, this uh, uh, December, we have MND Symposium every uh, December, so we can meet and present what we're doing, just like this talk, and stimulate their interest, raise their interest, and work with us for next clinical trials. Meantime, we have to work um, diligently with potential drug companies and so forth. That's what we hope uh, we, we can accomplish next, um, next few months. So, we appreciate your support and uh, uh, your interest as well. Um, if any question, I'm happy to answer a uh, question you may have. Okay, I knew there'd be one from this side in the front row. Here we go, our first PLS question. Here we go. If you're getting Botox, can you still have the EMG? My neurologist told me that it'll show denervation if you're getting Botox injections. Right, <clears throat> right. It all depends how long and... Uh, not all muscles are injected Botox. Right. So Botox, a ma majority of muscles, are more major muscle right. to cause of spasticities. So, so in that case, we know Botox done when, how long before the EMG test, and if we can avoid, avoid a certain muscles to check. So still can be done, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, another question, here we go, same place. Specifically for supplements, ALS versus PLS, um, my wife takes B6, vitamin B6, COQ10, and beta-carotene. And folic acid. Can that's, you comment on those? That's, you're asking, is there any problem or not? Certainly, by all means, you can take those medications. I don't get any issues. So, 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 do you feel like it's beneficial for PLS? Officially, I mean, you're asking whether they work for PLS or not. Yes. We don't know. There is no evidence. We tends to based on evidence based. If there is no evidence, that means the publication formally B6 works for PLS or ALS. We cannot say vitamin B6 works for this disease. Certainly, if there is no side effect, if you think it works, it's a hint of some benefit, and antioxidant, the vitamins, and uh, those medications, by all means, you can take. We don't know whether it works or not, but at least they're probably not toxic to the body. Another question over here? Yes. Thank you, doctor. Um, just my experience on the EMG, 
uh, I didn't pay anything for that. It was covered by my insurance. So oh. I just wanted to clarify that. That may not be true for everyone, but... Um, oh, well, well, this is a tricky and a difficult question. And we don't have any unlimited resources. So, so the first EMGs, whether you had EMG less than 12 months in other cases, we ask them to ask insurance to pay. The reason is we are still making a diagnosis. We are not doing research. So as long as we are dealing with making a diagnosis, part of medical care, so we can ask insurance. So, so, but some doctors actually in a group said, that's not fair. Why don't you pay? But well, if you wish, we would like to pay everything, but now it's impossible. EMG is a very expensive test. Therefore, um, if that's not that's major issues, what can you do? I really appreciate you doing EMG by paying by yourself. So, so, so. No, and I just want to clarify: mine was covered. I didn't pay, and I'm not I see. suggesting the study pay, but I I was fortunate right. my insurance covered. Um, what are the bio or potential biomarkers you you reference in your slide? Right. So so short answer is we don't know. We we have none. But um, for example, separating from ALS, maybe lipidomic analysis we just I showed you by Dr. XJ Lee, maybe new biomarkers. And we studied oxidative stress uh, biomarker urinary. And uh, it showed clear difference. But again, I'm not sure we can use as biomarkers. It's uncertain. Neurofilament. I heard this morning, neurofilament is, uh, we have no data yet. But neurofilament may be increased. It's, uh, a plasma or a serum neurofilament levels. Um, that can be used as a neurofilament, but neurofilament is not the specific. The one of uh, people against the idea of using neurofilament is uh, neurofilament is non-specific. Yes, non-specific because elevated in ALS, neurodegenerative disease, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, all those diseases, neurofilament elevated, not specific. However, if you have Disease constellation, certain upper motor neuron signs and the clear neurological findings suggesting upper motor neuron. If we do neurofilament ele measurement, if neurofilament elevated, that neurofilament elevation becoming very specific in my mind. So it can be used, but again, that's not a specific. So, so still, this is a new territory. We have a plasma. Um, reserve, I mean, um, in biobank. So if anything new thing is coming out, we have to measure, we have to deal with. So biobank is a crucial uh, for future uh, uh, biomarkers development. Great. Um, we have another question up here in the front. Uh, thank you for this, such the great um, talk today. Um, I'm happy to say I'm one of the 56 patients in your clinical trial, so I want to thank you. I also want to publicly thank the uh, SPF Foundation for funding that particular study. This is kind of a two-part question. Um, the first part is um, I love that you're working with uh, maybe some international people, a consortium to uh, expand the number of PLS patients. Once you get everyone completed, you get data, can you talk a little bit about what the next steps would be? How would you go to take that information and possibly get that into uh, a clinical trial for an actual product? Well, <clears throat> I have some idea, but uh, if you leave my idea on the, this room, uh, I can share. I, I would like to. I'd like to get um, international communities for PLS. We had at least 75 people came last meeting, so so we can tap. I can tell you 
all those European countries, Japan, Australia, and they have very large good centers. I know they are interested in, so we can show those data uh, this uh, winter showing what we do without any uh, data itself. But the next summer we will get the data, and then as long as the data is available, what I would like to uh, do, wait another few years to start clinical trials, we should move to the next phase because already we have 50 or 50, 60 patients in the studies, they can be candidate for clinical trials rather than waiting in hiatus the next few years, developing new clinical trials. So, 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 so what I would like to do, if possible, maybe impos impossible, but so-called platform clinical trials, which use for ALS in, again, starting with Mass General, and the platform design is placebo, drug A, drug B. So, so randomized, it could be, could be one of those. It could be placebo, it could be drug A, drug B. Drug A can be approved medications such as Radicava, drug B, um, drug B could be uh, Relivrio and randomized. So, 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 so you can use in one clinical trials, you can test two different medications. It is very difficult because drug companies are very competitive. They are, they are totally against others. And so, so, um, so I don't know any drug company people here. But anyway, um, so, so uh, they try to save their territory, their product. So working with others is difficult. So, so, but we have to work with them or this kind of rare, difficult disease, so we can simultaneously check uh, two medications at the same time against the placebo, not the checking which is better versus, I mean, um, Radicava versus Redivirio, which is better. That's not the purpose, just the checking against the placebo. So if two medications hopefully turns out to be beneficial, and I'm sure our benefit might be very slow. We are not talking about um, big effect. We are dealing with a small effect. But I think it's all this kind of disease start from a very small benefit in the future for larger benefits. So we have to start somewhere, somewhere, at some point. That's my thinking, but again, that's or possible or not, but I, I think it's a, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to try. I'm getting a good age and uh, I'm worried about whether I can do it or not, but Biden can do, run the world <laughs> as age 80. I'm now 79, so I can do this, this little project by myself. So that's what I think. I love it, um, thank you. And then my second part, uh, first of all, you've got two uh, tables here, PLS patients, so I think by the time we leave, that number of 56 will be going up as we reach out to more people to help your enrollment. Um, you mentioned the other products, um, Radicava and Revlio being developed. I know NeuroOn, I think, has a uh, FDA advisory panel at the end of the year um, to review their compound, and even though that's an ALS, I wanted to know, um, do you think, and this would just strictly be your opinion, I'm not holding you to this, would there be any potential uh, off-label use for those patients in ALS? And in the spirit of full disclosure, I do work in industry. I just happen to be a patient that has PLS. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your comment. Do we have another, I thought I saw another hand over here. We'll get to you and then we'll go to the back of the room. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm actually from the UK. Um, I'm sorry, my voice is going so, <laughs> sound a bit croaky. Um, I am under the care of Professor Halden at Neurogenetics University College, London. Um, I have a clinical diagnosis of HSP, um, no, no gene identified. Um, over the past year or so, I've started getting um, issues with my arms and swallowing. I did mention this to my clinicians, and they were quite dismissive. I, sa I said, you know, could 
possibly be PLS. No, no. Um, I don't quite know how to, you know, go forwards with this because obviously I would like it ruled out um, or ruled in, dependent. Um, I have brisk reflexes in my arms now and my jaw. Um, so I just wonder how I could ask them to maybe take it a little bit more seriously and maybe just look for signs of PLS. I don't know if they're particularly interested. That's It's frustrating. I understand. I'm not sure I can answer. Obviously, you have to ask your doctor, but you had a molecular testing done? Sorry? Molecular testing, genetic test done? Yeah, um, I was part of the 100,000 genome project. Ah, okay. Um, I don't know if they just asked for a basic panel. Right, I see. So the problem, problem with this kind of disease is, uh, you know, nosology. Nosology means classification of disease. That's the study. Is a clear cut. Here, PLS, here, HSP, this, 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 so clear cut. But mm -hmm. in the real world we are dealing with, nothing, no case is pure. Yeah. Always some um, touch of uh, PLS, touch of HSP, touch of maybe Parkinson's disease, touch of ataxia. If you examine those, those things are overlapping. And also, our examination, neurological examination, muscle strength, stopping, sensory examination, ataxia, and so forth, are such a crude, I must say, crude test. And personally, just examine based on experience and how fast, how slow, how quickly, and all changes, the morning and evening also changes. We are dealing with variabilities. So, so, so I don't think really we, I understand your concern, but, but um, uh, I think as I think you have to ask your doctor, of course, but, uh, but mm -hmm. this is not pure itself. So, so, so we are dealing with difficult, but again, I would say just to take it easy rather than uh, concern. I understand the concern, but okay. again, Thank just, you. just to take it easy, I would say. Thank you. Doctor, we got time for one more, and I have a question in the back. We're going to get this one, and then we got to move on. Okay. <laughs> uh, whose hand? Am I going to that hand? We're going to this one. Oh, I like you better. <laughs> Hi. Um, as far as the clinical study, why is it only 15 years back that you had diagnosed 15? or, you know, sooner years instead of 15. You know, what about the person for 20 years they got diagnosed? What about them? They can't be in the study? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't get the question quite well. For, um, the, for the study, yes. you're saying that <clears throat> they had to be diagnosed 15 years or, you oh, know, right. <clears throat> to present. What about, what about the people that were diagnosed 18 years ago? Right, okay, I got your uh, point. Okay, you ask, I think we case by case. We, we don't cut 15 years. Okay. For example, 15 <clears throat> and a half or 16 years, we wouldn't say no. Okay. So all depends. We case by case. We approve um, study exceptions. So, so someone comes... Uh, uh, 20 years or 25 years from oh. the beginning, well, a little difficult, but, uh, but very close to 15 years we include, and uh, that's what we do. So, so, so not this, we are not cut on okay. clear Good. definitions. Good. Thank you. And excuse me, what medications now would you consider or, or uh, uh, propose for a symptomatic treatment of uh, PLS besides baclofen? Well, um, many medications ha have been tried. One of the difficulties 
to deal with the spasticity, stiffness of the muscles. And the baclofen, tizanidin, the most common medication sometimes people use, uh, other uh, anti-compulsant, mild. Um, so so those, those medications tried, but again, the benefit is question, we're not sure. So mainstream is baclofen, tizanidin, sometimes um, uh, uh, low, dose, low dose of uh, benzodiazepine and might be helpful. And uh, so, so, so those, those, those are medication mainstream. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Mitsumoto. We're gonna okay. get you off that stage right now, reminding everybody. Thank you very much. What a wonderful presentation. Remember, later today, you'll get to ask questions again. Okay, we're gonna have a big 90 minute long session to be able to do that with a bunch of the doctors. And so, I want you to hang loose for just a second. We've got a couple little things we wanna tell you about, and then we're gonna break for lunch. didn't squeak. Hey, one of the things I wanted to uh, let you guys know is that uh, it's being brought to me a little bit faster. Would be helpful. Not running? No, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Kira Prisbilski. She's been running sound and working all of our graphics in the back. Give her a big hand. Uh, she's, a, she's a great asset to the foundation. Uh, we want to let you know that the mayor of St. Louis has proclaimed that this weekend is the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation weekend in the city of St. Louis. You might have seen this out front and it's a nice little, it's got all those, it's got all the gilding on it, it's got the whereas and the whereas and what ifs and all that other kind of great verbiage that only those guys know how to write in. Hey, we would like for you guys to remember when you go home, take this thought with you. Get a proclamation in your own city, get it in your own state. I think I'm gonna try to get it in the Constitution. I'm working on that, I got friends, we're gonna get it done, so, but you can do this at home. And these are great little assets and a little bit of information that you can share locally with your media and your, your newspapers, your televisions, your radios, and stuff like that. Little bitty things like this go a long, long way. So ladies and gentlemen, it's Spastic Player, Paraplegia Foundation Weekend in the city of St. Louis. And then real, <laughs> Real quick before you go, we got a, a quick little uh, four minutes of video we're going to show you. It's again about our author in residence. He's going to tell you a little bit of information and we're going to fire this off. And then after that, we're going to do a little lunch. Here we go. Hi, my name is Jennifer Plumer. I'm Senior Vice President and Head of Marketing at Metadata. And I'm joined with Vamsi Kuduri here, uh, that's also with Metadata. And we are going to have a discussion in, in honor of Rare Disease Day. So Vamsi, can you introduce yourself? Sure, my name is uh, Vamsi Koduri and I work as a project manager uh, within the academic uh, team and the professional uh, services team of uh, Meditata. My son, who is 10 years old, Maria Koduri, is diagnosed with uh, HSP, which is hereditary spastic paraplegia. At first, uh, when he was close to two years old, uh, due to his symptoms um, and due to the MRI uh, being normal, uh, the doctors diagnosed uh, him as cerebral palsy. But finally, in 2019, uh, we are advanced genetic testing. Uh, he was diagnosed as HSP, SPG4. Wow, so, I mean, seven to eight years is an incredibly long period of time to not have that, that actual diagnosis. Like, what were the biggest challenges that you think uh, you know, were causing the delay like, with, with that diagnosis? We have so many unknowns that uh, that were spread out in so many different directions, and putting that all together in one place. In in this case, all the doctors, therapies, hospitals, tests is really a, a Herculean task. The care, the expertise, the doctors, the tests are so limited and so spread out that you know having to choose uh, different kinds of these doctors and specialties. Uh, will take us time, effort, and mental and physical trauma 
it takes number of years uh, to to get to the diagnosis and finally the therapies and and the cure is there a cure for hsp today so currently there is no cure uh, for hsp uh, however scientists like uh, dr peter bass uh, and his team at uh, drexel university in the past um, have used uh, rodent neurons but now they are using mouse models of uh, to develop um, uh, behavioral therapies for hsp they are currently doing the behavioral uh, studies and are now pioneers uh, to begin therapies stories of other people that are going through like similar uh, journeys uh, can be so uplifting and encouraging to know that you're not in it alone so if you had one piece of advice for others that are are you looking for that diagnosis uh, or that may be uh, experiencing a rare disease what would that be one thing what i can tell is having that relentless effort having that relentless pursuit uh, to success um, is what keeps us going of course we realized it lately but when we realized myself and my wife uh, from that day to did to today and in the future our one slogan is in the pursuit of the triumph hope always triumphs so keep that hope keep that momentum uh, keep that strength and keep that courage and especially celebrate uh, the success celebrate the small little things that your child or, uh, or whoever is going through uh, the challenges uh, celebrate those small little victories that will take us long way so thank you so much fancy um, and i know that you just recently wrote a book about all of your experiences so just like tell us what the name of that book is so people can check it out the name of the book is the pursuit of triumph and the slogan that i just read out is actually the slogan from the book uh, so the book's name is the pursuit of triumph so to keep it in a natural in the pursuit of the triumph hope always triumphs Hello again from St. Louis uh, and our SPF conference this year and I've got a guest now that I know n- needs no introduction. All of you listening I, I know no probably have met talked with maybe your patients of Dr. John Fink and Dr. Fink. Thank you for joining me for a few minutes. Well, thank First you Greg. All, on behalf of the foundation, we want to thank you for over 20 years of work with this foundation serving as its medical advisor being involved in the research processes that we're doing so we appreciate your being here I, sir for me it's a it's a privilege and it's an honor to participate and i'm happy to do as much as i can well we benefit and have benefited for so many years from your professional expertise and advice and, and the things we're dealing with so thank you so much as we think about that 20 plus years you've been involved share with us just for a moment how you see research moving forward today as it's progressed over these past 20 or so years uh, a couple things we are we're still doing what we've always been doing which is examining individuals examining families making diagnoses we're still doing the basic work and taking care of individuals and providing information we're still doing that however it has exploded in our knowledge of the hsps and primary lateral sclerosis our knowledge has expanded so our ability to make diagnoses has just exploded and and is really enhanced to where it was 20 years ago now we know there are more than 90 genes we can do genetic testing for many of them uh and and so we're grateful for that advance but we have limitations we didn't know these limitations before but uh now we're learning that there are potentially new and different genetic mechanisms that uh we need to discover and and uh unravel and we're developing the tools now to find those other genes and those other genetic mechanisms uh 20 years ago we had four genes we could study now we can now we can do a test that looks at 60 genes 
that cause HSP, and soon it'll be 70 or 80 genes, but we need to find more. So the big advance is in genetic testing. That has revolutionized our ability to make diagnoses. What's happening recently, I mean very recently, is that people are collaborating more tightly and, uh, and now, uh, with the recent announcement of the, of the CERN, Centers of Research Excellence, that enhances our ability to collaborate. And why is this important? Okay, the big roadblock, there are several big roadblocks to developing treatments. One, understanding the pathology of HSP and PLS. Understanding that pathology. And to do that, we need to pool resources from many centers. Now we have a formal network that allows that data to be pooled, consolidated, analyzed in a, in a uh, more coordinated manner. That's one. Two, another roadblock to developing treatments is understanding what happens um, uh, uh, in the spinal cord, how it reorganizes itself. How does the spinal cord reorganize itself? I'm not talking about the degenerative process, but the spinal cord reorganizes itself in the presence of nerve degeneration. So there's nerve degeneration, and the spinal cord reacts to that. And that reaction might impede treatments. So we need to uh, understand that remodeling process in the spinal cord and in the brain that happens after HSP and PLS begin. Now that we have a network of people that, can, that are working together, we can, we can share information in, in both in animal models and in humans about what happens in the spinal cord as a consequence of HSP and PLS because we don't want to treat just the nerve process. We have to undo the consequences that have already occurred. That's second. Three, and this is uh, obvious, is that the only with a coordinated network, only with a coordinated network, can we develop the natural histories. And what is a natural history? That means uh, what happens uh, every year, how much ability to walk is, how it's changing, how to measure that change. Um, and in the case of PLS, what happens to the use of the hands? What happens to speaking year after year to measure that change? Now, why is that important? Because hopefully there's medicine we can use or a gene therapy that's being developed. Both of these are in the process of being developed for a number of types of HSP. But how do we judge if it's helping? Okay, we have to have some basis of comparison. This is what the natural history studies, they provide that basis of comparison. You know, the Wright brothers plane flew 120 feet. It was not that exciting. I mean, it was very exciting for the Wright brothers, but I mean, uh, nobody could imagine that that little success would send ultimately people to the moon and soon to Mars. That, that's unbelievable advance based on that tiny little success. But the point is, is that when you develop your first treatments for PLS or HSP, I don't expect that they will be a home run the first time someone takes a pill. I don't expect that. I expect that we will get a little benefit and we'll make an improvement on that. It'll go back in. It'll, it, may, it may take a series of iterations to go from a Wright Brothers plane success to a, you know, a transatlantic flights and things like that. So how do we judge the benefit is really critical. We need to have ability to judge whether medicines are helping, and that's what a natural history study does. And you can only get really a natural history study if you have participating centers. So SPF, I'm saying what you've done, and thanking you for your leadership here, Greg, is that um, saw the need for this, uh, centers that will organize pathology studies, centers that will organize clinical studies, centers that will organize biomarker studies, and, and develop this. This is your leadership, and I'm grateful and honored that Michigan, University of Michigan, will be one of the participating centers. And, um, and, but these, these, this center network, this collaborating network, really addresses the roadblocks to developing treatments for HSP and PLS. And it's important, as you just did, to recognize the, the great importance of all the research that's been done since the very beginning because it got us to this point right. to be able to consider this collaborative, multifaceted approach in the CERN project that, as we've said before, and you might, you might reiterate as well, 
CERN project, as you said, is not going to give us that pill that we put in our mouth that solves everything, but it's, we believe, a major step in allowing these networks to come together, gather information to take what we hope will be the next big step in this process. Right, exactly, exactly. So, uh, we, everything we've done in the past has put us to where we are now and has positioned us to make even greater strides. We've taken small, uh, 20 years of small steps have taken us to a point that we can take bigger steps. And that's exciting, really exciting. Gene therapy trials for uh, one form of HSP have already been started in humans. Gene therapy trials, gene therapy research for at least four other types of HSP are in laboratory development. Now, in laboratories in the United States, in laboratories in Europe and Asia. Uh, so, uh, watching carefully, uh, a a and not just gene therapy trials, but small molecule therapies are, are coming along. And so, um, we need to be ready to test these in, in people as soon as, as soon as they're shown to be safe. Uh, with every advance, so for example, a drug is discovered for ALS. If it's shown to be safe, we're going to try off-label indications in PLS and HSP. A drug was recently approved by the FDA for Friedrich's ataxia. I've already reached out to that company about initiating a trial in HSP. And they haven't said yes, they haven't said no, we're still discussing. But the point is, developments in other fields, ataxias, ALS, spinal cord injury, Whatever we find that is helping other fields, we want to apply to the HSP PLS world. And, uh, and so, through the centers, we can develop standardized methods of analysis, of evaluating people. And so we say, okay, this is a way we're going to conduct clinical trials. And so, your center in this state and your center in this state can recruit people locally and everybody will be evaluated in a, in the identical manner, and uh, and it'll f greatly facilitate clinical trials. It's absolutely necessary. And beyond that, if you let me go on, uh, what we want to do is we want to partnership with NIH and develop uh, applications for NIH support. And the NIH is going to look at what is the what is the uh, history of, of centers working together. And you are positioning centers to work together is the critical step in, in uh, pre presenting a competitive application to NIH. So this is necessary to go for even bigger steps. And uh, it couldn't come at a better time, especially with all the breaking research advances. It's, it's, it's really exciting. Well, again, Dr. Fink, we want to thank you for your long-term, lifetime partnership and help with the foundation. It's past research. We're excited and, and so pleased that you're part of the, the CERN proposal oh, yeah. and you will be closely involved with that. And we want to thank those of you who are listening because this morning as we've, as we've had our uh, meetings here and, and heard our doctors talk with us, uh, many of you have, have messaged us that you are contributing toward toward our research and our, and our moving forward, and we thank you for that. In fact, we're about to take our break for lunch, but I want to let you know, as soon as we come back and begin our afternoon session, Jim Sheehan, our fundraising channel uh, chairman, is going to share with you uh, the amount of dollars that have been raised just this morning from your calls in. So it's exciting. We appreciate you at home listening and being part of this excitement here, contributing resources to help move it forward. So thank you all for being with us. We're going to take a break here for lunch. We'll be back about 1.20. Our, our schedule changes from time to time. And so we'll be back about 1.20 and get started with this afternoon. So thank you so much, and we will see you then.
Well, good afternoon and hello again. Uh, we have just had a great lunch here. I don't know about you, Linda, but I'm full and I'm ready to sit and listen a little bit more to some of the uh, research information from doctors that we're going to be hearing about this afternoon. With me now is Linda LaFontaine. And Linda has been a member of SPF for some time. I'm going to let her tell you about that in a moment. But Linda is from Canada. And we just want those who are listening now and listening in the future to know that we are not only an American organization, but we are international. We deal with, with people who've got this disease all over the world. And Linda is in Canada. Mm -hmm. One of our board members, Karina Thurgood, is, is in England. Uh, when we do SPF talks and outreach, we've talked to people in dozens of countries across the world. So if you're out there listening and you might be uh, not in this country, uh, we want you to know that we want you to be involved with what we're doing because, Linda, the diseases we have know no boundaries. And we're looking for cures and treatments and, and resources from anywhere to make a difference. So, Linda, if you would share with those who are listening, what got you involved with SPF? How long have you been involved with us? And, and uh, you serve on a committee or two, so just share your SPF experience. Uh, my SPF experience, I joined the SPF in 2020, simply out of desperation. There's a lack of information about this disease and just trying to reach out wherever I could. That's how I happened to find you guys. And then one thing led to another. I um, I participated in a natural history study that uh, Dr. Paganoni did in Boston. Then I joined the, I don't remember which one came first. I joined the marketing committee with the SPF. I, did, I joined the ambassador, the education and ambassador committee. And then I joined the, uh, well lately, the new one, the advocacy committee. Um, yeah, so I'm all over the place in the SPF. <laughs> well, as we've been telling folks who are listening, we will work anyone who will work, you know, well, and we appreciate go. that. But you might share with our listeners as someone who's uh, new to SPF over the last couple of years and gotten involved with these committees, how easy that is to do. I mean, it, it, talk for a moment about, you know, participating in the Zoom meetings and how comfortable that is and, and so that others might feel more comfortable in doing that as well. It was super easy. It was just sending an email. There was no process. It was very, very easy. So if you have a computer and an internet service and can get an email and, and tap on that and you can, you can talk yeah. and work with Zoom, share with us for a moment uh, how things might be different. I know there are some Canadian organizations that you've worked with, been part of. Mm -hmm. They are partner organizations. And I, although we may be different, we certainly want to work with, support, you know, what work they're doing and hope they support what we're doing here again to find those treatments and cures. So share just for a moment how things are in, with the Canada organization and how what we, we might better uh, work with them and them with us. Well, I think um, in order to give the answers for hereditary spastic paraplegia and primary, primary lateral sclerosis, I, I, I think uh, they're such complicated diseases. What I'm trying to do is to share a lot of information, exactly like what you're trying to establish with the CERN project, or just, just establishing collaborations. Because these are such complicated diseases, we need we need information, international collaboration. We need information from everybody, all in one. We need to put everything together. And. And the greatest source of information that I know of at the moment is, is the SPF Foundation website. Absolutely. In the past few years, we want to thank Hank Chupi and uh, Dana Lansfair for their work, others as well for their work on the website, but we've really focused in the last three year or four years to build that website into one that has that kind of information, those kind of resources about both diseases. So when you found us, how did you find us? Did you Google us and or did you Google HSP or do you, do you recall how that happened? I don't, I don't recall specifically. I must have just Googled HSP. Well, I really, it was that easy. We are <laughs> sp-foundation.org, and if you haven't been on that website, we invite you to go there. You can spend many, many hours information learning about these diseases and then learning about our structure and our work and how you can be involved in working with us. So, Linda, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming to uh, St. Louis to this meeting. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you in these committees and uh, hopefully to see you next year at the AC again. So thank you and uh, 
We'll, we're going to head back now. It's time uh, shortly to begin our afternoon uh, presentations and speaking. So we'll say goodbye right now and see you again later. In positions, with their own. They want to get us as live and off the stage. They're on standby. Right, we're at 29. And Craig is gone. We need to look. Is he live? Jeff, you stand by. And then we'll let you talk and then I'll. Just stand up here. Okay. She was walking that way. She's, she's close by. We'll get her. Don't worry about it. And you're on. Hello, hello. Everyone had a good lunch, good break, good visitation. I wanted to give you a couple of quick announcements, a couple of updates. Uh, yesterday I mentioned that in your goodie bag you each should have a uh, survey. Um, I don't remember seeing any turned in at the registration desk yet, so if you don't mind, please fill that out before you leave. <clears throat> and you don't have to wait till the end. It's really nothing on the survey that talks about the um, annual conference. It's more about the foundation, and we like your help in making sure we're doing the best we can. So please take a minute to fill that out if you can and leave it <clears throat> excuse me, at the registration desk, or if you want to hand deliver it to me before you leave, that's fine. Um, also, we talked yesterday about doing a picture for the 5K, the folks that have done our uh, 5K run, walk, and roll in the past or planning to do it this year. If you are one of those candidates, please meet just to the left of the registration desk just as we get done. I think we get done at like 5.30 today, maybe earlier. Or... Turn page. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Depending on what time we get done, try to potty break or whatever, and then meet just to the left of the registration desk, and we'll get together for a picture for that. Lastly, and most excitingly, 
When I talked to you last time this morning, we had roughly $10,000 that had been contributed. Now we have $39,000 today from people in this room, people that are watching online, stuff like that. So, so if you double that, if the match happens, that's roughly $80,000. So that's cool. So, but again, we're not there yet. $39,000, we got to go to seventy. dollars So reach out to family and friends, whoever you can. Uh, again, they can do it online. Uh, if they want to do something later, like send a check, we've got one gentleman that wants to uh, uh, do some uh, stock transfers. That, that'll take a couple of days. Anything like that, let us know and we can work it out. We can uh, make sure that happens. Okay? Thanks again for all our donors and have a great rest of the afternoon. Okay, guys. Uh, this is... Uh we're getting right back into it as quick as we can. We got a, a really packed uh, segment of information to get us through this afternoon. And remember, we are gonna have the Q&A with all of our uh, uh, researchers and doctors that are here uh, a little bit later, okay? So we're going right to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Osdenler. Oh, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're very really quick. Thank you so much. We'll Thank you. You just speak, we'll get you. Wonderful. Everybody can hear me, right? Excellent. So if I can manage to work this, then we should be good to go. All right, wonderful. And oh yeah, there's also a slide there's online here. Very nice. I can read. Yes. So welcome everyone. And each, day, each year I come to the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation meetings, I get more energized. Last year we were thinking of what shall we do together to increase our impact. And this year we started with a big announcement for a centralized effort. And now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about NU9, the first clinical trial for a compound that improves the health of the upper motor neurons. Biomarkers are coming up. Yeah. yeah. This Wonderful. Bit Thank you so much. Is that a little bit better? That is much better, oh. yes, because I want to see the screen as well. All Thank right. you. There you go. Yes. So th the biomarkers are coming, and research um, is exponentially growing. And these are really exciting times. And I know this disease affects many of you, families, um, children, and it's a very rare disease. And as the diseases get more rare, the better connected we should be because nobody is going to care about this disease more than we do. I mean, the patients, the caregivers, scientists, and doctors. And that's why we are here, and that's why uh, the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation is very important for their efforts. So before I start, I want you to give them an applause for all that they have done for this year and previous years and moving forward. Thank you so much, uh, the Foundation. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, NU9, why it is important to develop clinical trials for upper motor neuron diseases, give you an update on NU9, and what are the bottlenecks as we move forward for clinical trials and finding effective uh, uh, cures for upper motor neuron diseases. So, of course, the current picture is not as bright as we might wish or hope, because HSP and PLS are rare diseases. We cannot change that. Disease mechanisms are heterogeneous and they are not fully understood. Druggable targets are not well defined or established. I'm sure there are many druggable targets out there that we don't know. And drug companies don't show much interest because again, it's a rare disease. You know, there are many bottlenecks that we're gonna talk about. So it's very hard to get the drug companies get in, show interest. There are really no clinical trials. And again, before there were really no uh, setup to initiate clinical trials, and hopefully that's gonna change. And there are really no biomarkers uh, to show a quantitative output for clinical trials to be initiated and for drug companies to show interest. But I think all these points are now changing a bit because uh, we say HSP, PLS are rare diseases, but are they really, or how rare they are? And I think it's because patients do not come forward, we may not really know the full extent, the, 
the total numbers of patients. And we were hearing stories, you know, yesterday and from patients and from doctors that uh, some diseases or some patients go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed or never diagnosed or they may not even go to a clinic. And, but now if we have clinics, if they are all connected, if we have an outreach, if we have advocacy, more and many patients would actually speak up and would uh, join, and we may really know that this may not be a rare disease as it was once thought. So that's also the goal of symposiums like this, and each and every one in this room actually has an obligation. When you go back home, make sure that you, uh, you know, share this information with your friends, with your communi community, so that we reach out to as many patients as possible, because they need to know that there's at least a foundation working for them, and then there are scientists working for them, and there's, there are many exciting developments to get them to the clinical trials. And again, we said disease mechanisms are heterogeneous, they are not fully understood. Yes, that is true, but we make very important progress. Like Dr. Blackstone actually told uh, this morning, and you remember he showed in his um, figures the uh, mechanisms that are altered that have become dysfunctional in diseased upper motor neurons, and even the gene mutations related to them. So it's not that we don't know anything, we know something, but we, we may not know everything yet. And, but then we can build on what we already know and then move forward with the things that we can discover in the future. And here I put a little uh, parenthesis there and remind myself, you know, tell them more about spastin and profilin. So that's coming up. I'm going to tell you more about the spastin and profilin. And we said druggable targets are not well defined. Yes, that is true, but not so true anymore because there are some uh, cellular defects that are common that we have already identified. There, there may be other cellular uh, components which may be shared or unique, but it is unfair to us scientists to say we don't know anything. We actually know a lot and we learn on the pace, uh, on an exponential pace. So I'm going to focus on the things that we know, and you'll be surprised. It's actually, uh, it's actually remarkable how much we have gained uh, over the um, short amount of time. And now we say, you know, drug companies don't show interest. Well, that may not be true also, because now there is Akava Therapeutics, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. And it is actually a company that gives priority to upper motor neuron diseases. So you, for the first time, have a company that says, I am here to find targets, drug, drugs for the upper motor neuron disease patients. So please raise your hand if you had known about Akava Therapeutics. Anybody in the room knew about Akava Therapeutics? Oh my God, just two, three people. All right. So at the end of this uh, seminar, hopefully many people will raise their hands. I think this is a great achievement. Uh, especially for the drug discovery field, because now there is a company interested in upper motor neuron diseases and the patients. And again, we say there are no clinical trials. Yes, that is true, but that may be changing because I'm going to tell you more, more about NU9 and our um, efforts to start the clinical trials. And we say there are no biomarkers. Well, that's also a problem. Yes, we understand. But that's also changing. And there is important progress being made. And... Dr. Mitsumoto actually sh shared his uh, findings with the lipids, and I'm going to talk a little bit about metabolomics. So a, a lot of interesting uh, research is coming up on that. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Akava Therapeutics. So this is a drug company started with uh, Dr. Silverman, and it's based on uh, the compounds that are generated in his lab, and it's also the first compound of interest is a new nine. Uh, the compound that we published together showing an improvement in the health and function of the upper motor neurons that are diseased with SOD1 toxicity and TDP pathology. So in this, if you check the website, and I invite you to check the website, it's akavatx.com, uh, you will see on the therapeutic areas, if you click on it, it says primary lateral sclerosis, because that's the therapeutic area that this company is really interested about. And the other one is hereditary spastic paraplegia, that this company is really interested in hereditary spastic paraplegia 
of patients. So now there is a drug company trying to find drugs for you. How wonderful is that? Yeah, we cannot say now, oh, there are no drug companies. There is actually at least one drug company, and we hope that these are going to increase uh, as we have centers of excellences laying the foundation for clinical trial readiness and for the clinical trials to be set up and for biomarkers uh, to be used. But uh, we are moving in the right direction. So let me tell you a little bit more about NU9. So NU9 is developed by a cell-based and mechanism-focused drug discovery effort. And I will have to explain to you what those mean. And we think that translation is at the cellular level, which means the cells in uh, patients, which are the upper motor neurons that degenerate, are very similar to the upper motor neurons in well-characterized disease models. So the cell is a cell, neuron is a neuron. Regardless of species, if uh, a patient upper motor neuron shows, let's say, mitochondrial dysfunction, ER stress, axonal problems, the well-defined uh, disease model upper motor neuron also show mitochondrial problems, ER stress, axonal problems. So the cellular problems are shared. The pathology is shared. And that's why we have to learn directly from the cells. So cells really speak to us. They tell us what they like. They tell us what they don't like. We just have to find ways to listen to them. And that's what we're working on. And the NU9 clinical trial, hopefully, is the first clinical trial to improve the health of diseased upper motor neurons. So we started within the context of ALS because we used SOD1 mouse and TDP mouse, and the, those were the mouse models for ALS. But now, investigations in the HSP model or maybe the PLS system, and depending on our results, we may expand it to the, uh, upper the other upper motor neuron diseases. And if you look at an upper motor neuron, here's a, a cartoon of an upper diseased upper motor neuron. The main problems that we realize that they have are these protein aggregations, mitochondrial disintegration, mitochondrial problems, ER problems. And ER is the site where proteins are made, and ER stress also contributes to neurodegeneration. And there is loss of cellular integrity, which means the actin tubulin dynamics are uh, altered. There are vacuoles in the apical dendrite. There is axonal degeneration. There is uh, intracellular transport defects. And the apical dendrites begin to degenerate. The, so the upper motor neurons don't have just one problem. <coughs> they have numerous problems, and sometimes all at the same time. And you know, there is heterogeneity. Uh, um, among patients, because some, for some patients, the primary problem could be the protein aggregation. For other patients, the primary problem could be the ER stress. For another patient, the primary problem could be the axon outgrowth. But these are the major problems that really makes the upper motor neurons unhappy. So to be able to, to, be able to draw this picture, I think we spent maybe eight, 10 years of research trying to understand the underlying mechanisms and the causes of neuronal vulnerability, specifically in upper motor neurons. But now we have a very good understanding of why they become vulnerable. Now we have targets, right? Now we have an idea that if we can, for example, improve the health of the mitochondria, we may make the upper motor neurons healthy. And Dr. Galton actually is going to talk a little bit about that. So protein aggregation. If we reduce protein aggregation, that may be a therapeutic intervention. If we improve uh, cytoarchitectural integrity, axon transport, that could be another uh, therapeutic intervention. So there are ways uh, to um, develop treatments um, based on the information that we have gathered. Now, this is a picture of an upper motor neuron treated with NU9. Just for 60 days, in vivo, in a live animal, for 100 milligram per kilogram for 60 days gavage treatment. When we do that, in two months, we see reduction in protein aggregation, improvement in mitochondria structure and function, uh, improvement in ER, and uh, reduced uh, disintegration of the apical dendrite and improved axon outgrowth. Can you imagine? Even if NU9 was able to do one or two of those, that would be interesting but it was able to overcome four of those, uh, or all of those major underlying causes of neuronal vulnerability. So when we found out this result, 
Then uh, Akava Therapeutics said, you know, I would like to license this because I think this is a compound that I would like to take forward for clinical trials. But if you think about the, this is the picture that Dr. Blackstone showed this morning, the common cellular problems or the problems the upper motor neurons have, again, uh, research already showed the axon transport defects, uh, ER, Golgi, mitochondria uh, defects that upper motor neurons uh, have. So then the upper motor neurons that we study in the SOD mouse model in the TDP model, and TDP pathology is also seen in uh, HSP and PLS uh, brains, uh, there are shared and common cellular problems that we should focus on. And when we published our paper with, um, uh, with Wiley Publishing in Clinical and Translational Medicine, they actually decided to make a movie out of it. Can you imagine how many times you publish a paper and then they say, oh, let's make a movie out of your paper. So they made a movie, and I don't know, I can't show it, I cannot uh, start it from here. Would you be able to start the movie? There's no uh, noise, there's no voice. That's okay, that's okay. And I don't know if it started. Ha. So the upper motor neuron degeneration is a hallmark for neurodegenerative diseases, such as hereditary spastic paraplegia, primary lateral sclerosis, and also ALS, right? But the imp uh, improvement of upper motor neuron health as an effective treatment strategy has not been uh, studied and no compound that improves their health has been discovered. There was nothing. And there was really no preclinical tests available to see upper motor neurons respond. We worked with Dr. Silverman, and he's the inventor of Lyrica. He's an, an amazing medicinal chemist. And we worked in mouse models uh, in which upper motor neurons are GFP, they have SOD1, they have TDP pathology, and just by treatment with 100 microgram per uh, uh, liter, uh, for 60 days, we have seen improvement. And when you compare ALS patient versus mouse model of promoter neurons, they have the similar pathology. And now NU9 is important because it reduces uh, toxic cellular uh, SOD1, but also improves the health of the uh, upper motor neurons. And again, this is the first compound, and hopefully there will be more coming. But this is actually a huge leap because uh, it's future cell-based and mechanism-focused drug discovery studies. And that's why they made the movie, because that's actually changing how we do drug discovery. And, and what do I mean by cell-based and mechanism-focused drug discovery? I, may, I mean this. Uh, when a patient goes to clinic, they actually have a symptom. For example, Alzheimer's disease patients go to clinic because they can't remember or you know, they have problems with memory, but they have no problem walking or they have no problem eating, but they cannot remember. But when an HSP or PLS patient goes to the clinic, it's not because they can't remember, they have spasticity, they can't walk, right? They, there is a circuitry, there is a neuronal circuitry that is affected. And if you think about neuronal circuits, there are neurons that are involved in each circuitry. For example, the motor neuron circuitry has components in the brain. Upper motor neurons are the, one of the most important. And then the spinal motor neurons in the spinal cord, which are uh, projecting to the spinal motor neurons, they execute a uh, function. But when you go to the doctor, it's because the neuronal circuitry is not functioning properly. So clinical symptom is related to the circuitry defect. And the circuitry are made of neurons. And there are some neurons that are more important uh, in that circuitry. Upper motor neurons are the important neurons because they uh, receive input and they send output to the spinal uh, motor neurons. They initiate movement. They, will, uh, they also modulate movement. So even though patients have, um, you know, similar symptoms, but at a cellular level, they may develop the disease due to different underlying causes. So even though the clinical outcome is very similar, that they cannot do this or they cannot do that, but the reason why they cannot do that may vary from patient to patient. So normal clinical trials so far, they have been collecting everyone in one trial, 
okay, without knowing, like, so this is a conventional treatment. Then you get a mixed bag of results. Some people show no effects. Some people, you know, very good. And some people, not so good. But then the very good ones are so small within the population, then the FDA says, oh, it's not the significance, blah, 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 and then it fails. But there were some very good ones that benefited, but we, we can't give them the drug because the clinical trial failed. So now our goal is to understand who develops the disease, why? Okay, and that requires a biomarker. Okay, so we understand, oh, this person develops the disease because of axon transport defects. This person develops the disease of, because of protein aggregation, because of ER, because of mitochondria, because of cytoarchitectural problems. So if we know, understand the underlying cause, then we can match them with the drug that's most effective for their problem. So then we learn directly from cells to be able to um, bring that because it is the uh, motor neurons that degenerate in, in those patients. So we have to focus our attention to the neurons to be able to understand why they die. And the, for the mechanism-based theory, we say that yes, you can develop drugs for the disease, but now we understand diseases are so heterogeneous that you may wait for Godot. Godot is never going to come like here, right? We'll, we will never find the drug for all patients within the spectrum of these complex diseases. So if we focus our attention to the mechanism and say, for example, we have an amazing drug that improves the integrity of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And guess what? The inner membrane of the mitochondria is broken in some ALS patients, in some PLS patients, in some STB, in some of this, this is this, right? So you may actually have a mechanism-based drug discovery that you can recruit patients from other diseases. Do you see what I mean? So then this is actually a mechanism-based drug discovery. So you are not saying, I am developing an Alzheimer's disease drug. I have a drug for this mechanism. And now you will have to have biomarkers to understand which patient has that mechanism responsible for their clinical outcome. If you do this mismatching, then you may actually start the mechanism-based drug discovery. And we are in 2023, but FDA was approved in the 1940s. And at the time, they had diseases with clinical manifestations. Dr. Alzheimer's developed, you know, had this um, clinical outcome, and Dr. Parkinson, you know, all these doctors, we did not know proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics, RNA-seq, we did not know any of these. So then they thought that each disease are a distinct entity. But now we know that each disease is a little bit like the other disease. You know, there's some common, there's some unique, but we have to focus our attention to the common ones. And that's the common mechanism, finding the common mechanism is extremely important. So because if we do, we may not need to have a clinical trial just for HSP, just for PLS patients. We may perform basket uh, trials and include some HSP, some PLS patients, based on the mechanism by which they develop the disease. Of course, this is future thinking, but it is not within, uh, you know, it, it's not um, something that we cannot achieve. It all depends on our ability to understand the mechanism. All right, so now, for the NU9 in ACOVA Therapeutics, uh, I told you that after we received the results, the um, company um, licensed it. It became AKV9, and the company completed the toxicity studies in large mammals, uh, different doses, different times, and so forth. Those were very expensive studies. They completed them, results were good. Then we applied to FDA for an orphan drug designation and we actually received the orphan drug designation. We got the approval from FDA. Then we started preparing our IND application to FDA to start, to start clinical trials. We submitted May, May 5th, and hopefully within uh, June 2nd, maybe I can um, officially you know, tell, give you the good news that we will be starting the uh, clinical trials before uh, the, the summer ends this year. So, I'm very happy. 
Thank you so much. So it's, it actually did not take that long to go from discovery to starting the um, you know, clinical trials. Of course, we raised a lot of funds and we formed an amazing scientific advisory board. And actually, Dr. Mitsumoto is here in the audience and I'm very thankful to him for all his uh, contribution and suggestions. Thank you so much. So that's about NU9, and hopefully we will raise enough funds because, as you know, the clinical trials are, are extremely expensive. They're becoming even more expensive, but uh, our goal is to start as early as possible. But then, when it is time to go to uh, phase two clinical trials, then FDA is going to ask us, okay, what is your biomarker? How will you tell me that your compound works? Then I need to tell them, these are our pharmacokinetic biomarkers. These are the biomarkers that tell us that the upper motor neuron uh, ha have improved, and I'm working on those biomarkers. <sighs> that needs to be done. The biomarker study needs to be done before we move into clinical trials, the, the phase two clinical trials. And hopefully that's, that's gonna be uh, towards the third quarter of next year. All right, so we are on a mission, we are on a timeline. And People ask me, how about NU9? Can it be for HSP? Can it be for PLS? You know, can we be included in clinical trials? I, I constantly get these questions. But then what we need to understand, if the upper motor neurons in ALS or the model systems that we use that represent ALS is similar to the upper motor neurons that degenerate in HSP and PLS, right? We need to understand, as I told you, as a mechanistic insight, if they degenerate due to similar mechanisms, then maybe a basket trial may be designed. But if the mechanism is different, then we may need to look for other compounds. So first, we looked at the genes that are uh, mutated in ALS patients and also the genes that are mu mutated in HSP PLS patients. Please read those two papers if you can. So we look at the uh, protein network analysis, canonical pathways, upstream regulators, downstream regulators, druggable targets, the unique and common uh, pathology that are shared between ALS, HSP, and PLS. And, you know, one paper from Navarino et al., it sh shows us that the spastin and profilin, they are within the uh, HSP, ALS interactome domain. And you remember, I had in my first slides tell them about the spastin paraphilin story, so now the story is coming. And uh, you may know that uh, in the HSP patients, there, some of them have mutations in their spastin gene. And uh, this mutation has been detected in 40% of HSP uh, cases, so that's an important representation. And HS spastin is a microtubule uh, uh, severing an ER-shaping protein. And there are two forms, and um, so my colleagues from Dr. Bass's lab are actually going to t give a talk about this tomorrow. And I was very lucky to collaborate with Dr. Bass because he generated a mouse model that recapitulates many aspects of the neurodegeneration uh, uh, within the context of spastin. Okay? And this mutation was detected in patients. He made the mouse model. The mouse shows a phenotype. That's great. And, uh, and the profilin, on the other hand, is another actin binding protein similar to uh, spastin. But when you have mutations in profilin, you don't have HSP, you have ALS. So this is very strange because these two proteins all uh, act within the actin tubulin cytoarchitectural dynamic pathway. Well, when you have mutation in one of them, you have ALS. If you have mutation in the other one, you have HSP. You know, why is that? And the human mutation in the profilin gene was also reported. And we have shown that in the uh, profilin mice, there is also upper motor neuron loss. This was a paper that we uh, published with Dr. Uh, Kiai. And then you might remember that we have generated a reporter line for upper motor neurons in which the upper motor neurons are fluorescent. So that's actually very good because then you can actually distinguish them among many other cells and neurons in the brain. And you know which one is an upper motor neuron. As you can imagine, we cross this reporter line with the spastin mouse model, as well as the profilin mouse model. Now we have diseased upper motor neurons with spastin mutation and profilin mutation, but one of them develops HSP, the other one develops ALS. Now we're gonna ask the cells, why are you developing ALS again? And why are you developing HSP? Because they are fluorescent, we hope that they're gonna speak to us. And the beauty is that 
these are promoter neurons are GFP, so when we put them in culture, we can also distinguish them among other cells as GFP, also seen here. These GFP cells are the upper motor neurons. So this is a picture that I have taken midnight Saturday on a tissue culture room, <laughs> but these are the GFP neurons in a culture dish. And after a while, if you look so long at them, they look like uh, stars in the sky. And that's why the photograph. And by looking at these cells in culture and knowing which one is the upper motor neuron, we can actually shift our focus from mice to neurons. And we can ask neurons, 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 do you like this treatment? And if they like it, they send a long axon, they branch, arborize, and if they don't like it, they shrink and they die. So you know exactly if they like it or not. And they give a response to you like immediately, okay? And so they speak to you in a way. So you can learn from them if they like that treatment or not. So we developed these in vitro tissue culture approaches and we were invited to write a review that incorporating upper motor neuron health in drug discovery. We just published a paper together with a, a company, um, Helix Smith, on their mitochondrial essays and Dr. Gautam is gonna cover this. And we found that NU9 uh, improves the health of the upper motor neurons disease with SOD1 to, uh, better together with uh, Ruzol Adar1. So then in the spastin mutation, if you look at the bar graph, they actually have shorter axons. So this may tell us that, uh, you know, they are not, the disease neurons are not very happy. Then we treat them with NU9, and you can tell that these are preliminary results, but if you treat them with NU9, like G-spastin, G-spastin plus NU9, there is some improvement. So that's, of course, needs to be repeated, but our studies, the initial studies, suggest that NU9, especially for improving axon length uh, as a measure, uh, they may be happy with NU9. The system that we use for those uh, neuronal measurements are tracing individual neurons by hand, so, you know, not many people happy in the lab tracing all these neurons by hand, and, you know, you can't license it to a company, nobody's gonna license, you know, trace the neurons by hand. So we have to develop a high throughput analysis drug discovery. So we received the OD grant for this, and now, for the first time, we are actually developing a drug discovery platform in which we use diseased upper motor neurons as a readout is their success as a readout. So now we are having a drug discovery platform so that other companies may say, oh, can you test my comp compound? Does it improve the health of the HSP uh, disease upper motor neurons? So we may begin to identify many new compounds, either new ones or repurposed ones. But we did not have this system to detect uh, whether you know, the compounds of interest would imp improve the health of the disease upper motor neurons. So that's what we do. And now, looking at you know, our preliminary results again with this high throughput or semi-high throughput, it seems as if the spastin neurons, you know, I think they like a new nine. Of course, we need to do a couple more experiments, but they seem to the neuronal growth branches. Um, you know, oh, I don't have the a new nine result here, but then normally we actually have reduction and with treatment, uh, we wanna see how much improvement that we can get. But having a significant difference between the healthy and the diseased is good, because this gives you a baseline to see whether treatment improves them or not. Because if we had bar graphs similar, you know, then how are you gonna test the effect of the added compound? So I think we are in the right direction, and so we are working towards that. In addition to this high throughput, we are also developing cortical connectivity as an outcome measure for drug discovery. And of course, this I just have one slide because this whole topic can be another hour talk. It's very important for neurons to be functional, right? But when you trace the axon length branching arborization, it's basically how beautiful they look. You know, one person may be beautiful, but they may not be functional. So you need to be beautiful and functional at the same time. So then this is functionality. So we want to see if the neurons are functioning properly. Are they integrated together? And that's why we are actually using the high density electrophysiology system. 
And I don't know if I can move the, can you move? Uh, yes, look at that. Boom, do you see? Okay, so this is very exciting because uh, here is a cortical slice and you will see like, whoosh, like you will see a burst of firing. I don't know if you can play one more time. So you see it's a bit, it's a bit see firing and then boom, they fire together. And you might have heard like neurons that fire together, wire together, fire together. So if the neurons are wired, they actually boom, they fire together. So it's like a heartbeat. And when you do electrophysiology, I don't know if there are any people in the room who does electrophysiology, it is so amazing because you, could, you, you hear like boom, 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 boom. Yeah, it's, it, it is like that, I'm seriously. So then we can actually see if the cortex are integrated. And in disease neurons, it's basically dun, 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 you know, there's really not much boom, 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 no, it's so they speak like that. So if we can actually change that to bam, 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 so if we, you know, then that means there is more cortical connectivity, there is more health. So now we are actually developing that platform to detect that, and that's very exciting. All right, next one maybe, yes. So now we are developing drug discovery platforms for HSP and for rapid drug screening using upper motor neurons that are diseased. And maybe this will be used for uh, drug repurposing because there are many compounds out there or companies out there with failed drugs. They already invested I don't know how many million dollars and they wanna see if they have utility in other diseases. Why not HSP? Why not PLS? And if we have the center, you remember this morning we were talking about the clinical trial readiness, it may actually be faster than we know that we may actually start clinical tri trials with new compounds if we are able to connect the clinical uh, team and also the researchers. So then, again, we're getting ready for drug discovery for HSP patients and we're trying to identify new compounds, but also find utility in the old compounds. And now, when you work with compounds, you need to understand again the mechanism of action because not every compound is gonna work for everyone, right? So then how do we understand the mechanism of action? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we do in our tissue culture. And again, here you can see a GFP neuron, right? Do you see that they are GFP? And we give them a plasmid, we electroporate them with a plasmid uh, so that you can actually see the mitochondria inside the cell. Now the mitochondria are those red dots, do you see? Inside the cell, there are red mitochondria. And these are GFP cells, and we can see the mitochondria in them. Now, I don't know if I can show the videos. In the wild type, again, this is a GFP cell mitochondria. Look, 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 mitochondria is moving. Tick, tick, tick. They're moving along the neurite inside the neuron. So we can uh, do mo movies. And look at the spastin. It's staggering. Like it's not, it, it wants to go, it can't go. They're longer. Do you see? There seems to be a problem with their mitochondria moving. Okay, next slide. Then we quantify. Here was the mitochondria. 10 minutes later, it's here. 20 minutes, it's there. Was it able to move or not? So we quantify them and look at this. That in the spastin model, and these are P3. These are so small. Even at this age, they cannot really have very good axon transport mechanism. So then one of the problems that we identify, among all the other problems that I told you, this axon transport problem seems to be a very important one, that they can't really move the uh, mitochondria. But then we say, all right, is it because axon transport problem or is it because mitochondria problem? Because mitochondria could be so disintegrated that it cannot be attached to the you know, kinase and dynein, the motors that you know, do the transport. Okay. And this, our finding about the corticospinal, the movement also is in line with the findings that there's degeneration of the corticospinal tract. Yes, the corticospinal tract degenerates in the spastin mouse. And again, how about the mitochondria health? Maybe it's not really axon transport, maybe it's because mitochondria is so un unhealthy. So luckily we have this seahorse system. It tells us the health and integrity of the mitochondria because if you look at the mitochondria inner membrane, there are these electron transport uh, chain systems and there's an assay that you can do uh, to see if the mitochondria can take ox, you know, can actually uh, give oxygen, can consumption, you know, can, can they uh, consume uh, oxygen uh, and, and so forth. And here we find that the respiration 
of mitochondria, in the spastin mouse, it's not really so much affected. But it's the profilin mouse that the mitochondria cannot really perform respiration. So then this tells us the axon transport defect that we have seen is not really because mitochondria is sick. It's because that they can't really do axon transport really well. Now, be, be, being able to understand at this precision is so important when you are developing drug uh, treatment trials because then we would focus our attention to the compounds that improve axon transport defects. Do you see what I mean? All right, so now we go even one step further and then we say, all right, genes and genes and proteins and proteins, please tell us what are the differences between the upper motor neurons that degenerate in ALS and upper motor neurons that degenerate in HSP? Because we have these neurons GFP, we can do fluorescence activated cell sorting. We can identify and isolate them as a single neuron population. And then after we isolate them as a single neuron population, we perform RNA-seq, we perform proteomics, and then gene expression says, well, I'm expressing these, these, these genes. Well, the other one expresses other genes. Here I have these, these, these proteins. Well, the other one has another protein. Then we can tell at a cellular level, what is it that makes them uh, vulnerable? So we are doing those studies now. This is actually a study uh, supported by R21. So if I tell you the summary so far, there is a drug company willing to develop clinical trials for HSP and PLS. There is a new compound, AKV9, moving into clinical trials for upper motor neurons. And we are trying to reveal whether upper motor neurons in ALS, HSP, PLS degenerates via similar mechanisms. We are developing high throughput drug discovery platforms, and we are performing RNA-seq and omics to reveal disease mechanism differences. So now our goal, of course, is to move the AKV9 uh, project forward, lay the foundation for the discovery of other drugs, and develop effective treatment trials for HSP and PLS. And that brings me to biomarkers, because this is one of the major bottleneck, uh, bottle, bottlenecks that we have to move the field forward, because FDA always asks us, what is your biomarker? Without a biomarker, how are you going to assess that this compound is working? Yes, there are clinical outcomes, and as Dr. Mitsumoto also mentioned, there, are, there is rating system which can detect differences, you know, even within six months. And, but it would be really nice to have a quantitative outcome measure that is reproducible, and wherever you are in the world, you get the same outcome. So then. Biomarkers are coming very different colors and styles. Um, there, there may be a diagnostic biomarker, which means, are you a PLS or are you an ALS? And again, Dr. Mitsumoto mentioned that lipids are important to distinguish both of them, right? Because sometimes PLS patients or patients come to the clinic and they are diagnosed with PLS and they say, oops, this isn't PLS, this is ALS, because after a while they begin to show spinal motor neuron signs as well. So distinguishing patients, PLS and ALS, you know, we should not depend on time. We should depend on some reliable biomarkers. Pharmacokinetic biomarkers are extremely important because we need to know if, for example, with treatment, are there any biomarkers that go down with treatment, that go up with treatment, that responds to treatment, and you know, how that changes over time. So the pharmacokinetic biomarkers are a must. And uh, this is the paper that Hiroshi Mitsumoto, Dr. Mitsumoto mentioned. Uh, his lab published this very nice paper about lipidomics, and that lipids actually give a huge insight about the differences between HSP and ALS. So that's a remarkable paper, and we build onto that. So now we're, looking, we're performing lipidomics on fax purified neurons and also different regions of the brain uh, of ALS patients and uh, a few PLS patients, uh, human brains that we have uh, that are, are shared by a VA hospital. In addition, we have also had the privilege of working with two Italian uh, families, and these were two little girls. I want to tell you the story. This is actually a heartfelt story. This happened during COVID. These people leave, live in uh, Italy, and they, each family, different families, one had a two-year-old daughter, the other one had a three-year-old daughter. They had mutations in the Alson gene, different mutations, 
different sites shown in that figure, but they have very severe ALS, juvenile ALS, and their upper motor neurons are affected. This is like major upper motor neuron loss and severe juvenile ALS cases. They have sent me their serum and plasma samples, and I have done metabolomics, lipidomics, and uh, proteomics. And actually, Dr. Gautam developed the metabolomic uh, profiling, so we are very thankful to him for, for his studies. And by performing all these omic and personalized medicine approach, we begin to realize what are the cellular events that are particularly affected in these girls. And then we looked at their serum, for example, we realized that in, in there are some metabolites that are not present in the controls and highly present in those two girls, and half present in their relatives, because relatives are heterozygous. They have only one copy of the muta uh, one mutated copy uh, gene, okay? And there are also some metabolites that are either present in the controls and absent in AO or the other one, or the ones that are present in the controls and totally absent in the girls. So then the metabolites actually begin to tell you that there is a, there may be a distinction, right? And we look in the plasma, we see similar. But of course, n is equal to one or two. But when we look at those um, cellular events, if I can go down, back, yes. When we uh, performed uh, canonical pathway analysis, we, re we realized that it's actually the mitochondrial problems that are very much affected. So now I'm gonna tell you the unpublished results from these. Because after we got those results, we had a meeting with the doctors, and I told them all the results, and I said, based on this finding, and we just published the metabolomic, we haven't published the protein and lipids, but we have that data, and we said, based on our data, it seems their major problem is the mitochondrial integrity. And the doctor said, well, there are actually other FDA-approved drugs for mitochondrial integrity, and we give them for another disease indication, do you think I should try for these patients? I said, I'm not a doctor, I cannot tell you what to do, but uh, if it's not toxic, and if you think that it may have utility, you know, you may try, I don't know. So they tried for six months, just six months. After six months, we received serum plasma again, so we have before and after results, right? And within six months, one of the actually patients both of them improved their uh, scores, and one of them, based on what the doctor tells me, started standing up. I was amazed. So now, they continue for the one year, and we will receive the serum plasma samples soon, so then I have a longitudinal sample uh, analysis before treatment, at the time of pre treatment, six months after treatment, one year after treatment. So that data is extremely valuable, and I think we are onto something that, you know, lipids, uh, the metabolomics may tell us something about the um, pharmacokinetic biomarkers. In addition to metabolomics, we're also doing the lip lipidomics studies in those, and I think lipids also tell us about pharmacokinetic biomarkers. But now, because these n numbers are only two, three, I have to have a larger cohort for confirmatory analysis to see if these results are real. So that's why, we're working very hard in the lab for the biomarker projects. And I think it's really important to develop personalized medicine approaches, especially for rare diseases. And we think that those omic results are extremely informative for each person. Because each person, your blood, tells the information. You have the information in your serum, in your plasma. You have the lipids, metabolites, proteins in your serum, in your plasma, telling us what is the underlying cause. And if we can reveal that, then each patient can be matched better to the either ongoing clinical trials or newly emerging clinical trials. And that's why I think one of them is this one. And the other one is personalized medicine for rare diseases through gene therapy. If, you, if they know the mutation, if they know the gene, it is very possible that they may develop a personalized gene, approach, gene therapy approach you know, for n is equal to one patient. It may not happen now, but I think it may happen in the future. So we worked with one company in uh, Korea, 
and they have done HGF gene delivery, and not through the direct brain injection, but intrathecal injection. And initially, I did not think that it's going to work. Because intrathecal injection to the spinal cord, and we're trying to change gene expression in the cortex, uh, I don't know. But they were so interested, they were so excited, I said, okay, fine, I'm going to do the surgeries for you. So we did, we did the surgeries, you know, we did the experiments, and I was wrong. Yes, intrathecal gene, exp you know, intrathecal injection actually had an impact on the motor cortex, and it reduced osteogliosis and microgliosis. I think that's, that's phenomenal. I mean, that's pretty good. So if the major problem is osteogliosis and microgliosis, if you may not even need to do a direct cortex injection. Even intrathecal injection may work. So we don't know. But it, at least, so this study was published in Nature Gene Therapy. Uh, I think it's this year. And then we also found that um, UCHL1, another important protein, may indeed be a target to improve the health of the upper motor neurons. This again was published in Nature Gene Therapy. We had the cover for it, and there was a news written about this paper. That it may, it may be possible to develop personalized gene therapy approaches to upper motor neurons. So in our lab, we're also developing those gene therapy approaches using different viruses, different um, yeah, viral codes and different promoters and trying to understand the mutation and the underlying causes of the disease per, for each patient. So if I summarize, we are moving forward with AKV9 and clinical trials and then remind people to support, to share information and to be part of the developments. Please do. Please share the information with your friends that there is indeed a drug company out there. Support, support a, um, you know, uh, Akava Therapeutics for their efforts and visit their website. And we are revealing disease mechanisms behind the upper motor neuron loss. And we are developing high throughput drug discovery platforms using diseased upper motor neurons. That's the first in the field. We are identifying biomarkers for upper motor neurons, developing gene therapies directly to upper motor neurons, and developing personalized medicine approaches, again, to upper motor neuron disease patients. And again, the goal is to find effective and long-term cures for upper motor neuron diseases. And as you can imagine, this is a long um, road, right? Finding one FDA-approved medicine, you have all these preclinical investigations for years and years and years and years, and then if you are lucky, a company is going to license it. And then they're going to spend millions of dollars to try to develop it, try to do the toxicology studies, try to write the IND application and, you know, put the application to FDA and then you start phase one. So each of these are millions and millions of dollars of investigations, right? And then in phase one, if you're lucky, the compound of interest is not toxic. Great. Then phase two, how are you going to find those patients? How are you going to recruit them? What are the sites you're going to use? What are the biomarkers you're going to use? What is the imaging you're going to do? How much it's going to cost? So many problems. Then phase two finishes. Phase three, even a larger number of patients. How are, it's just, it's, it's daunting. It's very hard. But at least... We did not have the hope in the future, but now we do. At least there's a company who's interested. There is a compound which actually uh, will be starting phase one soon. And uh, these are the photographs that I have taken when Darius was speaking this morning. You remember they said that they formed uh, the CERN, the center, um, Centers of Excellence, and they said Research Network. So I, I think it's not really the pure research, it's mainly the clinical establishment, because here the goal is to establish centers where they can actually perform clinical trials. And this is extremely important to develop the clinical trials. We need those centers, but in the meantime, we also need to support innovation, discovery. Because if there's no innovation, no discovery, no drug uh, <coughs> candidate, you may have all the setup that you need to start clinical trials, but what compound are you going to try? So these two things need to uh, work hand in hand for us to move forward. So I congratulate my friends to establish CERN, and I hope to work with them um, closely in the future. And of course, I want to thank our amazing lab. I love everyone in the lab. We're just family. And my collaborators, I cannot thank them enough. I love my collaborators, they're my family. And fund funding comes from, uh, of course, NIH, NIA, DOD, 
Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. I'm very thankful for the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. Curious BG4 Foundation supported some of the initial work. A long swim, ALS Association, Let's Turn ALS Foundation, friends and family, philanthropy. I mean, thank you so much to, for everyone for allowing us uh, to do the research that we do. And now I call for partnership because we really don't have too much time to waste on, uh, you know, the experimental outcomes, the problems, this we, we know this, we developed the technology, we have the tools, now it's time to support, time to invest, time to join teams. Please support our lab, our research, so that we actually move faster and more effectively. And you can connect me by my email, my Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, let's get in touch. And of course, thank you Spastic Paraplegia Foundation for all everything that you do. Thank you for bringing us together and for laying a path for a better future for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. So now they also wanted me to speak a little bit about this auction item tonight. <laughs> this is... Um, this is actually a photo art that I have done. And in addition to being a scientist, I'm a photographer and I'm also a painter. I went to New York Institute of Photography and I invented a new form of painting, which we call Özdin art, and I got a trademark for it. And my brother was a painter and I was the nerd in the family. So he was the painter and he always got to do the art, but I always study math, science and whatnot. And unfortunately, he passed away. He passed away when he was 23. He had stroke. And when he died, he died in my father's arms. When he died, I was in the United States trying to do my PhD and on plant biotechnology because I wanted to generate clever plants. And my PhD, my you know, master's one was on gene um, molecular biology, genetic engineering. So I was the first person to clone a gene in Turkey. And so for me, biology was in the nucleus. And um, when he died of stroke, I realized I don't know anything about neuroscience, nothing at all. Then I said, I must study neuroscience. It's as if like if I study neuroscience, like that's my service to my brother or I don't know, but I had to study neuroscience. Then I studied my PhD in science, you know, neuroscience, cell biology, anatomy, neuroscience. And then I went to Harvard Medical School, neurosurgery, and I just started painting. It's as if, like, I had his unfinished paintings, and I just wanted to paint. And I did not know that I had a skill in painting. And um, so I invented a new form of painting because I just used needles, and uh, if I use a different chemical to make a three-dimensional structure of, in painting, then I called on someone. I said, you know, is this something... I mean, I'm just working, I'm just doing experiments, but is this, is this good? And she said, this is very good. You actually made an invention to the Ebru technique. This is three-dimensional Ebru. Nobody has done it. You should get a trademark for this. I said, I get a trademark for this? So I actually did, a, did get a trademark for it. So it's called Özdin Art. And I have a United States America, you know, patent office trademark. So I invented a new form of painting. Thank you so much. And then my husband is a musician in addition being being an engineer. So both of us, we started Art Love Science Foundation. So actually tonight he's on stage in Second City in Chicago. I'm missing his show. Uh, but he became an artist, a musician, like he, he does everything. And I only paint. <laughs> and we started Art Love Science Foundation and we sell our art and we give fellowships to students to attend conferences and so forth. And when Norma told me, uh, you know, we are having the symposium, I said, maybe I'll give you one of my paintings as a, as a gift. So I ask everyone today, please make the highest bid that you can. <laughs> please, please, please. All money is going to go to the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. And maybe we can fund the other researchers. Maybe we can fund good research. Because this, the amount of work that is being done by the foundation is remarkable and I just wanted to help as much as I could. So thank you so much for everything and for inviting me and for listening. I'm ready to ask uh, to answer your questions or maybe the questions will be at the end. I don't know, will there be questions? 
Maybe not. There will be? Yeah, I, we can take a couple questions okay. right now since All everybody's right, thank you so much. fresh thank you. in your pr presentation. And there's one all the way over here. <laughs> So my question, very excited to hear about Akava, and I actually had seen something recently on a company that sounded a little similar. So I wanted to ask you what makes Akava special or if there's other leverage. It's a company called Lucy Therapeutics, um, and their quote is that they're doing mitochondrial-based therapies for neurological diseases. And I understand, based on their website and reading up on them, they, of course, are focused on the big hitters that get more money, <laughs> like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Brett, probably maybe more Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but they said that they're focused on developing proprietary mitochondrial-based small molecule therapies and diagnostic biomarkers for the treatment of patients with complex diseases, neurological. And so I was just curious, and because they've gotten a lot of private equity funding, and you were saying about supporting Akava, if there was anything that we can really do, I mean, I know some people at one of these VC firms that funded them, yeah. but other than that, like what is, what is the ask and is there any similarities? I don't know, one, are you familiar with Lucy? And two, is there anything that could be leveraged even though that's a separate private company into helping either a Kava or people like us? Thank you so much. So uh, there are numerous companies out there who are focusing on mitochondrial diseases. Actually, Dr. Gautam is gonna talk uh, about a stealth company. So they're also interested in mitochondrial diseases. You know, I don't think Akava Therapeutics competes or are in the same pool with the mitochondrial disease. So those are mechanism focused, right? So Akava Therapeutics is basically, um, you know, upper motor neuron diseases, uh, HSP, PLS, ALS, and the compounds that emerge from Dr. Silverman's lab. And they also act on uh, different forms of cancer, right? And um, I don't think we compete with them. And we have a unique strength because this is, again, the first compound to improve the health of upper motor neurons. There has been none. And also, uh, the, the first compound that shows effectiveness in both misfolded SOD1 and TDP pathology, and those are two different and distinct entities. Normally, patients with SOD1 mutation do not have TDP pathology in their brain. So with one drug, you can actually uh, improve the health of the neurons in these two distinct mechanisms, we think that the impact may have a, uh, the impact may be much broader. And for the investment, I, if you're interested, let's talk later, because now I think the company is open for investors, and, uh, you know, there's a, there is a, you know, baseline, and, yeah, so if, if you, if you want to invest, I think this company is a good one to invest, yeah. I personally want to invest, I personally don't have the money to invest, but I, I do know VC firms, that is Please, what I do yeah. for a living. No, that's okay, yeah. <laughs> and of course, I have to disclose, I am the, uh, in the scientific advisory board, I'm, I'm the head of the scientific advisory board, so, you know, I have conflict. I, I think it's good because, you know, some of it is my science, but, um, of course, the data speaks for itself. Okay, we have a question in the middle. I'm on my way. <laughs> I didn't think anybody else was going to ask about the company. Um, I Googled it while you were talking. What you had on the screen was AKAVA Therapeutics. Mm -hmm. I did it, and then I found AKEBIA Therapeutics. It seemed like it was the same company, but they didn't no, say... It's, it's not. It's not. A, it's a different company. It said something about kidneys and. No, it's not. It's a different company. Fine. Then I, I got in the right direction. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Hey, uh, we got a question from some of our viewers who are watching online. So they sent us a question via the chat box, and we're going to have it asked by Greg back here. Well, one of the questions is asking to show the slide again, uh, showing the NU9 results. But while Kira is trying to find that, another question, Dr. O, is what is the difference between phase one and phase two trials? And again, that's from one of our, one of our virtual watchers. Yes, I may not be able to show uh, the NU9 results uh, 
because some, some of them are unpublished, but the ones that are published shows uh, that there is improvement in mitochondrial integrity, reduction in protein aggregation, improvement in cytoarchitectural dynamics, and improvement in axon outgrowth. And what is the difference between phase one and phase two? This is a very important question, because phase one usually um, looks for uh, toxicology, pharmacokinetics, and it is performed in healthy um, people uh, just to see if the drug would have any side effects or would have any toxicity. So usually in phase one, we don't recruit uh, patients. In phase two, you begin to recruit patients, especially in our study. And for that, uh, we need to have, again, pharmacokinetic biomarkers or clinical or imaging biomarkers uh, to investigate whether treatment improves uh, the condition and improves the health of the upper motor neurons. So the phase two is uh, mainly effic effic efficacy and mainly uh, you know, response to treatment. But phase one is basically, uh, is it toxic or not? Thank you. And the, the slide the, the uh, person is asking for, Kira, I think is the very first slide that we had for Dr. O's presentation, if that's possible. Yeah, the slides will be made available so they can look at that time. I can't. I can't okay. Enough. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Oh, are there any other questions? Do we have another question? Oh, we do. And, and that's okay, because we can ask more later. I don't know. Do we have enough time for Mukesh? I don't want to take his time. No, I think we're okay. I think we're ready to, we can move on and we can ask some more questions a little bit later. Yeah, all right. Okay, okay. so, okay, thank you. <laughs> so I want to introduce Dr. Gautam uh, as a speaker. Uh, he is a research assistant professor at the Department of Neurology of, uh, at Northwestern. He's been in my lab for 10 years now. We actually celebrated his 10 years at Northwestern last week. And he has done an amazing job in, in 10 years. And today he's going to tell you about uh, a mechanism-focused drug discovery and how that may be uh, important for upper motor neuron diseases. Thank you so much. Presentation. Oh, yes. Do you want to stand to the side a little bit? Yeah. And she was doing? Or do you want to stand back here? Yeah, like this that? is good. Okay, we'll get this done. And green, will yeah, green is forward. Green is go. Yes, All right. You. you ready to go? Yes. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, thank you, Hande. Um, I would really like to thank the foundation for giving me this opportunity. This is my very first time here, certainly not the last, and I really am very glad to be here in this uh, in the presence of all, all of you. I would also really like to thank the foundation, and I'm really honored to um, have been awarded the, the uh, our grant proposal has been awarded today morning. And I hope we bring more uh, cellular understanding into PLS with that money that we receive from the grant. So thank you so very much. Um, So as Dr. Osdenler uh, explained in great detail about the upper motor neurons, uh, our lab is heavily invested into upper motor neuron research. And I will be talking about the TDP43 pathology and then how this affects upper motor neurons and then what can we do to improve the health of upper motor neurons via these two uh, molecules that we work with, the SVT272 and cardiolipin nanoparticles. Um, upper motor neuron, as you know, are very important. They reside in the motor cortex in the brain and then um, make the connection with the spinal cord. And they degenerate in ALS, HSP, and PLS. But um, this piece of information mostly comes from the ALS research where 97% of the uh, ALS patients, both familial and sporadic, they display TDP43 pathology. And then the new research is coming out that also shows here that TDP43 pathology is also present in ALS and HSP, I'm oh, sorry, HSP and PLS patients as well. Um, this is another example where uh, uh, TDP43 aggregates had been uh, detected in the uh, HSP patient. So why TDP43 is so important and what does it do? TDP43 protein, it, it usually lives in the nucleus but in the disease condition, it migrates into the cytoplasm and then aggregate. 
So wh what does it do when it aggregates or it come out of the nucleus? Um, it, they make aggregates and then they stuck in the cell. It predominantly affects the uh, RNA metabolism, uh, different aspects of RNA metabolism, um, and then the metabolism per se. And most importantly, TDP43 affects the mitochondria function. And how or what kind of mitochondria function? Um, TDP43, especially in the disease condition, it binds to mitochondria or in, enters into mitochondria. And then it affects so many function of the mitochondria that includes the ATP generation through the electron transport chain and then the um, a mitochondrial pore and how the, the mitochondrial DNA is, is uh, maintained. So TDP43 is one protein, but it affects so many functions that are very vital for the cell survival. And, but what do we do? How do we study it? And as uh, Dr. Osdilla mentioned in the earlier presentation that we have this uh, reporter mouse model where the upper motor neurons are green. And using that tool to study how the TDP43 affects the upper motor neuron, we generated this mouse model where we crossbreed the TDP mouse with the GFP mouse and we come up with TDP GFP mouse. And then we have done extensive characterization of this mouse and you can see here that the upper motor neurons, they progressively degenerate and we can quantify them by looking at the a GFB expression. Um, again, because we had GFB in these neurons, then we, it gives us the ability to delve more deep into that individual neuron. And we've done extensive electron microscopy studies. And electron microscopy, so for example, the, the top panel cells where you see green or red cells, they are zoomed maybe say 20 times. Uh, but in the electron microscope, it gives us uh, this uh, capability to, to zoom them even more. And the images that you sh see down, uh, the black and white ones, are zoomed maybe like uh, you know, 49,000 times. And you are only able to see them when you go that deep. Now you can see that individual mitochondria here in the top two panels, um, E and F. The mitochondria in the upper motor neuron in a, in a wild type healthy mouse looks just nice, perfect, and in non-CSMN cell also look good. But in the, C, uh, sorry, CSMN here we use um, for upper motor neuron for mouse. And in the mouse upper motor neuron, which was disease because of TDF43 pathology, you see the mitochondria looks really in bad shape. They lose their inner mitochondrial membrane, they aggregate and make all these clumps and which, which affects their functional ability. Uh, and then we went, we, we had access to the patient tissue from, that had TDP43 pathology and we performed similar experiments uh, using that tissue. Uh, upper motor neuron, as they are called, bad cells also. Um, uh, and the electron microscopic studies, you can see here the normal control mitochondria look better as compared to the one that you see with TDP43 pathology that the mitochondria, their outer mitochondrial membrane it, it looks intact, but the inner mitochondrial membrane is completely gone and they look like ghosts. And when there is no inner mitochondrial membrane, mitochondria just cannot function its own function like you know the ATP generation or anything else that it's supposed to do. And there's an, so another example that it, in terms of mitochondria, what we see in the mouse, we exactly saw the same thing in the patient as well. And this is another example. So uh, a, a, a upper motor neuron extends the apical dendrite. And we have seen in different mouse models of ALS here that the apical dendrites are disintegrated, as you can see in the panel A. And we see exactly the same thing in the human um, upper motor neuron apical dendrite. And that shows that this, the, the pattern of degeneration or the pathology that we see in the, at the cellular level is pretty much the same in mouse and, and in human patients. And that kind of tells us that if something that we do to help, 
improve the health of mitochondria or upper motor neuron in mouse, we assume that it would be it would be kind of equally effective if we do it in the you know, patients as well. And it, so the previous slides that I've shown you were from um, symptomatic mouse models where they already had symptoms of the disease. Mm -hmm. In this one, we, we, try, we wanted to see if we see these massive mitochondrial defects, when they appear, how early do they, we are, are we able to see them? Mm -hmm. And for, so the, the mouse studies that I've shown earlier were done at P60, that's 60 days after the birth of mouse until later. In this one, we use the upper motor neuron from 15 days old mouse babies. And those mice, they do not show any symptom of the disease. But looking at those mitochondria by electron microscopy, you can see that they kind of start showing the symptom that, that later become even worse. And here, in the, if you see in the very last uh, figure Im image that's F, it's, it appears exactly like what we saw earlier, that outer mitochondrial membrane is intact, but everything is, that was inside is gone. And so what is there inside the mitochondria this way? It, it's a, in, in the mitochondria, we called it crystal structured mitochondrial membrane, we can call, call them generally. They are made of uh, phospholipid bilayer. But one molecule is very important in the crista structure, and that's called cardiolipin. Cardiolipin is a, is a, a lipid molecule which has one head, they call it phospholipid head, mm -hmm. and then it has got two tails that are the fatty acid tails. Because of its unique structure, it allows the membrane to fold. As you can see in the uh, figure image number one, that when this membrane is folding, at the fold, this cardiolipin is sitting. And so if there was no cardiolipin, this membrane wouldn't fold, and then it would not make the crystal structure. That's, that's very vital for the mitochondrial function. And so and IMM here, I mean the inner mitochondrial membrane. And so cardiolipin is very important not only for making the, the structure of the um, inner mitochondrial membrane, but also for the function, because all the proteins that are, that are important for the mitochondrial function are embedded in the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane, mm -hmm. and they are held together by the, the cardiolipin. So it helps in the ATP generation, and it, it, mitochondria, because mitochondria needs to divide uh, for its, uh, you know, to, to meet the energy need. It help, it, it's important for that as well. And, um, for the mitophagy and all the important mitochondrial functions. So what can we do now here? Can we do something that can improve the health or, or that can improve the, the inner mitochondrial membrane? And we have, I'll be talking about these two stories today. That's one is about SBT272, and the other one which I'm currently working right now is the cardiolipin nanoparticles. Um, so for the first one, the SBD272, we collaborate with this company in Boston called Stealth Biotherapeutics, and that's a company that, that uh, work in the space of mitochondria therapies. And they have this compound that's called SBD272, and this compound, um, the, their initial experiment, the company that suggests that it binds to cardiolipin, in mitochondria and it stabilizes this molecule. When the, because in the disease condition, when the, the, the cardiolipin molecule starts to disintegrate, then it eventually ends up into disintegrating the whole set of, um, whole mitochondria. So SVT272 um, binds with the um, cardiolipin and it just stabilizes the cardiolipin function. So we started to work with this company, and they have, the company had already done this work, showing they injected the um, SVD272 in a, in a mouse model that had mitochondrial um, you know, defect, and injection of this, or giving uh, SVD272, rescued the mitochondrial defect. And so we asked what, what would SVD272 do if we were to test it in our system, and it, 
would improve the inner mitochondrial integri membrane integrity and in turn my mitochondria function and motility. And in general, as a whole, it would improve the function of upper motor neuron both in vitro and in vivo. And so we started to work uh, using the TDP43 mouse, as I showed that the TDP43 is very important for mitochondria function. And for this study, we've used the mouse, this TDP GFP mouse at two time points, uh, P3 and P120. P3 is the three days old babies. Uh, we isolate um, those green neurons from these babies, put them in a culture dish, and then study. And at P120 for the the mouse itself, that in vivo study, where we inject the mouse with the compound and then see what happens. Um, you can see that in both of these mice, the TDP43 is expressed, so that's like a valid mouse model that we could study. And in the dish, in the culture dish, when you put these neurons in culture dish, this is how they look. The panel H is from a wild type mouse, and so it's a normal neuron, we don't see any TDP43 expression here, but in the eye you can see the red one is the TDP43 that, that lives in the um, nucleus. And this is um, a cool experiment, I would call it very, lab very labor intensive though, is the um, electron microscopy on a cultured neuron. Um, so we culture this neuron in a dish and in panel A and A prime you can see that there are so, the dish is kind of edged with numbers so we identify the, the neuron of our interest where it is sitting. In this one it is sitting close to this letter A and, and then there is one green cell and one non-green cell. What I do for this experiment is that I chop off everything that's around it. So in the, the final analysis, only the, the neuron that is green goes for the imaging. And so the results, it shows that in, in the top panel B, which is the, the neuron from a wild type or healthy mouse, and you can see there are a lot many mitochondria and, and their inner mitochondrial membranes look very good. But in the C, that is the neuron that's coming from the diseased neuron uh, from TDP43. And you can see that their, their outer membrane is still intact, but inner membrane started to show some defects. And, and these are like three days old mice. They are, they, mouse as such does not have any phenotype as at this age, but the neuron started to show this. When these neurons in the dish were treated with SPT272, you, we see that the, the degradation or the degeneration of the inner mitochondrial membrane is protected and that is seen here in the D and D prime. And we have quantified them. In, in the diseased one also, the mitochondria kind of come together and clump that we see after the treatment is gone or reduced uh, and we don't see that very much in the wild type. A uh, little more um, zoomed out images here, zoomed in images here from the disease and when they were treated with SVT272. So after these results, we, we got the confidence that, you know, in, in the culture dish, it looks like this is working, helping. It, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And so we, we did more experiment to see what is happening with the mitochondria. Their structure is get, getting better, but are their functions getting better as well? And this is a, an experiment where we call it like mitochondrial polarization function. And when the mitochondrial membranes, especially the inner membranes, when they have charge on them, the polarity, it means they, they are functioning, they are making ATPs. Um, and in the A, which is the TDP or the sick neurons without um, drug, they, they have less polarization, but when they were treated with the drug, the, the polarity is uh, greater than what was seen without the drug. So that also shows that this compound not only is helping with the structure of the mitochondrial membrane, but also with the function. And in this one, um, We've stained these neurons after and before the treatment with the, a marker for mitochondria to see where the mitochondria are located. And then the disease neuron that you see in the panel A that in, in the neurite or in the, in the axon, you don't see many mitochondria or whatever are there very faint. And even in the, in the cell body, there are not many. But after the treatment and in the panel B, you can see that in the cell body as well as in their Excellent, there are a lot many mitochondria present here now. 
And so that, that indicates that their motility is also increased after the treatment. And, and then we did like a, a series of experiments to see at what concentration the SBT272 would work and the other dr drugs that are approved for ALS um, treatment, Ederwan and Emelix, how do they stand as compared to SBT272? And, and we also, so in terms of, in the previous one, in terms of you know, the uh, exon extension and, and the arborization, that's the measure of the, the neuronal health. And these results suggest that um, SBT272 is most effective at the 100 nanomolar concentration, and it is better than, it, it works better than both the other drugs that we have seen. Oh. Oh. And so we've, so after the, the initial in vitro experiment, we started giving this drug to these mice starting at P60, and we continued it until P120 for every day for um, 60 days. And at P120, we, we did this experiment to see how the neurons in the brain look like in a mouse, not in a dish now. And in the, as you can see, this C, panel C is the control mouse. It was healthy mouse. D was a diseased mouse. And E and F, these uh, motor cortex images are coming from, the E and F images are coming from mice that were treated with SBT272, two doses of it, one milligram per kilogram and five milligram per kilogram. Um, and the quantification here, and it shows that uh, the, the graph G, you can see that the, the number of uh, upper motor neuron in this, the brain of these mice at both the doses were better than what were with the vehicle treated mice. And the other indication in the brain is the, the gliosis. So when the neurons are dying, the, they have, they're, they're, there comes the, the astrocytes and microglia. And in, so again, here you can see in the figure D, in the, in the image D, there are these purple astrocytes and the red microglia, and you can see how many there are in the number, but in the treated mouse, those numbers are reduced significantly and they are quantified in HNI. So up to here, uh, the sum, I can summarize that TD, uh, the SBT272 improves the structure of inner mitochondrial membrane. It improves the mitochondrial function in upper motor neuron, mitochondrial motility in the upper motor neuron, and also the overall health of upper motor neurons. And it provides neuroprotection that it, it helps those neurons to just stay there, do not degenerate, and reduces the astrogliosis and microgliosis. So that's, that's the one compound that we tested. Now I'm, I'm currently working on the other modality to, to help the same thing, but in a, in a different way. And that is the using high density lipid nanoparticles um, to, to deliver cardiolipin to disease neurons. Um, high, density nano, liquid, uh, high density lipid nanoparticles are a very special class of nanoparticles. Um, they, so there, there is a scaffold around which this nanoparticle is, is designed, and in the center there is a gold particle, 10, nano, 10 nanometer gold nanoparticle, and then around which with the um, lipid scaffold and then the different lipid molecules. The beauty of this nanoparticle is that it specifically binds to cells that express the, this one receptor that's called SRB1. And when we know that this nanoparticle, even if you inject it, it's not going to go and bind everywhere and then give you off-target effect. It's going to go and bind to those specific cells that are expressing this SRB1 uh, uh, receptors. And so to see, does a pronotal neuron express SRB1? Otherwise, what's the use of using these nanoparticles? And so we've done the experiment uh, both in mouse and in the uh, normal controlled human um, and we see that in the GFP cells in the top panel are expressing this red SRB1. And also in the, the human brain, the bad cells are, that are expressing this MAP2 in green are also expressing SRB1. And so that gives us the confidence that yes, if we treat the cells with this uh, nanoparticle, uh, it would at least go and bind to those cells. And 
So these nanoparticles, this is like one proof of concept kind of experiment where nanoparticles are loaded with these lipids and when they were, the cells were treated with these nanoparticles, the lipid content was transferred to the cell and this experiment shows that. And in this experiment, exactly how we did for SVT272 was here, I uh, cultured the upper motor neuron from a TDP mouse at P3 and then treated them with nanoparticle, the 10 nano, uh, this was like, um, we did a series to see what the concentration is best and uh, one and five works the best in this case. And in the, in the panel, in the right panel, two images, you can see that after the treatment, these neurons look much healthier than the TDP neurons um, with, without the treatment. And to do the further study, this is still like ongoing study, but I'm going, I'm showing you the preliminary results here. And again, you know, we have this TDP GFP mouse, and then we started this nanoparticle treatment at P60 because P60 is the time when this mouse starts showing some symptoms. And we gave them this nanoparticle um, a treatment 500 nanomolar two times a week uh, for 120 days, that's 60 days, and then try to see what happens in their brain. Um, and here are the results that in, in wild type looks good. TDP43 without treatment has less neurons and a lot more astrocytes and microglia, but after the treatment, it looks much better. The, the neuro, neurons are not degenerating as much, and also there is a reduction in the astrogliosis and the microgliosis. And so uh, to put everything together, what we've done is that the upper motor neurons with TDP43 pathology, they display prominent mitochondrial defects that we have seen by electron microscopy. And the, the translation is actually is at the cellular level that the neurons uh, do uh, behave similarly and degenerate in a similar fashion. And improving the integrity of inner mitochondrial membrane is very important for mitochondria function and improved in um, uh, inner mitochondrial membrane integrity result into improved health of upper motor neurons both in vivo, in vitro, and they also reduction in the astrogliosis and microgliosis. And with that, I thank you all very much. And I would like to thank, uh, you know, my amazing lab members and um, Dr. Shad Thaxton at the Lurie Cancer Center at Northwestern, who, who developed these nanoparticle treatments, and uh, Dr. Hatim and Marty from Stealth Biotherapeutics. And not, uh, I mean, lastly but not least, uh, Dr. Hande Osdindler who's been my mentor and support and guide for all this while. Um, and I thank you very much. Hey, doctor, let's see if we have any questions from the crowd. Do we have any questions real quick? Real quick, it's okay. Oh, here's one right here. Um, so the TBP43 mouse, that protein's only expressed in the upper motor neurons and no other cells, and there's no other mit uh, mitochondria effect in any of the other cells. Um, so the protein is expressed in all the cells, it, even in the normal person as well. And, but in the diseased, uh, it, it dysregulates in the neurons that degenerate, but not in the other cells. And so in our studies, we've seen that the mitochondrial defects that we see are mostly in the neurons that degenerate and not in the cells that are surrounding them and th that are not degenerating. And no other cells in the, in the body of the mouse yes. at all. Yes, yeah, that's it's, what we... I just find it curious that something that's so ubiquitous as a mitochondrion is affected only in that one type of cell by that defect. Yes, yeah, that's... Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Wow. Okay, everybody, this will go. Doctor, thank you very, very much, sir. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Okay, guys, we're going to take a break. We're going to give you a 20 minute break, and then we're going to set for our panel discussion. We have questions that you had placed on our board out front. We have questions from people out in virtual world, okay? And you can ask some live questions in person, too. So take a break for a little bit. We're going to set up and get ready to go. We'll see you in a little while.
Good afternoon again, and as you know, we've taken a little bit of a break here. Yesterday we had the opportunity to talk to Vamsey about his book and some life experience, and as we closed that we were uh, hurrying to get to something else, Vamsey, and we didn't get to allow you to finish. You were sharing uh, concerning some drug repurposing and, and those kinds of issues. So if you would finish sharing about that so we don't lose that, and then we'll let you take a break as well. Sure, sure. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Greg. Yeah, so um, continuing uh, with our conversation from yesterday, I wanted to touch upon two points. One is uh, awareness of uh, HSP. You saw, uh, everybody saw the videos um, that was uh, presented to uh, Meditator Solutions, the company that I work for. And uh, that is uh, specifically uh, designed for rare disease uh, day to create awareness of a rare disease. In this case, is HSP. And uh, the other uh, project uh, that I was working on uh, is uh, with a company called as Every Cure as part of our social innovation lab where the company is dedicated uh, for repurposing the drugs. So there are currently 3,000 uh, federal, um, uh, uh, you know, FDA-approved drugs, and every cure's mission is to uh, repurpose uh, the drugs. Uh, the existing repurpose, uh, repurposing of the drugs uh, that were stopped uh, at phase two and phase three of the studies. Uh, so that's an exciting uh, opportunity uh, for me, apart uh, from what I do uh, at, at Medidata. So the overall purpose is not to reinvent the entire wheel uh, for the rare diseases, but to use um, uh, you know the existing drugs that are already sitting on the shelves uh, to uh, see if we can use it for the existing rare disease to cut short uh, the, you know, the, the invention of the uh, medicine. And that's an important goal because anything that gets us there to a treatment that helps any of these symptoms or hopefully a cure, the, the possible repurposing of drugs is something that obviously we're interested in and glad to know that's happening and being examined in, another, in a number of places. So, Vamsey, thank you for sharing that with us. Sorry we got cut off a little quickly yesterday, but we no appreciate problem. you coming back again sure. to, thank this you. afternoon. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. We're going we're to take a break here, 15 to 20 minutes, and then we're going to come back again with our uh, panel discussion and questions for all of our doctors. We have received sub-questions from some of you guys who are listening. Please feel free to try to get us additional questions, and if we can get those questions, we'll try to get those before the doctor. So take a break with us for 15 or 20 minutes, and we'll see you back in just a few.
We're glad you're here. This is a really big uh, event coming up right now. I want to quickly remind you that you've heard a lot of words and verbiage from all of these great people up here through all of their presentations. And sometimes we don't know what some of these uh, scientific words means. In all your handouts, we had a little thing called words to know. Okay, a little booklet of stuff like that, a little reference, okay, you might want to have to thumb through if you go, uh, I'm not sure what that word really means. So remember, keep that close by, there'll be a test later, okay, <laughs> and so just be ready for that because you can't graduate without passing this test, okay. So what we're going to start off with is uh, there, a lot of you guys posed some questions out on our, our Q&A board out in the lobby. We're going to start off with Greg, uh, the president of the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. He's going to start off with a question there. We're going to let our, our distinguished panel uh, all fight it out up here to answer the question correctly. Okay, and then uh, when they win $200, we move on to the next round. Okay, and then we're gonna work the room too. So we're gonna be watching for hands and stuff. We're gonna kind of go back and forth. So here we go, Greg Pruitt. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Hello. Uh, flip your switch up. Hello, hello. Coming up, stand by. Stand by, here we go. The on switch matters. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Tim. Uh, one quick correct correction. This first question is not to be fought out. There were a couple of questions that a specific name was written on. So I'm going to start out with one of those. This one is for Dr. Oscar. If the nerves die back, are there any ways to make them regrow and find the right targets? That's a very good question. Um, now HSP or other neurodegenerative diseases, we're talking about neurodegeneration. So, and most of them are adult onset, although we see a lot of uh, HSPs now have the, you know, the, the child onset. So in adult, the central nervous system is difficult to regenerate. And that has been shown in numerous studies and has been a lot of effort in promoting regeneration for the adult nerves, especially in the spinal cord injury field. That's a huge field. A lot of people are trying different approaches to boost or to augment the regeneration of the injured spinal cord, including CST, which is the cortical spinal tract, which is one of the most notorious regenerated tracts or axons from the CNS. So a lot of things were learned from spinal cord injury field that you can actually help the regeneration of the axons, help them to regenerate and then find a target. <laughs> And this is a continuous effort, actually, using gene therapies, small compound, as well as activity-based therapies to boost up the regeneration of the degenerative nerves. So the answer is yes, but the effort is continuous, and we are trying to find a way to regenerate it and to make it find the right target. So that's my answer for it. I like that answer. Any, anyone want to add anything to that? All right, the next question. Have the gloves which have helped those with Parkinson's disease ever been tried on people with HSP or PLS? The gloves which have helped those with Parkinson's diseases. The person who wrote that question in here wanted to de define or, or say anything else about that? Raise your hand if you're here so I can find you. I see your hand, hang on, we're coming. We saw this on the Today Show a few months ago, and it was an amazing presentation. They had these gloves that were used on people with Parkinson's. At that time, it was a clinical trial. But uh, there was this one man in particular who could barely walk, he, similar to what most of us walk like now. <clears throat> and he started using the gloves, and after a few months, he was <laughs> running a marathon. It was just absolutely amazing. And they said that um, the clinical trial was just about over and it was going to be used for the public soon. And it was at Stanford University. That's right, Stanford University. <laughs> just wondered if you'd heard anything about it or had any input on that. Is this working? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, that, that was a very small trial. I think we're still, because I'm, Parkinson's is one of my specialties. Uh, they're, um, they're looking more into that. Um, you know, again, it was a very small number of people who really showed benefit. Uh, to say whether something like that is being used in HSP, there's certainly uh, are, and we've been approached by some companies that want to do what we, uh, like sleeves, you know, you can put sleeves on the legs to stimulate them. Um, we haven't started any of those trials, but we've talked to companies about doing them. So there might be, a role for those types of interventions in HSP. I don't know if they've been done extensively, but we are talking to at least one company about doing them, again, specifically sleeves. Though at least initially they asked us, they were only gonna do it on one side. Uh, and we didn't know how beneficial that would be for people. Uh, so I think the idea of some kind of sleeve or glove that does some kind of stimulation, it has some potential. Um, but again, it's important to remember, Parkinson's is a very different type, uh, a different type of muscle tone abnormality. It's rigidity rather than spasticity. So they're, they're different, but you know, certainly if there's something that's real, that ends up being really promising in a disease like Parkinson's, um, you know, certainly it's, it's the kind of thing that could be tried in HSP as well, because the risk is quite low. If, it, if you have any adverse effects, you just take it off, or, and, and that makes it relatively safe. So certainly if there was anything that showed dramatic effects, it's something we could think about trying for HSP. Uh, yeah, up is on. Hello? Yeah, there thank we you. Go. Well, I can't speak to the glove, but uh, I talked. Uh, I do know it. The, what I understand um, is that it uses a uh, electrical stimulation of the muscles, and uh, I know that in in, in a couple of uh, rehabilitation centers, there are um, a, you know uh, that transcutaneous stimulation of muscles is part of the therapy. Uh, program and so, for example, they'll put uh, patches on the legs that stimulate the muscles, and then engage the person in bicycling maneuvers or in a suspended treadmill walking. So they'll be stimulating the muscles while they're asking the person to engage in a task. And I know that um, that it's been done here. Uh, uh, individuals that are attending this conference have used it. Um, and their hands or their arms while they're doing certain activities. This is to stimulate the muscles while they're engaged in activities. And so it's, it's part of an emerging process. Um, whether it has long-term benefit or short-term benefit, it's still not, not clear. Okay, what is your feeling about hyperbaric oxygen therapy for HSP and PLS? Have heard that some HSP uh, patients have been helped by this treatment. Uh, well, I've heard the same thing, probably from the same people. <laughs> and, uh, and the results that have been reported, described, are remarkable. Now, uh, so I've heard that. I can't recommend it because I'm limited to recommend, and this goes for many recommendations. I and we are generally it, uh, limited to making recommendations for treatment for things that are of published, peer-reviewed, uh, efficacy and safety. And so uh, there, there's things that might help some people, but unless it's been published peer-reviewed, I can't recommend it. I can't recommend for or against it. I can't say it's a bad idea or it's a good idea. I, I really have to be neutral on it. Now, um, if you asked me if I predicted that it would help, I, I don't see how it would help, but I can't argue against the fact that uh, more than one person who's participated in it has found benefit. And now, so, um, it's a safe procedure. You know, it's a safe procedure. Is it, and it's not inexpensive, but it is a safe procedure. And um, so, uh, that's all I can say. It has some anecdotal evidence that for some people it has been beneficial. Um, the people that this is a complicated thing. The people that say it works, how many people have tried it and had no benefit? Those voices, to me, are silent. I only hear the positive outcomes. But I'm, I'm, I'm neutral as far as recommending it, but aware that it has some, that, that for some people it has benefit. And, and just to go on a bit, nothing works for everybody. You know, Ampira helps some people with multiple sclerosis, but only a minority. 
And so the majority of people have no benefit, but for those people that it works for, it helps. So I can't, that's a short answer. Can I say something? Sure. Remember, this actually goes back to the complexity of this uh, disease mechanisms, and people develop the disease due to different mechanisms. And if, for example, oxidative stress is one of the underlying causes, and then the, those patients would actually show, in my opinion, um, more improved outcome than, let's say, to patients who develop the disease due to axonal defects, you know, because it's, their problem has nothing to do with oxygen. And that's why we may have this um, mixed uh, response, like, you know, not all patients are going to um, give the same outcome. And if we can correlate this outcome to biomarkers, it would actually help us greatly in the future because then we will say you have this biomarker, so most likely you develop the disease due to ox you know, oxidative stress, so you may respond to this treatment better than others. I think uh, we, we need correlative analysis between biomarkers and uh, outcomes. Greg, we have a question in the back. I've got two questions. Does any of this have anything to do with not being able to find your words when you're talking? You know, just simple words and you can't find that word. Does any of this have anything to do with something like that? <laughs> Is this in, uh, is this in um, HSP or PLS or? PLS. Well, okay, so. Uh, Hello? Yeah, yeah so um, that is a, you know, word finding is a very nonspecific symptom. It could be related to fatigue, mm -hmm. age, medication, stress, yeah. anxiety, all, many, many things. Gotcha. And so I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't immediately attribute that symptom mm -hmm. to HSP or PLS and say it's all part of the same thing. Okay. And that's a bigger question, a bigger issue. That is, when a person has a symptom, every well, I don't care. Let's say uh, there's pain in the toe or there's mm -hmm. there's word finding. Whatever the symptom is, it has to be judged on its own. It has to be evaluated for what what could cause it, independent of other conditions in the body. Gotcha. So we wouldn't automatically assume. That it's related. Right. Okay. That's how. Okay. I, that's a short answer. I do have a, another question. If one has been told after, you know, you you have MS, you have ALS, you've got HSP, you've got this, that, and the other, and then finally you uh, get diagnosed with PLS, 17, 18 years ago. So, the, you know, the legs don't work, but the hands work. There's really no, you know, maybe some swallowing stuff, but nothing's going on with the voice. What is the next step if that person might not have PLS? I mean, yeah, as you can see, the, and I, Dr. Mitsumoto mentioned that during his talk, one of the challenges of PLS is that often people get the diagnosis after sort of being ruled out for all these other things. Uh, so I think that usually as part of the diagnosis, you know, you've gone through all these other things and they've ultimately been ruled out. Mm -hmm. And you say, right now I've got this diagnosis of PLS. I think if any new or unusual symptoms appeared or something, they might go back and retake a look. But I think if, if it stayed like upper motor neuron in sort of the pattern that's expected, you usually wouldn't have a, a whole, you know, you usually wouldn't start another search for a cause. But certainly if anything new came up that didn't seem to fit with PLS, it would definitely be worth taking a, a new look. Uh, but again, I don't think that you would do that just a, after a certain number of years. Usually, as you said, a lot of people start out in the past, people used to always get this MS diagnosis, and mm -hmm. many of us that see HSP patients will ask specifically, did you have any relatives, you know, older relatives with right. MS? Because back then they didn't have good ways to diagnose it, and almost like CP for kids, people just got that diagnosis and huh. it was wrong. Uh, but now there's much better diagno di diagnostic uh, testing. So I think that in most cases, if you've gone through a lot of it, detailed workup and your symptoms have been stable or, or changing in the way you'd expect for PLS, you wouldn't need to go back and start any new testing. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Greg, back to you. 
Okay, this is a call. This is a call from one of our virtual listeners. Uh, is there any new research on dominant SPG7 or the reason why it seems to be dominant for some people? That, that is puzzling. I mean, as, as you know, I mean, as people in the audience know, it's mostly recessive. But we've de I think we've all seen, I've certainly seen, I imagine John has too, we've definitely seen patients <coughs> that have a, a manifestation of, of HSP with just one abnormal allele. Um, and in many cases, I don't think, at least in my, in my experience, I can't explain why some people have it dominant uh, and others don't, you know, because uh, as you might imagine, if you have recessive, you know, the typical recessive SPG7, then, you, you know, you've got parents who, who have, are essentially dominant for it, and they don't, often don't have any symptoms. Uh, I, I can just say that we, we've certainly seen it. I don't think we have a good molecular explanation for why. It's just often if we see somebody with sort of the typical features of SPG7, um, and, and, they're, um, and, they're, and they have a dominant mutation, and then nothing else, I, I think we all kind of think that that's, that's the most likely diagnosis. Um, I don't know that there's any research specifically looking at the dominant forms versus the recessive forms, or if there's a potentially different mechanism. I mean, as, as many of you know, that, that's one of the mitochondrial um, uh, HSPs. It's very clearly mitochondrial. But to my knowledge, there's not any, any obvious um, changes at the cell level that explains you know, uh, why some people get dominant, why some people get recessive. It's probably the type of thing we should look into more. Um, there's a lot known about SPG7, though, in general, uh, in terms of how it functions, the organelle that's affected, and that's certainly, as, as many of you know, uh, quite a common one. Um, but I have to admit, in my own experience, it's been a puzzle to me, but why we see some with dominant, and, and but although the vast majority have recessive uh, presentations, but we do see that with other HSPs also. It, you know, SPG7 is not the only only one. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a good explanation for why some people seem to have dominant and, and others don't when maybe if you looked at the mutation, you might predict that they could. There could be other factors involved, but at least to my knowledge, I don't know if it, it, that we've identified any at this point. Uh, I'll maybe add one facet, which is, uh, so in the pediatric age group, we also see cases where we um, are relatively sure about the clinical diagnosis of a recessive form of HSP, but we only find one mutation. So it's a similar situation. And and I, I always think to myself that we're probably missing the second mutation because none of our tests are perfect. So I think in these cases where the clinical picture is clear, you have one mutation, you're missing the second mutation, it's worth going back and to do um, uh, nowadays long read sequencing to see if there is uh, a second mutation that was just overlooked on the testing we have available clinically. So I think we I can't give you a number, but I would I would I would think that that's probably an explanation, a substantial subset of these cases. Yeah, and just to follow up that, um, Darius, and at least one person with SPG7 who has only one identified mutation, subsequent deep sequencing, the long read sequencing, did identify a second mutation. So. That person initially was thought to have just one mutation, and therefore was thought to be dominant form. And then later, um, with additional analysis, was shown to have another mutation, two mutations, so now it's actually recessive. However, uh, single copy mutation in SPG7 is pretty common. I mean, not as common as the recessive forms, but uh, it's not, it, we see it uh, not infrequently. And, almost, and none of those people have the deep sequencing yet. That, but, but we are capable of doing that, and that would be a good thing for us to do. That's an interesting discussion because, you know, those of us who read and study and think a little bit about what you guys deal with all the time have been under the impression that certain SPG numbers were all recessive or all dominant. So that's an interesting... Uh, a small list um, that... Uh, Dr. Stavannan has put together, and it's, uh, I think, eight or ten uh, separate types of HSP that could be transmitted either as dominant or recessive. SPG7, SPG11, I think, REAP1 maybe? I don't know. This different presentation, but, but I, I, there, I can't name them all, but there's, a, um, there's a, a small list. Well, if you say that there are eight or ten on that list, it might be 10% of the total type, so that's not an insignificant number. And I don't, I, yeah, so it, it's, it's something we can start to look at by deep sequencing. 
Hey, Greg, I got a question from the audience back here, right behind you. Here you go, sir. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, PLS, classic symptoms, classic progression, but I've never had genetic testing for HSP. Should I? I can I can uh, jump in. I'm not a PLS expert because you know I I, I treat children and 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 it's uh, predominantly not a pediatric disease. So, but I, my my um, inclination would be to say yes. Um, one because, uh, and I don't oversee the PLS literature well, but I think um, there haven't been exhaustive investigations in terms of genetics. I think there are new things one can look at now. So I would say from a re uh, from a science perspective, from a research perspective, absolutely, and I think from a clinical perspective also, I think um, I, I would I would pursue that now, um, and I, I sort of broaden that answer a little bit to other conditions. I think there are so many in the pediatric age groups. There are so many things that can look like um, uh, HSP, um, or there are so many mimics of HSP that uh, really genetic testing is essential. Um, oh. So everybody that has PLS should get genetic testing. Is that kind of? I'm going to I'm going to jump in. Uh, this is point counterpoint. We're going to give. A, I don't think there's a should. Okay. I'm going to back off on the word should. It's not what we would consider actionable intelligence. Right. To get the yeah. testing is not going to be tied to therapy, and so right now, there's a label, a diagnostic label. PLS is a diagnostic label. HSP is also a diagnostic label that often in HSP and less often in PLS is associated with molecular gene you know, identification. But about 6%, something like that, of PLS subjects have identified gene mutations. Oh. And so there, it's not common, okay? Whereas about 60-something percent of HSP subjects, not 100%, 60 plus percent have identified mutations. Only about 6% of people with PLS have identified mutations. And where are those gene mutations? Some of them are in HSP genes. And some of them are in genes that cause ALS. Okay, like uh, FIG4, and there's a small list of other, uh, C9 ORF, and there's a few genes that cause ALS. And some of those gene mutations present not as ALS, but as PLS. And so, you say, well, gee, if I have PLS and I have a gene testing and it shows an HSP gene mutation, does that reclassify me as HSP? And the answer is no. Mm. You have what you have on a clinical basis. Right. A, a person has either an HSP syndrome or a PLS syndrome or, or something, a hybrid between them or whatever you want to call it. And then the gene testing says, well, here's the, mo here's the molecular basis for that. Mm. And so there's, there's a, in general, an imprecise correlation imprecise correlation between what the gene mutation oh. is and how it manifests. And there are people in this room who have the diagnosis of PLS who have an HSP gene mutation. Oh. They, have the, they have the clinical syndrome of PLS right. with speech involvement and hand involvement and leg involvement and they meet criteria for PLS and the identified gene mutation is one that's more commonly associated with an HSP presentation. And that's a that's a long answer. Uh, can if I could add, I'm, I'm going to push back uh, again because I, I, I think um, I think this is all true. I think this is very nicely described what we're seeing. But we know this because we pursue genetic testing. So the more genetic testing we pursue, the more we understand that there is. We have fancy words for this: genetic heterogeneity and clinical pleiotropy, which essentially means that. A gene can cause an HSP phenotype, a PLS phenotype, or an ALS phenotype. Oh, exactly. So, but we wouldn't know this un, uh, unless we had we had uh, uh, tested extensively. So, can, yeah. can I say something? Yeah. <laughs> I want to jump in as well. So, if, for the mutations, um, in in our lab, we do. Uh, from genes to proteins analysis for every, the location of the mutation is extremely important because every protein interacts with another protein and proteins have domains, active domains. So let's say one protein has three active domains and one mutation is in domain one and the other mutation is in domain two and the other domation, the mutation is domain three. And if these three domains do different things, depending on where the mutation is, 
do, if let's say domain one is affected, domain two and three will still be functional. If domain two is affected, domain one and three will be functional, but domain two won't be functional. So we look at protein-protein interactions for each domains, for each in, um, published protein interaction studies, and then do in genetic to pathway analysis based on the proteins that cannot bind, based on that personalized or in individual mutation. That gives us uh, an understanding of why patients with different mutations in the same gene show different phenotype. Do you see what I mean? Yes. And, and I think in that res respect, knowing where the mutation is, is actually uh, helping us understand the biology and the pathology really well. I, I want to also add something in you know, a different disease we study in the lab. We study tauopathies, which is frontal temporal dementia. The same tau mutations that cause progressive supranuclear palsy can actually lead to CBD, the cortical basal degeneration. Actually, the, the cases in the family, the dad has PSP and the son has CBD. So even the same mutation can cause different diseases in terms of the clinical manifestation. I think there's modifiers in human genome might play a big role on how the disease is manifested. So you know, gene mutation obviously on the genome level is important, but let's not forget about modifiers and you know, can make it better or can make it worse. What are modifiers, sorry. Oh, um, in terms of modifiers are like, you know, because every human is different in their genomes, you know, in different, I mean, it's not like we're using animal models, they're same genetic right. background. We're all different. So there may be some gene, the copy numbers are different. Maybe you have different variants somewhere, SNPs somewhere that can be in the same pathway, somehow related to what the muted gene is doing to make it better or make it worse. That's what I mean by modifiers. Hopefully I explained well. Yes, and I have one last one that won't cause controversy, I don't think. Um, I think it's for the gentleman on the end. I noticed uh, on all the lists, I haven't seen Dr. Paglioni's name anymore. Has she gone on to other stuff or? Yeah, I can answer that because she's one of my colleagues. Uh, Sabrina Paganoni? Yes, sir. No, no, I meet with her about once a month. Uh, okay. We talk about upper motor neuron syndromes. She's very involved in a lot of the ALS platform trials, oh. and they're very frequently doing those. Before I moved to Mass General, she was seeing a lot of the people with HSP. Uh -huh. Now I get referred. A, a lot of times I see even the people with PLS because often they've come through the ALS clinic. They've gone through a few years. They've had a lot of EMGs. They've ruled out for ALS, and often they'll come and ask me to see them. Uh, but, but Dr. Paganoni is still there. She's still doing very well. And again, it's just very, very involved in a lot of exciting clinical trials on ALS. Because I was part of her study where they did the mm -hmm. M EMG, no, MRI, PET scan mm -hmm. thing to see where the inflammation was at. And yeah, again, she's still very involved in a lot of different types of trials. And as you know, she's, she's trained in physical medicine and rehabilitation. She's not a neurologist. She's trained in a different way. So again, she's very uh, involved in a lot of rehabilitation studies as well. Did that uh, study ever finish? I don't know. I'd have to okay. ask her. But again, I see her I've frequently. looked for it online. Uh -huh. Can't find it. But uh, which, which study was it? I'll ask her. Where they do the MRI and the PET scan all in okay. one? See where the inflammation's yeah. at? Okay, she they seem to think it was published. I don't know offhand, but uh, but we can certainly look. And if you drop me an email, I'll I'll get I'll I'll ask her and I'll send you a copy. Okay. You said like inflammation, HSP, PLS, ALS was in different places. I know they were doing a, they were doing a study on that. I know I think they published a small one. They might have been doing a larger one, but I haven't heard about it, oh. so I, I could ask them. Uh, but, but again, just, just to re reassure you, she, she's very, very active in the field and, again, I think is still seeing uh, quite a few patients with PLS because, again, they get a lot of the PLS patients, you know, come initially through the ALS clinic. Uh, and I think that, um, I th as far as I can tell, she's still seeing a lot of patients, but again, very involved now, specifically with therapeutic trials for ALS. Thank you, everybody. Sorry for dominating or causing a fight up there. But. And, and well, uh, two, two comments here. One is, as I listened to that, that uh, discussion, I was reminded of those times when I was a young man and I liked it when mom and dad didn't agree on whether I could do something. I got to choose. So they, but secondly, 
Uh, Dr. Paganoni, just so you all know, because I know many of you have known her and enjoyed her presence here before, she was invited both last year and this year, and she indicated to us both years her schedule and previous commitments kept her from being here, so she will be invited again next year, and we'll hope that she'll be able to attend. Okay. Greg, you want to do another one, or you want to take one from the audience? What would you like to do? You go ahead. Where, where are you, Tim? I'm everywhere. We'll get, we'll take a, take a I'm question. everywhere. We'll get one from this corner, and then I'm going to work the other side of the room. Okay? All right, we're going to do this one. I'll come back to you. You guys had one already. You had your turn. We'll be right back. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. This question is probably going to reveal that I'm a civilian muggle. I don't know anything. But one of the slick, trendy terms that we hear all the time is inflammation. And Dr. Paganoni had me go to Mass General for an ALS study. And I think it might be the same one. I was at control. I have HSP. And, but when I got there, it was called the ALS Inflammation Study. And I guess my question is, is inflammation the same in all respects, or is our inflammation different? Yeah, very good. Maybe I can tell cell level. So maybe I can answer it at cellular level. So uh, inflammation is also very complex. There are numerous ways of uh, inflammation. There is innate immunity, and then you know there's short-term immunity, long-term immunity, and then uh, it, even in the field of ALS, there's a big debate. Is it like immunity drives neurodegeneration or because neurons degenerate, immune cells come and clean the degenerating neurons? So there's a big debate of when is the, what is the timing of initiation for the neuroinflammation. And Dr. Gautam's work, maybe you have seen the astrocytes, microglia, they are players of the immune system. And when do they uh, occur first in the motor cortex? How do they interact with upper motor neurons? Is this different in ALS brain? Is this different in HSP brain? And again, what, when does it start? Plus, um, we have MCP1 CCR2 transgenic mouse line in our lab, and those cells are important for the innate immunity. We again purify them by fax, and we look at their gene expression profile proteins. And I can tell you that those cells are different even in the cortex and in the spinal cord. So I would imagine that their gene expression profile changes over time. The cells that you isolate at P30, postnatal day 30, are different than the ones at P60. I would imagine that they are not the same, but we are beginning to understand the molecular signatures behind them. If I may chime in a little bit about neuroinflammation, because inflammations, um, I guess you're talking about mainly neuroinflammations. So the inflammations happen in the CNS, um, the central nervous system, in terms of our, our brain and spinal cord. I think, you know, in terms of the brain, we normally recognize brain as sort of like protected from infl inflammation because the peripheral doesn't get into the brain very easily because of the blood brain barrier we have here, which give us this kind of advantage. But nowadays, more and more research pointed out to there are actually residential white blood cells in the brain, not only just the microglia and macrophages. <coughs> so these are groundbreaking research looking at an inflammation go, going on in the brain, in our brain and the spinal cord. I think when everything, anything goes awry, you know, which, you know, you have a mutation or you're exposed to some kind of environmental toxicant, and then that can lead to kind of inflammation goes on in the peripheral, and then the peripheral things can also happen into the brain. Not only just, you know, with the, the residential brain inflammation, but also from the peripheral. So we, um, this is the big research field. There are a lot of people dedicated studying neuroinflammation in different diseases. Um, you can find, literally find a literature or papers that describing neuroinflammation happens in ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you name it, and then they're here. So, you know, we have to take things very carefully to how to interpret the data, whether that's causative or that's secondary. So in terms of, the, you know, to find out whether these things are, then we can develop therapies and things to modulate it, to alleviate it, um, to kind of, you know, reach to the, the therapeutic goal, I guess. Yeah, I, I would like to add, uh, you know, um, considering our studies, so with the two molecules that we tested, the SPT272 and the cardiolipid molecules, um, that we've seen after the treatment that 
in the motor cortex where all these upper motor neurons live, after the treatment, there is a significant reduction of astrocytes and microglia. And my, those are um, um, cells that are in the, um, pro, uh, the pathways of inflammation. And so at least from our uh, point of view, we can say when the neurodegeneration or the degeneration of those neurons is slowed down or stopped, and that's why we see the, the reduction in the gliosis. And so probably, you know, if the neuron is very sick, maybe it attracts those cells. And when they are happier, healthier, those immune cells um, disappear. Okay, everybody. Hey, Greg, I've got a question on the far right side of the room. We're way over here now. We shifted one. Oh, you guys got to turn to the right. Here we go. Hello, doctor. Uh, my question is, is the current uh, research for HSP, is that directed towards a specific protein level or a mutant level? If it is a mutant level, will it aim at all the uh, proteins within that mutant? And will it also aim with all the severity with, within that mutant? I, I think... Um, I. I'm going to take a step back and, and, and try to answer the question by, by describing to you how we think about um, different categories of molecular mechanisms in HSP. So there are forms of HSP, typically the recessive forms, where the problem is that there is not enough of the normal protein, and that's, that's the main issue. Um, there are forms of HSP where there is the mutant protein expressed and the mutant protein is causing trouble. It's interfering with the normal function of the protein. And those are two very different scenarios. Um, in one, if you don't have enough, the solution would be to give the protein back to upregulate the normal protein. In the second scenario, the solution would be to block the expression of the mutant protein that's causing trouble. So. Uh, I, to, to your question, I think it depends on what the mechanism is. And one thing that I think we as a field need to do is we need to look very carefully at all forms of HS, all genetic subtypes of HSP, and really understand is it one or the other. Because that dictates, at the moment at least, dictates what type of therapeutic modalities even make sense. So... Um, uh, I think that's a long answer to your question, but it basically depends on the type of HSP, the type of mechanism, um, and, and whether you want to upregulate or downregulate a protein. If I, if I can um, add something about the mutations, uh, there is gain of toxicity as a mechanism, which means, let's say you have a mutation, and the mutant protein is toxic. If you did not have the protein, the body would have compensate for its absence. But when you have the mutation, now you have a mutant protein which is toxic. Do you see what I mean? And that's why uh, for treatments for the uh, mutant and toxic protein, if you, in some cases also, if you give the wild type protein, okay, that mutant protein may have like a prion-like uh, structure. So if you overexpress the wild type, now you create more mutant-like proteins. So you can actually, you know, putting a gas to the fire. Do you see what I mean? And the, the solution for that would be to silence the mutant protein. And it all depends where the mutation is. It all depends which gene is mutated. That's why before any gene treatment or gene therapy studies are done, we have to understand the mechanism of action, and we need to understand what is it that makes it toxic. Is it the mutation that is making it toxic? And also the location of the mutation is very important for making it like gain of toxicity or lack of function, do you see? And um, that's why the location of the, knowing where the mutation is and knowing the mechanism is important. Um, so this is a really important issue about whether a cure or, or a treatment for one type would be broadly applicable for multiple types or all types and so forth. And, uh, and so it just depends on, right now, as, 
uh, Dr. Blackstone mentioned in his presentation, there are many different uh, molecular pathways that are involved in different types of HSP. Now, if you say there are 90 plus types, there, we don't think there are 90 different pathways, but there are probably 20 different pathways. So there are five types of HSP in this pathway, and seven types in this pathway, and one type in this pathway, and so forth and so on. Now, do all these pathways ultimately converge into one final common pathway? I can't answer that. If they did, then we could treat that final common pathway, if they did, then we would treat the final common pathway and we'd have treatments for many types. On the other hand, uh, if you, you might have to have separate treatments and if you, in let's say this type involved seven types of HSP in one pathway, you might be able to treat that pathway and then treat those seven types. So, okay, so in other words, uh, at the moment, um, we don't know that all the pathways ultimately converge into one final common pathway. We haven't, that, that's, that's not been determined yet. So at the moment, treatments for one type might have, um, might generalize to other types that are in that category, that molecular category. Um, now that's, that's if you're treating the molecular process. If you're treating the symptoms, let's say that we develop a treatment that relieves spasticity, or reduces spasticity, or improves muscle strength, that might be uh, um, more generally useful across many types, if you're treating the symptom. Um, so uh, it just depends on if we're treating a molecular process or a a, I mean, a molecular cause or a, a symptom. Okay. Tim, let me take two questions up here, one out of our stack and then another question from one of our members here. Uh, this question, what about spinal or cranial stimulation, electrical or magnetic? Kind of four parts to that question. Spinal or cranial stimulation, electrical or magnetic? Okay. Well, so uh, this is you know, emerging, and uh, that is a, sp a spinal cord stimulation to reduce spasticity is, um, is um, I would say, an emerging area. It's not ready for clinical applications. It's in an experimental stage. I remember a couple of years ago, a person had, sp with hereditary spastic paraplegia, had spinal cord stimulation. Um, it, was, it was being done for chronic pain. So, in, in, uh, uh, to treat chronic pain, sometimes uh, spinal cord stimulation is done, and uh, this person who had severe pain unrelated to HSP, but also had HSP, had spinal cord stimulation to treat the chronic pain, and then said that spasticity was reduced for a period of weeks or months. So that was a, a, just a report of a sort of an accidental treatment or an accidental inclusion, or an accidental observation of a person with HSP who got spinal cord stimulation and found that it reduced spasticity. Now, uh, but, but uh, you know, there's been a lot of success in treating Parkinson's and, and specifically, uh, and, and now increasingly psychiatric disorders with, brain, with deep brain stimulation. And so there, there is a concept of applying that technology to treat spasticity. And um, that's pretty much in the experimental stage, not in the clinical application stage. And whether that will succeed or not, it, it, I don't know. Now, would it reduce spasticity? Maybe. That would be wonderful. Would it give Im, um, increased control, of volitionally, voluntary control over, over movement? I can't comment. We want both. We want, well, we want reduced spasticity increased volitional control of movement, and uh, we want increased strength. And I think that the, the initial trials, I think, are being done to reduce spasticity, but whether it would improve motor control and um, increased strength, I can't comment. But these are things that are in development. Yeah, I just want to add um, some comments on Dr. Fink's comment. 
Um, again, like I said, you know, a lot of studies have shown epidural stimulation as well as muscle stimulation and uh, spinal cord injury has benefit in even functional recovery, not just to release the spasticity, but also has some function gained back from the patients. Again, it's all in the, um, the trial set and not in the you know, FDA approved stuff like that. So I think you know, with the activity-based therapies, um, with the either epidural stimulation or muscle stimulation, that's less invasive. I think you know, a lot of people are actually trying that in spinal cord injury field, and then they have a very promising um, results if you look for like, you know, epidural or muscle stimulation in spinal cord injury uh, recovery. I think we can learn something from it, because our body, our CNS, although we're adult, they still contain some kind of plasticity. Um, you know, when I say plasticity means these can still regrowth. So when, when but we just find, need to find a way how we stimulate them to regrowth, to innovate the loss, um, the innovation uh, to control the muscle movement. So I think, you know, that's a long way to go, but I still think that's promising. Kind of stimu One other kind of stimulation you might be asking about is the transcranial magnetic stimulation. And that's sort of like they put a little wand on your head. And you can get that done a lot of places, like uh, they'll do it for depression, things like that. And it does seem to relieve spasticity, often at least for spasticity, in my experience, maybe John or others could pitch in, the, the benefit is relatively brief. But it, but it seems it's mostly safe. I mean, there's some risk of seizures and so on like that in some people. But you'll often see, again, it's pretty widely available in different types of communities, is the transcranial magnetic stimulation. And again, I don't, I mean, most of the time it's pretty well tolerated. And there is some benefit. But again, in my experience, it's been relatively brief. I have a question um, for the group um, regarding a study I read that was published about a year or so ago from the neuroimaging department at Trinity College in Dublin. And they were looking at the gray matter loss in brains of people with ALS versus PLS. And they didn't postulate any particular reason for what they found, but they did express surprise that the volume of gray matter loss was virtually the same, although the location in the brain of that loss was somewhat different between ALS and PLS. And somebody mentioned cognition earlier it's not uncommon in what I've read to hear at least anecdotal um, complaints of perceived loss of cognition with people with PLS. And I was wondering if the panel had any thoughts if that the gray matter loss is a potential source of that or you know, it's just not something I hear a lot of discussion on. So I was hoping you might have some thoughts. Well, um, so first of all, Trinity College in Ireland, I think it's Michael Hutchinson. I'm not sure. I, I, but, I no, no, I can't remember. But I, I can't remember the guy's name. What was it? Mm, that's a different person. But they, they have pioneered or many studies about cognition in HSP and PLS for, you know, beginning 15 years ago. And their finding, so it's not an accident that it came from Trinity College in Ireland, because this is something they're studying. And, uh, and so here's, this is a, it's, it's kind of unsettling, when I, this topic. They found that some people that have hereditary spastic paraplegia, some, not all, have cognitive impairment. That is, a, a, so uh, various forms of dementia. Now, they found it in some people, not all people. And uh, so, because as soon as you, people are going to say, well, is that now part of HSP? I thought HSP, uncomplicated HSP was just the legs, and now you're telling me I have to worry about cognition. And the answer is no, it doesn't seem to affect the majority of people, 
But in some people, there is cognitive impairment or dementia. That's one. In HSP. And so, the studies that were done, now, just, just hold that thought. Some people with HSP have cognitive impairment, not the majority of uncomplicated HSP. Of course, there are complicated forms that do involve, you know, some complicated childhood forms and so forth, that, or SPG11 can have cognitive impairment, and, and so forth and so on. So, but in general, usually with uncomplicated HSP, there's not dementia, but in some people there is. Now, ALS often has cognitive impairment. Not always, not everybody, but often. The type of cognitive impairment in ALS is usually, these are generalizations, not the same as cognitive impairment that's present in Alzheimer's disease. It's a different pattern of, of cognitive change. Um, and so the, the general term for this is a frontal lobe dementia that we see in ALS versus a memory problem that we see in Alzheimer's. That's a, usually there's a different pattern in ALS memory problem, I'm sorry, me cognitive problems than there is in, in um, Alzheimer's. Okay. When, we, when they look at the studies that were done at, at Trinity College looking at uncomplicated HSP and cognitive impairment, and you drill down on what did the cognitive studies show, it was in the same pattern that the ALS um, cognitive impairment showed. And if you look at cognitive studies that have been done in some people that have shown cognitive impairment in some people with PLS, it's also not in the Alzheimer's pattern, but in the ALS pattern. So what we have is ALS often, PLS sometimes, and uncomplicated HSP, I'm going to say rarely, has cognitive impairment, not of the Alzheimer's pattern, but in a, this other pattern we call a frontal lobe cognitive change. And so uh, it just shows another similarity of uh, that these disorders are, uh, affect the brain in some overlapping way. Yeah. And, uh, but but uh, still, I'm going to dig in and say, if a person says that they have word finding problems, I'm going to look for other causes before I attribute it to um, HSP or PLS. Yeah. That's a long answer. Yeah. Can I can I say something? So, uh, Dr. Fick was mentioning frontal lobe uh, FT, FTD, ALS. Those are the patients who have cognitive uh, dysfunction, and those patients especially have TDP pathology. Ninety-five, ninety-nine percent of those patients have TDP pathology. Like a ALS patients may not have, but ALS FTLD patients have a lot. They have also seen in the Alzheimer's disease patients who have fast decline, have high levels of TDP pathology, and there are now studies suggesting to correlate the extent of TDP pathology to the cognitive uh, dysfunction or cognitive decline. And biomarkers are developing for TDP pathology because TDP is a protein that uh, splices messenger RNA and genes are coded by genes and messenger RNA into protein, that's the order. And statmin2 is one gene, and when the TDP has a problem, the statmin2 gene is misspliced. So this, the misspliced form of statmin2 is used as a potential biomarker to show TDP pathology. So again, uh, TDP pathology is also seen in a small percentage of HSP patients, not all, but small percentage. I would look at the statmin-2 levels in their blood to see if they have any correlation with the TDP pathology or uh, problems with TDP in those specific patients. Yeah, this, particular, uh, this particular study was specifically just on PLS. And uh, again, um, there, there summary seemed to center around their surprise at the volume of the gray matter loss. And they compared the scans and slightly different locations, but very similar, like Dr. Fink said. And, um, but they seem, they seem to have expected to find less volume of loss. 
I, I know nothing um, to comment on that, but um, I was just curious, and you, you guys have answered that. Well, I would add this. Uh, Mayo Clinic had a study at least 10 years ago about um, PET scans in PLS. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I think it was PET scans in PLS. And uh, they felt that there was a, a, a particular area of the brain, the motor cortex, showed uh, reduced um, activity. I think it was a PET scan. But anyways, they were, they were uh, suggesting that this could be a marker, a biomarker, for example, a radio, radiologic biomarker for PLS that would distinguish it from HSP and distinguish it from, from um, um, ALS. So they also found cortical changes, Mayo Clinic, um, and, uh, and it was in a different area than we typically see in other, other disorders. So I'm not sure if that was uh, what they, the region that you're talking about in the, in the Trinity College study. Hey guys, we're gonna, can we move off from this question real quick? We've been on it for a little too long. We need to move to a couple other questions that we have some people out here that we need to get to. And we have a stack of questions that were written on the board that we're gonna have to run through. So we appreciate your answers on that. We've got a question over here. Uh, getting away from academics for a little bit, um, if the hypothesis is that there's loss of upper motor neuron inhibition uh, on the lower motor neuron uh, modulation, uh, is there anything except uh, baclofen for targeting that so that we can reduce that lower motor neuron uh, excitability? Well, yes. Uh, so that's really important um, to reduce spasticity. So, uh, and the answer is yes, there are emerging therapeutics. And one of, uh, they're not in clinical trials yet. For example, um, mod. Existing one. Well, yes. Yeah, so, uh, reducing. So, the, the, there's a, a whole uh, neurophysiology, neurochemistry that underlies the, the spasticity. And, uh, and we know how baclofen works. And, uh, and, but there are other agents that work with a different mechanism of action. And uh, one of them, for example, is to antagonize, to block a certain type of serotonin receptor. Not all serotonin. There are at least seven more than that types of serotonin receptors. And I think it's type 2A. Blocking that reduces spasticity. So we think, great, let's block our serotonin. Well, half the people in the world are taking serotonin-stimulating medicines to treat their uh, mood or depression and so on and so forth. We're not about to just nonchalantly, we don't do anything nonchalantly, but we have to, we have to make sure it's safe because we don't want to block serotonin per se. We want to block the type 2A receptor not every place, but in parts of the spinal cord. So it has to, so my, th this is just one example. There are um, several other approaches uh, of, of uh, medicine, but the, ser and the seroto selective serotonin blocking agents, medicines like Prozac and so forth, they are augmenting serotonin. We want to block serotonin, not in the brain, but in the spinal cord. That would be a new approach. And, uh, and there, are, there was a study um, uh, of, a, of a mild agent that blocks serotonin, uh, type 2A, and it seemed to benefit spasticity. But it, clearly, new agents are needed and for, to reduce that. But anything else off-label besides uh, Well, we use off-label. I can't answer that. Um, I mean, we use, let's say, uh, yeah, Xanaflex or Dantrium. Dantrium acts on the muscles, not the spinal cord. Yeah. It has liver toxicity, but we use that. Um, yeah, I mean, if we talk about symptomatic treatment of spasticity, I think um, you had asked specifically about uh, drugs that work on the on the circuitry between the first and second motor neuron. But speaking more broadly, of course, 
low doses of Valium is something that we use in our patient population. We use clonidine, which is more for children than, than for, for adults, because you would have to use very high doses in adults, and it has impact on, on blood pressure, etc. <coughs> Gabapentin, I find as an, as an additional adjunct medication is often helpful. Um, and then, of course, uh, botulinum toxin injections is another, you know, so, so does, does that's sort of the portfolio. And we always, um, you know, look at um, risk-benefit profile. We look at the, um, the comorbidities. We look at interactions. Um, yeah, I think we have, we have a list of maybe seven to ten medications that we could sort of map out, but it really depends on the situation. And I think... Drugs like dantrolene, for example, uh, carry carry a significant risk. So I think it's all about that. I think for for children, our, our approach is uh, to use Botox when it's useful, and 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 if there are specific muscle groups that we can target, isolate, that improves function or prevents uh, co contractures. Uh, we use baclofen and, and Valium as sort of first and second, uh, and then we use clonidine and gabapentin. Another question from one of our uh, listeners at home. Again, uh, to Dr. Oscar, TDP-43 sounds pretty exciting. What's next, human trials? I don't study TDP-43 in my lab, but I think it's a question more related to Dr. Oslinger. Yeah. Uh, so yes, TDP pathology is actually shared among many different neurodegenerative diseases. So it is seen in ALS patients. It's also seen in the brains of HSP, PLS patients. Actually, um, you, you have a very nice review about that too. Um, it, it's also seen in some Alzheimer's disease patients, in some Parkinson's disease patients. And the TDP pathology was initially identified as accum accumulation of phosphorylated TDP proteins in the cytoplasm by Virginia Lee. So now we see that there are also accumulations could be in the nucleus, and then there are some skin-like inclusions, aggregated inclusions, different types of inclusions. These inclusions contain hundreds of different proteins, so TDP pathology is not TDP pathology everywhere, so we are trying to understand more about that. But for, with our NU9 study, we realized that with the treatment of NU9, in the TDP A315T model, uh, which was generated by Dr. Bailo based on a mutation detected in an ALS FDLD patient. So with that uh, mutation, um, there is reduction of TDP pathology, there's improvement of mitochondrial uh, function. So yes, I think with NU9, if you're talking about mechanism-based approach, if we show efficacy of TDP in other pathologies, it may be um, a way to think, um, you know, in U9 forward for uh, TDP pathologies. But I think we are a bit, um, let's not go ahead of ourselves, let's get the phase one study going and in the meantime do more preclinical studies on the TDP. But I agree with you, understanding the basis of TDP pathology is very important for drug discovery. Here's a question that, uh, this isn't Norma's writing, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't ask this because she thinks I never listen. <laughs> hearing loss and HSP and maybe PLS, but this particular hearing loss and HSP, how many genetic types? So is there a connection between hearing loss and HSP? And if so, uh, any specific of our types? There are, there, are a couple, there are a couple types of HSP. I can't tell you off the top of my head the number. That's one. And so there are a couple types of HSP that involve hearing loss. And second, uh, mitochondrial disorders um, can have hearing loss. But in general, eight, uh, hearing loss is a, is a common condition and usually unrelated to HSP. So yeah, occasionally there are types of HSP that involve hearing loss, but it's an unusual um, association. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, do you recommend uh, bioidentical hormone treatment, BHRT, for women with HSP? Uh, so, okay. 
Uh, so I can't answer that. I'm just reading. No, no. I, I, here's the here's the situation. Um, uh, endocrine changes, in general, are usually not a part of hereditary spastic paraplegia. And usually, as far as we know, as far as we know, as far as I know, uh, and and usually, as far as I know, not a part of primary lateral sclerosis. As far as I know, endocrine changes, and so. Horm treating hormone, uh, treating with hormones to correct a hormone problem, it would be um, n uh, another symptom that is coexisting with HSP or coexisting with PLS, but is not actually a manifestation of HSP or, a or PLS. So if you're going to treat with hormones. Now, as a neurologist, I have, uh, I would defer to uh, an endocrinologist or an OBGYN physician to, to make those recommendations. Now, you say, what about using bioidentical hormones from plant sources, for example, instead of a pharmaceutically or a more the, uh, the biochemically produced um, uh, form of that hormone? Uh, I, can't, I, I can't say. It just depends on if it's effective or not. I would not underestimate the potency of bioidentical hormones. They can be very uh, potent. And uh, so I wouldn't say, oh, well, it's from a plant, therefore it's safe, or it's from a plant, therefore it's, uh, it's more effective or less effective. I, I can't comment on that. But so I, I would just say endocrine changes are not usually, you know, part of HSP or PLS. And I would have to defer to an endocrinologist or OBGYN for the specific recommendations. Drinking alcohol and HSP and or PLS uh, affects uh, overview risks, any effects on mitochondria. So how does just a little bit of an alcoholic beverage impact HSP or PLS? Well, uh, so in general terms, um, uh, some people have, um, particularly people with SPG7, have um, balance, you know, uh, cerebellar problems. They have ataxia, and in in that, and so here's it, uh, a small amount of alcohol is fine unless you have it. You find that it exacerbates your symptoms. I don't mean your symptoms, Greg, but I mean a person's symptoms. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> so, my, actually, I, I do mean your symptoms. But, uh, so, uh, so uh, um, if some people say, you know, my, my uh, speech is slurred to begin with, and if I have any alcohol, it just gets very, very much compromised. So, in that case, you just use common sense. Or, they, or people would say, you know, uh, my balance is already a problem. If I drink any alcohol, I, I, it's just terrible. Well, you just use common sense. Now, um, what a, a small amount of alcohol, that amount is, you know, sort of self-defined. And so, I, we, we mean, um, uh, and, and, and it's also, there's a hidden issue there. Does that mean a person's drinking only a small amount of alcohol now because they cut down from a big amount of alcohol in their past? And so there's a, it's, a, it's a complicated story, but in general, uh, if a person does not find that it exacerbates their symptoms, if they have a glass of wine and they, aren't, and they tolerate it just fine, I don't think that that, uh, that is problematic for the underlying condition. I don't know who wrote either one of those two questions, but I do find a relationship. After a couple of glasses of wine, I don't listen to Norma as much. <laughs> so I think that might be, ther that might be therapeutic. <laughs> Maybe so, yeah. Uh, why do, I hope she's not in here. <laughs> uh, gonna be a long trip home. Uh, why do people in the same family have different onset ages? 
Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. We think, you know, there's certainly other factors that play a role, as I think Darius or others have mentioned it. You know, we're all different genetically. We could have other genes uh, or other changes that are impacting that. Uh, and that could be one of the main reasons. But also there's lots of reasons that, you know, that we don't, we don't know explain. There's environmental reasons, a whole bunch. Um, and I think that you see that some more with some HSPs than others. Some I think we see less variation. I, I don't think we can completely understand that, but if I had to go on any one reason, it is, probably is just that the natural genetic variation we have that makes us all different. Uh, and some of these are genes that we can identify. Some might be more complex issues where there's a series of mutations that have to occur together. But I think that that might be one of the main reasons. It's just the natural genetic variation, modifying genes, things like that can give rise to that. Within a family. Within a family. Yeah, I guess I think it's a it's a very important observation, one that we make commonly, um, because we obviously we see we see children, so by definition, um, with early onset, and and I think um, I don't think we have a good explanation. I can think of several families where, in every generation, the age of onset seems to be earlier, and and in some conditions, um, like Huntington's disease, we understand why, but. But in SPG4 and others that I can think of, we really don't understand why. I, I think it's a, it's a conundrum. I think it's something that we have to investigate. Um, but it's definitely, I think, a phenomenon we have seen, seen a lot. Um, but I, I don't know why. Is it common for people with HSP to have lower heart rates and require a pacemaker more often than others? No, that's that's not that's not typical. I have SPG five A. To clarify, can my children and or grandchildren also get HSP? Well, typically, uh, SPG five A is a recessive form, and uh, I mentioned that there's a list of types of HSP that can be inherited either as recessive or as dominant. And SPG5A, to the best of my knowledge, is not on that list. So that means that today, in our knowledge about uh, SPG5A, and these things are evolving, but as best we know, SPG5A is only, has only been shown to be a recessive condition. And um, recessive conditions are, are usually almost never transmitted to their children. Now, if a person with SP, if a person with SPG 5A um, who is capable of transmitting only one copy, the children would be carriers of SPG 5A. However, if that person with SPG 5A marries a person with SPG 5A, well, now it could be transmitted to children. Okay, so you can't, you, it would violate that concept about recessive disorders can't be transmitted to children. Well, they could if both parents had SPG 5A. Or, 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 or yeah, right, yeah. or if one of the parents was, was not affected, um, but was a carrier was a of SPG 5A. Thank you, yeah, of course. And so, but if the spouse is not a carrier and the spouse is, doesn't have SPG 5A, then the children won't have it. The children will be carriers, but they won't be expect, they'd be expected to not be affected. There, I agree with that. I think where, where this last scenario is relevant, the, the partner being a carrier is in certain populations, of course, yeah. where, where certain variants are enriched. Um, and then rarely, and this is, this is the, the sort of an extreme case, but um, there are cases that we have published that um, happen to inherit a mutant copy, bo both, both copies of the gene from a mutant copy well, of a parent. Yeah. So you need, as, as a fancy word, it's called uniparental isodisomy, but um, but what it essentially means is that there is a small chance that a parent passes on not one allele, not one copy of the gene, but both. And, and, and if that's the case, then a recessive, recessive condition can manifest in the next generation, even if just inherited from one parent. In general, no. Yeah. But you can never say 100%. One of our uh, folks listening at home asks, what genes are common to PLS and are they similar to HSP? So um, we published our r report on that 
and brain sciences. So we looked at the mutations that are detected in HSP patients, and we looked at the mutations that are detected in PLS patients. There were only very few that were common, and usually the mutations are pretty distinct. And we also looked at the mutations that are detected in ALS patients and in some HSP and PLS patients. There are some mutations that are shared, but the location of the mutation uh, could be different. So uh, there are some genes that are uh, common. Depending on the mutation, sometimes you have a different path. And a taxin gene, for example, is a good example. Uh, FIG4 is a good example, and there are a couple, couple other genes that are important. So I think that gene mutation may not explain the whole paradigm. It is informative, but it's not just one gene, one disease. Tim, have you got any questions? And SPG11. So. Yeah. Um, I have many I've, questions. I've got, one, I've got one here, Leonard. Well, uh, Okay. I, I, is is five o'clock our time? We're actually going uh, five fifteen was uh, about what we we're going to go to, but okay. we go a little long right now. It is five o two. Good deal. So got a we question can go right on here. for a little while. Leonard, uh, thanks for taking my question. This is for Dr. Fakari. Um, a lot of what you guys have all talked about, some of the preclinical, but when you start getting. Uh, deeper into your research and when you want to get to like a phase two, phase three, or when you want to get into the regulatory process, are there any concerns you have with trying to get um, numbers of us to power studies to get approved? Um, you know, in rare disease, it's just not many of us. And uh, I'm in a natural history study now, and Dr. Mitsumoto is having a hell of a time recruiting patients. So, um, you know, what do you do to, to advance that to get an approval? You know, the FDA wants, you know, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials um, to meet a primary endpoint. And how do you do that when you don't have the numbers to treat? It's a great question. I think it's a huge challenge for the field, and I've tried to sort of outline this this morning when I said that the uh, landscape, the regulatory landscape, was not developed for rare diseases. And I think it's a huge challenge. So placebo-controlled trials that are sufficiently powered to, um, uh, to show uh, an effect, if it's not a transformative effect, will be difficult. And I think what we have to... Um, reason with and what we have to push for are situations like some recent um, uh, cases where we go for conditional approval or um, uh, uh, conditional approval with the goal of doing a confirmatory study later. Now that requires that you have some kind of biomarker or indicator that tells you that there is an effect. Um, so that would circumvent the problem of needing to wait until you have sufficient numbers, which could take years, decades, um, and and would get you f get you to that point where uh, a BLA is granted sooner. Um, I, I think for the extreme cases, for uh, when we talk about um, gene therapies for for ultra rare diseases we'll never see a, a, a placebo-controlled trial. I think we have to find new ways, and on a practical level, if we're talking about a disease that affects a few hundred people worldwide, it could be an open IND. It could be, you know, in a study you treat a large number of patients and you never get to an approval. We have to find sort of these, these alternative mechanisms uh, because getting to a final approval not only requires a lot of resources, but it also requires numbers that just don't exist. But I think the thinking is changing because everybody recognizes that, that that's, that's a huge problem. I think the FDA does, everybody else does. Okay, Greg, um, I've got a question over here. We'll do one over here. Do I see a hand over here? That's the hand I saw. Hi, my wife's got HSP-8. And I was reading online, and it says that's extremely rare. So I was just curious as to what it is that makes it so rare. Well, um, so 
Uh, it's it's rare. Uh, we uh, actually discovered the locust for SPG8 w by studying a family in in Can in Kansas, Wichita area, and uh, it's it's just un. I've seen a couple other uh, patients unrelated to that family, but it, so it's a, one of the more rare types. However, there are 90 types of HSP, more more than that, and. Uh, and so there are some common ones, really common, type four, really common, especially, you know, dominantly inherited, 40% or so, people with dominantly inherited HSP have type four. Now, uh, the childhood onset, type 3A, 10% of childhood onset or something, 15% something. So that's pretty big piece of the dominantly inherited pie. Now, with recessive, we have type 7 is common, type 11, 15. There are other types that are common. Once you get beyond those types I just mentioned, everything is rare. So each of the, in other words, if you make a pie graph and you take out, you know, uh, type 4, type 3A, type 7, type 11, type 15, and a few others that are more common, um, once you get beyond that, everything else is described in just a few families, 10 families, 30 families. Um, there, each one is a 1%. And so type 8 is rare, but, there, but beyond the big common ones, they're mostly rare. All right, thank you. What is the current state of research on HSP? Uh, SPG4. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can I ask you? There you go. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the things I can say, we are in lab developing and testing a gene therapy vector uh, for SPG4 in particular, uh, which is showing some promising data. You might see them tomorrow during my talk. So hopefully, this first generation of vector will give some insight to get closer and closer to have a defined vector or other therapeutic approach to uh, link with it and like develop a more defined therapeutic strategy. So hopefully, <laughs> this study will like uh, give uh, quite good uh, results so we can move forward with all the testing. So to add up to that, um, in my lab, we're also doing high throughput screenings um, using different models. We have the animal models inherited from Bas lab. Um, we're crossing that with a knockout and generating a double transgenic. Um, and we are using that animal for um, proteomics as well as for single cell RNA sequencing. Um, on top of that, um, we generated, using CRISPR-Cas9, generated the um, different mutations from the SAM control line, so which means you have the SAM control but different mutations on this Bastion, SPG4, and we're trying to find common pathways that elicit it by the SAM, uh, but different Bastion mutations. Um, we're doing proteomics as well as um, the single cell RNA sequencing and using the stem cell technology to create uh, human brain organoids, which means like in, in a very non-scientific word, it's called mini brain of the human. So we kind of culture the, the cells derived into the, um, the brain tissues of um, the patient and then look for um, basically the mechanism um, oriented <coughs> research. Um, hopefully we can find some um, pathways that relate it to commonly to different mutations of spastin. Um, and also we're trying small molecules um, that um, we found like can inhibit one of the enzymes goes awry in both animal models and the human IPS models. Um, so hopefully, I mean, a lot of things going on. Hopefully we can have more to talk about in next meeting. Someone asked, uh, bladder and bowel issues and involvement, any progress in treatment? regarding those areas? Well, uh, so bladder, um, I could ask, I'm not going to, but I could ask for a show of hands 
For anybody with HSP or PLS, don't show me hands, anybody with HSP or PLS that does not have bladder involvement. There might be, I mean, I don't want to see any hands, but um, it, it is very common, bladder involvement. It occasionally is the first symptom with urgency. Bowel involvement is also common, but not, not as common. Now, so it's, these are extremely common, or bladder involvement particularly is extremely common. So we started out with um, using medicines to relax the bladder. You know, ditropan or oxybutynin is commonly used as an entry level. Now, over the past, say, 10 years, that the spectrum of medicines that are available to treat bladder um, spasticity um, has increased. Mirbetric, Tamulosin, there's a n several medicines that are now used in addition to or instead of um, ditropan or, or oxybutynin. So, over, so there is progress on medic medication use to reduce urinary urgency. That's one. Second, there's non-medication approaches like uh, um, you know, uh, nerve stimulation or Botox injection into the bladder. These are these can be used with medications or instead of medications, and um, so that's another one. Uh, so it, there's medications that have, are coming along, and there are um, these other nerve stimulation and, and Botox that are also helpful. Now, occasionally, I would say rarely, um, but or not rarely, but less commonly, there can be severe constipation because the pelvic floor muscles are skeletal muscles and they can be very, very tight and they can prevent the stool or urine outflow. And so people have used um, uh, Botox into the pelvic floor muscles and uh, other electrical stimulation to try to relax that for, um, it's not for bowel urgency, it's for um, inability to void. Um, so, but, um, so there is increasing, um, there is increasing a, a, a range of, of, of approaches to treat this, um, and also because these are very common, urinary urgency, for example, we have to make sure there's nothing else that's causing urinary urgency or urinary retention, uh, prostate enlargement, and so forth and so on, or urinary um, incontinence like uh, weak pelvic weak pelvic pelvic uh, sphincters and so forth. So. People that have this, if the initial pro approach doesn't work, then they need a urologic evaluation to, to go and see if there's some other more complex cause. Similar question, can HSP, and I'm going to throw PLS in as well, can HSP and or PLS uh, cause higher blood pressure? Mitochondrial health, uh, nutrition, lifestyle, I guess the question is uh, or anything about our lifestyles that can or would affect that. Mitochondrial health is what. Nutrition, lifestyle, anything about, I guess uh, that's all that's on the, any, is whoever wrote this question here, you might better define it than I am. Yeah, um, there are a lot of over-the-counter, you know, uh, molecules available by which many uh, websites even advertise to in, improve the mitochondrial health. Um, none of them have been, like, you know, tested for particular diseases or been uh, approved by FDA. So it's a very generic, very, you know, very, you know, hand-waving kind of way to say, oh, take this and mitochondrial health will improve. Of course, if you take those uh, over-the-counter supplements, it would do something. But it would do particularly for this disease to mitigate the symptoms that I really doubt about. What symptoms determine use of a baclofen pump? Uh, this person says more seem to need it or use it or have it than, than in the past. Baclofen pumps, more of them, what symptoms merit that? 
So, um, hello. Okay. The, uh, the it, baclofen orally or by the pump reduces spasticity. That's the beginning of it. Baclofen reduces spasticity. It doesn't make anybody stronger. It doesn't make anybody faster. It reduces spasticity. And so for people that have severe spasticity, that oral medications are ineffective, then, uh, or Botox is ineffective, then we would, could think about a, a baclofen pump. However, people that, ha that, that uh, if you have a lot of spasticity and also a lot of weakness, if we remove the spasticity, we expose the weakness. It doesn't actually make the muscles weaker, it just exposes the weakness that's there. So, people may be able to, with spasticity, may be able to stand and transfer. And if we take the spasticity away, the legs may become like rubber, and they become floppy. So, who is a candidate for a, a baclofen pump? Would be those, uh, here's an ideal candidate, people with a lot of spasticity, for whom oral baclofen has shown benefit, but they can't tolerate a larger dose because it makes them too sleepy, and they don't have coexistent marked weakness. If a person has spasticity and a lot of weakness, then we think if we remove that spasticity, the legs will be non-functional. And so that's, that's a short answer. One last question. I see Tim on the move, and it's close to 5.15, but one last question. Is there a correlation between premature babies and HSP, and they have SPG4 in parentheses? So, yes, yeah, great question. Um, we, we look at this as part of the natural history study. We've not seen an increased prevalence of prematurity in, in, in families with HSP in general, including SPG4, so the short answer is no. Okay, um, guys, let's see. One more hand, raise of the hand. If you're near me, you got a question? Are you near me? Anybody got a question? Perfect. This is how you do it. Last question of this session. Thanks. Um, somewhat following up on the pediatric side, is there any value in pursuing newborn screening for HSP? It's a great question. So um, newborn screening as it's done currently in, in the U.S. and in other countries around the world is focused on conditions that have a treatment. The rationale there is that... Um, the historic rationale there is that you want to identify those conditions that, that have a treatment early enough so you can, you can have a significant impact. And um, so these are mostly inborn areas of metabolism that manifest very early. Now this was when, this was developed when newborn screening was done using biochemical tests. And now we have genetic testing. So there is a strong argument to be made for genetic newborn screening. Now of course that brings about a lot of ethical and um, uh, societal issues. Um, so I, my personal prediction, this is just my opinion, is that we'll have genetic newborn screening very soon. I think it's just a matter of time. Um, but at, mo at the moment, um, the guidelines and, and the legis legislature around this uh, really only calls for screening for treatable conditions. Yeah. Now, if we had a treatable condition, and yeah. newborn screening uh, changes the recommendations are changing every year, and that would of course be be something that that would be pushed for us. The example for that, for example, is spinal muscular atrophy. Mm -hmm. So you know, a few years ago we didn't have newborn screening for it because no treatment existed for it. But now that there are several treatments, every baby, in, I think in mo in every, almost every state in the United States is screened. Tim. Well, fantastic. What, Tim, Where are you, Greg? Right here. I moved on you. One last question. We're going to give our last question to our PLS table right here. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Can uh, PLS be caused from a traumatic injury? And why I say that is I had a traumatic injury, and less than a year I started having symptoms. <laughs> It was a bad accident. Uh, so, uh, the, what we understand about PLS is that it is not caused by trauma. That's what we understand. 
and that that same thing follows with HSP that it's not caused by trauma. It's some intrinsic. This is what our current understanding is that neither HSP nor PLS are caused by trauma. What about ALS? And ALS is the same. Not is caused that? by trauma. These the concept is that ALS, PLS, HSP, uh. And, and the inherited ataxias and the inherited neuropathies and things like that, all of them are, reflect intrinsic um, degenerations, uh, either degenerations in the adults or a developmental problem in, in, uh, in infants, either that, but they're not due to trauma. So that's, the, that's, that's what we understand about PLS. Maybe from all the stress or? No, uh, whether it's a physical stress or emotional stress, However, if a person, so I can't answer for you, for you, I'm just speaking about the PLS in general, is, is not thought to be related to trauma, although if a person were having some mild symptoms, some mild nerve degeneration that was, uh, and then they had a second injury of the nervous system that might make those mild symptoms more obvious, it's not that the injury caused the problem, but you know, injury can, can uh, traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury can have very similar symptoms. The major difference, the major difference is that PLS progresses slowly over years. And, and, uh, and so uh, that, that, that and, and traumatic injuries of the nervous system manifest at the time of injury. Well, I fell on a uh, truss and severed my urethra and a jolt like that, couldn't that cause spinal cord injury? Sure, could. sure. But, but if it certainly could cause spinal cord injury, and the injury from sp spinal cord dysfunction, whether it's from PLS or HSP or spinal cord injury, it has very similar overlapping uh, symptoms. So, I, but yeah, it's, it's a, it means there's some problem with the spinal cord whether it's caused by HSP or PLS or trauma or multiple sclerosis, whatever. Topic, uh, the, the, the association between TBI and ALS initiation and progression. So the field uh, has some different opinions. There is one group that says, um, you know, TBI uh, does not cause uh, ALS initiation or rate of progression. And there's another group that says if you actually have, you know, competitive, like uh, consecutive, uh, even small hits on the brain, uh, that may trigger an immune reaction, which may facilitate the ongoing degeneration so that they may contribute to neuronal degeneration. But again, because the numbers are so small, there are really no statistical study we don't really know. And if we had more patients with, let's say, TBI, and then uh, they were monitor monitored for, let's say, biomarkers that show ast activated astrocytes in the brain, now those markers are available. They were not available before. I think we might have seen a clear understanding. But uh, you are not the only person who says, you know, I have fallen or I had this injury, and then now I have this disease. Is this correlated? It's hard for us to say you know, it needs to be uh, studied in a longitudinal way and maybe with more N numbers. But we, we hear this, um, and I don't think you're the only person who reports this, but it's very hard for us to say the link. Okay, everybody, great answers, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Spastic Paraplegia Panel of Experts. Okay, guys, you are free to go. We are going to give you a couple of notes before we let you go and we get ready for dinner time. Number one, thank you. The 50-50 drawing will be the first thing we do this evening when we come back and do our presentations and other fun stuff. The second thing we wanted to let you know is uh, credit card payments for any of the things that you when we auction off tonight or whatever, we can take care of that and we can also do a check, okay? You can, we'll take care of that for you. Also, we wanna let you know that when we draw the, the little uh, tickets and stuff, you must be present to win, okay? You must be present to win.
Tim, and just to clarify, yes, we, we can do credit card, we can do check, but we can do cash, so don't rule that out. <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, real quick, I want to recognize our sponsors that really, really helped us be a part of this uh, this wonderful weekend. Uh, of course, Chris Brocchini, we love her. She's right over there. Big shout out to Chris Brocchini for sponsoring us this weekend. Uh, the Conlin Foundation. Uh, classic, <laughs> there we go, the Conlin Foundation. There we go, I'm gonna do 20 minutes on this alone. The <laughs> Classic Dentistry. Uh, Kaduri, uh, and of course the books that you guys know that we're gonna be doing later, okay. Uh, the St. Louis Zoo. Always animals. That's a great tagline. Uh, your medical store. We're glad they're going to be helping us out later this evening. Um, <laughs> Joshua Cochran, uh, Toby, and Becky. We want to thank them for helping us out. Uh, JL Safety. Thank you for helping us be a sponsor. Um, FCB, First Community Bank of the Heartland. Thank you for being a sponsor with us. And the Missouri Botanical Garden, who put on a presentation for our youth earlier today. So we're glad that they helped us out to bring all this great information to you. One quick note, anybody who did a 5K walk, roll, run, however you did it, uh, Jim would like to see everybody for a photo. Oh, you can meet him outside in the lobby. We're going to take a, a big uh, photo for that to promote the uh, 5Ks that we've been doing. So if you've been in one, did one, did one this year, planning to do one, everybody get in a picture with Jim. He loves a lot of people in the picture. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to let you go. We're going to set and get ready for dinner at about 630. So you got a little bit of time to relax, clean up, freshen up, put on that tuxedo, whatever it is you got to wear tonight. We're going formal tonight, so whatever it takes. We'll see you in a little while. Thanks, everybody.
see all of you back. You know these uh, end of conference uh, get-togethers where everybody wears their tux and their, their big dresses. I'm glad we don't do that. It's great to see you here. I know you've had a, a great day with a lot of information. Uh, before we have dinner, though, uh, we want to have a short awards of pres presentation and, and uh, share some information about some of our members with you very quickly. First, we have a, a number of our board of directors who, for various reasons, weren't able to be with us. But I want you to know who they are and how important they are to this, to this operation and what we do. And those are Linda Gintner, who serves as our vice president, Hank Chupi. Hank Chupi, who is our uh, secretary and also very much involved with our website. David Lewis, who is our treasurer. Mark Weber, our legal counsel, longtime board member. And board members Corey Brostead and Jackie Wellman. And they, some of them have been with us virtually and we're glad to have uh, talked with them. But uh, I want you to know who they all are so you can get to know all of us in the best way possible. Now I want to share with you, the past few years we have been trying to say thank you to some who have been around and with us for a long time doing various, uh, serving in offices in various uh, key roles over the years. And these people are not able to be with us tonight. We will send them a very nice uh, representation of our appreciation when we get home. We want, to, we want to share with you tonight who those people are this year. The first is Linda Gintner, and you see Linda and Craig's picture on the screens. Uh, they are from Fremont, California. And they're kind of like Norma and me and Tim and Tina and some of our other, Jim and Melissa, some of our other couples. When you, when you got one, you got both because Craig was always here with us. And for many years, Craig was our MC of this event. So we certainly appreciate both of them. But tonight we want to say thank you to Linda. Uh, Linda became a member of our board of directors in 2003. Uh, she co-chaired the program committee at that time. And thanks in large part to her efforts uh, with the online patient community, several PLS research grants were awarded and the Nord PLS physicians uh, listing and guide was developed. So Linda's been involved in a lot of work over the years. As you see on the slide, uh, she's been a board member since 2003. She has served as our vice president since 2005. So Linda, we say thank you to you and also to your better half, but tonight we want to recognize you for all your service with the board. If you would, let's give Linda a round of applause. The next person we'd like to recognize tonight is a, a gentleman who is from the Atlanta, Georgia area. His name is David Lewis. As I mentioned to you a moment ago, David currently serves as our treasurer, but that's not the beginning. David participated in the first board of directors meeting, which was on January 18th, 2002. He was elected treasurer at that time, so he was an SPF incorporating board member. David recently retired as a CFO for Pizold Companies. He's been a CPA since 1982 and lives in Columbus, Georgia. David for a moment thought that if he could retire from, uh, from his normal work, that he might retire from the SPF board but we talked him into hanging on for at least another year or two, and we appreciate so much David's work over all the years uh, with our accounting, our CPA work, and taking care of those dollars. So if you would join me in giving David a round of applause. And finally tonight, we want to recognize one of our, another one of our former presidents, a young lady named Miss Annette Lockwood. And it was also an incorporating board member, part of that very first board meeting on January 18th of 2002. She served on the foundation steering committee. Uh, she later retired from ExxonMobil after 26 years and was very active and was able to get ExxonMobil and other corporate uh, partners to make co contributions to SPF in the early days, which made a great deal of difference in getting the foundation up and going and running. Uh, Annette is still uh, involved in various fundraising activities and she's still listed as a consulting president and we appreciate that. 
If you would, let's give Miss Annette Lockwood a round of applause. Again, none of those are able to be with us, so if you know any of them, if you correspond with them, talk to them in whatever way, please tell them that uh, you appreciate their work and their effort on behalf of the SPF over all of these years, because we would not be what we are without their work and, and commitment and many others as well. Very quickly before I come down, uh, Tim, are you here? Yes. Tim, would you come forward and would you, is, where's Tina? Tina, if you would roll up here, please. Check test us. <laughs> it's going to be a minute. <laughs> we know how it is, don't we? We do. It's good. It's good. She'd gotten settled in for dinner, and I've interrupted her dinner, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't get one, everybody. Just wanted to point that out. I'm working this evening, so it's not, all good. And not very often is Tim surprised with what happens on the stage, sure. but he didn't know about this. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. But I'm glad I'm up here. Come on, Tina. Come on in and say hi to everybody. <laughs> you guys see a lot of Tim. You, you don't see a lot of Tina up up front, but we wanted to share with you, many of you may know, you might have seen it on Facebook, but we are extra proud of Tim and Tina, the professional work they've done over all the years, which we benefit from here as Tim works on stage and they help us plan these events. But recently, uh, and of course, Tim and Tina have retired in the not too distant past from the work that they enjoyed together. But just recently, uh, the local performing arts center at the high school where they worked for many years they were surprised, and that auditorium, that Performing Arts Center, was named the Tim and Tina Krogan Performing Arts Center. So they've done great work for a long time in a lot of places, and again, we're not going to let them rest. They've got to keep going here. And Norma, where are you? Would you come up here and bring... <laughs> She's got a balloon in her hand. <laughs> There's one more thing about Tim and Tina, and this is not just this year. This happens a lot of years with this conference. But as soon as we finish this conference, these two are going to celebrate their 30th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and they are about to leave to go to Ireland, we think. So we're giving them a little gift uh, just to let them know we appreciate their work. <laughs> And happy anniversary, guys. Thank you. We love you. Thank you all so much. Now you can roll back and eat that great dinner. <laughs> uh, the key is you have to drive with all that on. Now we, get, now we, can, now we can find you, Tina. Yeah. This, is, this is the best part. Now we can see where you're at. Uh, oh, uh -oh. she whispered, there's wine in there. Woohoo! All right, guys. We'll talk to you maybe Monday, Tuesday. We'll see you later. Enjoy your dinner, and we'll be back with, uh, Thank you all so much. with all the uh, gifts and prizes in a few minutes.